right. Welcome. <laughs> the laughter already starts from my colleagues. That's a great sign. Thank you. The hecklers are in front. Bienvenuti. Welcome. They'll come in. Welcome to Decipher 2022. I'm Matt Keller, Head of Impact and Inclusion at the Algorand Foundation. Um, and I'll be your host for the next couple of days. So I'll be kind of up here and off and introducing folks. And we've got lots of good material in store for you. Uh, lots of good panels. And um, this is the second uh, Decipher conference. Last year, we had around 500, I guess. This year, it looks like we've tripled that, if not more. So give yourselves a round of applause for that. Um, and this is really about, a lot of this conference is focused on real world solutions and real world impact. And that's a theme that we're going to be coming back to again and again. What can we do in the real world that makes an impact in the lives of people around, around the planet? Um, so that growth, that threefold growth in the number of folks that came last year, as opposed to this year, that kind of represents the growth of the ecosystem generally throughout the year, which is, which is pretty extraordinary. And we're here to celebrate that growth, to forge new connections, make new friendships, make sure that everyone here understands what we're focused on in 2023 and beyond. And to have you get a better understanding of who we are as a foundation, what our vision is, what our goals are. And we're, you're going to meet lots of great entrepreneurs on a lot of different panels, people from all over the world, building for different things. I'm moderating a couple of panels on financial inclusion and green cities, folks building for impact and inclusion on Algorand, looking for a better future for all of us. Um, and, you know, we hope that you leave here with an understanding of that this is the movement, right? Uh, everybody here is part of this movement that we seek to grow over time. And we want you to leave here understanding, in our view, that... Um, we are focused on inclusion. We are focused on impact. We are focused on sustainability. It's in our DNA. It's part of our Genesis story, is that understanding that a sustainable world is the one that we need to build. And it's a world where new technologies can finally um, not just enrich a few, but enrich all of us, no matter where our geography or what our economic station in life is. And, you know, it's a world of, um, in the final analysis, it's a world that where new technologies bring us closer together instead of dividing us, you know, where the concerns of one ultimately and inevitably become the concerns of all. And so building for that future is what we are about at Algorand, it's what we are dedicated to, and it's what we're gonna be talking about uh, for the next couple of days. So that's who we are. The next two days are gonna be great. Ask questions, meet folks that are on stage, that are moderating, that are part of these panels, make connections, come away inspired to hit 2023 with passion and enthusiasm. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the sequence of events for this morning. First up is gonna be our CEO, Stacey Warden, who's gonna share some thoughts about Algorand for the year ahead. Um, and then Algorand's Chief Product Officer, Paul Regal, and Foundation CTO, John Woods, will, um, will offer a look at roadmaps to both the Algorand protocol as well as new tools for developers that will make Algorand uh, an even better place to work and to build. And finally, uh, Algorand's esteemed founder, Sylvia McCauley, will take the stage for the second annual Founders Remark. So that's going to be, I'm pretty psyched about that, actually. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so without, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Algorand Foundation CEO and uh, my friend, Stacey Warden. Thank you, Matt. Hey, everybody. You excited to be here? Yeah. So am I. OK, let's just figure out a little bit who's here. If you are a founder, CEO, leader of a company of some kind, can you just kind of raise your hand? OK, wow, wow, OK. If you are technical of any kind, developer, DevRel, de technical founder, any kind, Okay, wow. All right, if you are in my favorite marketing, community, outreach, all of its influencer, all of that, raise your hand. Okay. If you are trader, finance, econ, legal, back office, anything like that. Okay. If you are an investor, investors, could you please stand up? Somebody, 
somebody is going to come around and they will, they will collect your cell phone numbers and we will be posting them up on the screen uh, later. later. So I have, uh, I've been, you know, I've been in, in crypto for a while as a side hustle, but I'm here full time for the first time this year. And it's been, you know, it's been a terrible year, right? I mean, it really has. We've lost $2 trillion in ecosystem uh, funding in crypto. We've had hacks all year long. We've had fraud, you know. We've had broken promises. We've had lost money for retail investors. And, you know, it's okay to lose your money when you take a risk. That's called, you know, being an adult. It's not okay to lose your money when you don't think you're putting your money at risk, though, right? And um, my heart, and everybody at the Algorand Foundation, I'm sure everybody here, your, my heart just goes out to, you know, everybody that lost money in, in any of these uh, protocols this year. To me, though, it's a little bit of like a, kind of a surreal experience, like a little bit of an out-of-body experience, because all of this stuff is swirling around us. But like, what's happening in my Algorand life. You know, while all this nonsense is going on, what's Paul Regal doing? Paul Regal is going from 1,000 transactions per second to 6,000 transactions per second, he and his team. Paul Regal and his team are going from 4.5 second finality to 3.7 second final finality, no forking. My sentence started 3.7 seconds ago, and the Algorand blockchain has already appended another block with finality. What has Rotem Hamo and his team been doing? Thinking about state proofs, thinking about post-quantum security. Sean Ford and the entire team over at Algorand Inc. have had their heads down doing work. Silvio has had his head in the clouds thinking about things like 20 years in advance that nobody else can understand. <laughs> what has Algorand, the protocol, not been doing? Anybody know what this is? Zero. zero. What does this zero mean? Downtime. downtime. Since it went live. Zero seconds of downtime since it went live. When all that nonsense has been going on, this is what this protocol has been doing. And what have you guys been doing? What has this community been doing in the last year? Well, I actually happen to have some insight into that. If I can work this clicker. <laughs> you have launched 900 new apps on mainnet. 900 in the last year. That's not even including everything going on in testnet. You've opened 13 million new wallets. That's almost more than the number of wallets we had at Decipher last year. At Decipher last year, we had two DeFi apps, two. We've increased Algo on uh, TVL 15 times from 4.4 million to 55 million in algo sales. We have more than 10 NFT marketplaces. We've 10x NFT sales. Thousands of creators and projects on these marketplaces. 30 of them are here displaying. Our developer programs have brought 17,000 developers into this, into this ecosystem. Outreach, hackathons, hackjacks, boot camps. 13 games launched on mainnet, 60 more games on testnet. It takes a long time to build a game. 23,000 attendees at 100 plus community events. That's what we've been doing while this nonsense has been going on around us. 4.2 billion algo, 3.9 this, uh, this time committed to government, 60% of our circulating supply, up from 30% a year ago. That's what we've been doing while all this nonsense has been going on. And you're here. We have four times the attendees that we had in Decipher in Miami. We have 650 companies here. 72 countries are represented. I want to give a shout out to Crypto Oasis, by the way, for helping us get local people in, in here. If you live if you live in this region and you are not a member of Crypto Oasis, then you need to fix that because they are where it is happening, ladies and gentlemen, in this region. 
We have countries and companies and founders here from Tanzania, India, Argentina, the US, Singapore, the UK, and of course the UAE. That's what we've been doing. What has the foundation been doing? Well, since I've got here, we have doubled our headcount. Do you know that we had three community leaders when I got here? And I gotta tell you something, three people is not enough people to look after you guys. Not enough. We've organized ourselves into verticals so that you know who is accountable to you, right? If you are in DeFi, Daniel Oon is looking after you. If you are in gaming, PG is looking after you. If you are in Web3, Shamir is looking after you. You know who to talk to. We've added five, six people to our marketing department, changed the way that we view the world, our new beautiful website. How beautiful is that website, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, thank you. I, remember, I remember when Micah Adams first came, he was head of social media when he first arrived. And on Twitter, everybody was like, What's happened to the Algorand Foundation social media account? Like, <laughs> remember that? Uh, so we've really improved our social media presence. And I have uh, been looking for a head of marketing and communications for a year. A year. I have interviewed, I counted actually, 14 senior people for this role. 14. And we haven't had a head of marketing since the middle of the year. And so it's been remarkably led by Alexa and Micah during this time. I found somebody, though. She starts in January. I'm not going to say anything about it. Hashtag Silicon Valley, but I'm not saying anything else. Oh, and then we did just a ton of stuff that is so boring that it's not even worthy of this, of this uh, talk. But stuff like process management, right? The, getting the accounts, getting the, 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 the process around transparency, you know, business analytics, the CRM, because we have to be able to scale with you. We have to be able to scale as this ecosystem scales. So we've been doing a lot of work in that area as well. Governance, we rolled out governance this year. You know, it wasn't perfect, I would say, but we rolled it out without a hitch. We get better every time. You voted against us one time. We learned a lot from that, of course. You know, we tried things. We're trying again this time. This year in governance is going to be a lot more about giving you guys decision making, especially over uh, use of funds, especially in grant making for the community. So we're pretty excited about that. Give it up for Audrey too. Yeah, give it up for Audrey. She's going to be in charge of this, of this program. So we, we're expecting big things uh, next year. What else did we do? Let's see. Oh yeah, we took over Times Square. Yeah, picked up ourselves a couple of awards as well. Turned it green, green blockchain. So much more to do, though. So much more to do going forward. And let me just say, and kind of maybe by way of ending, the operating principle that I think about when I think about this blockchain, and I think about helping the ecosystem grow on this blockchain. This blockchain is the best layer one protocol in crypto, bar none. This is not up for dispute. This is not up for dispute. If you are not using this protocol, it is because you don't know about it, you don't understand it, it is too difficult for you to build on it, you haven't learned how to build on it, you do not have access to it because you don't, it's not on your favorite wallet or your favorite exchange, or it is not integrated in the way that you need it to be. These are my problems. These are the Algorand Foundation problems to solve for you. Because if we can solve these problems, Everybody is going to be using this blockchain because this is the best blockchain. And we have hired people. Davon right there in the front row, he wakes up every single morning worried about people accessing this blockchain. Every morning he wakes up. Doro and Ava, they, they wake up every morning wondering how we can get students onto this blockchain and engage for the next generation. John Woods wakes up every morning worrying about how we can make developer tools easier for you and how we can get that zero to hero developer experience and education experience there for you. Because that's our job. We just have to eliminate excuses, remove barriers, and this protocol will take care of itself. I want to end just by saying that it is the privilege of my life, Sylvia McCauley, to be 
the head of the foundation for this protocol. It is a privilege of my life to be working for you guys because, you know, we, um, we're, we're, gonna, we're in this together and we are, gonna, we are not going to grow without you growing. We grow with you. We are part of you. And so thank you very much uh, for that. And um, I would like to bring up the team so that you can all meet them. And so you know who you're seeing and you know who you're dealing with uh, this, these two days. So if everybody from Algorand and Algorand Foundation can come up, come up, those of you, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Everybody, come on, Sean. Come on. Everybody, come on up. You know who Sean is, of course. Alexa's going to be mad at me because she doesn't want people on the stage. She wants people down, down front, but that's okay. I'm the CEO. I can do what I want. Okay, we're going to get a group picture. Okay, now, because we have a little bit of time, I thought we could just go and everybody could just say who they are and what they look after quickly, or Alexa's going to kill me. Okay, so we're going to have a mic going around. Move down, move down, everybody, a little bit. Silvio, can we take one picture with you in the front? Come on. Okay, move, everybody moving, moving, moving. Okay. This is Sylvia McCauley, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, do we have a picture? Where's Sean? Okay. It's, it's, okay, great. So, where's the mic? Do you have a mic? Okay. Oh, Sean, you're supposed to be okay. Okay. Sean, why don't you start? Everybody knows who you are. Sean. <laughs> Okay. That's fine, that's fine. Sean. <laughs> uh, okay, Sylvia McCauley, I know you have a talk coming later on, but do you want to just uh, say hi and see who you are? Very excited to be with you all, and uh, it is great to be together, and uh, somehow together we can. <laughs> all right, fantastic. Okay, all right. Um, all right, so let's just start on one end, and we're just going to go quickly down, and everybody just say who they are and say hi. Hi, I'm Ruth. Okay. <laughs> Fred Estante, hey. And Fred Estante runs product marketing for the Allegrand Foundation. Everybody can feel free to say what they do as well. Uh, I'm JJ. Okay. I'm Ben, aka Barnji. Okay. Uh, Jacopo. Okay, please say what you're doing. Gary Mayloff, uh, head of engineering at the Inc. That's what I'm talking about, head of engineering at the Inc, ladies and gentlemen. Daniel Yang, head of market strategy. Uh, Dan Yang, head of market strategy. Daniel Yang, head of the Five for the Foundation. Okay. Stefano Reserve Solution Architect. Uh, okay. I am Ora Rone, Software Engineer. Okay. Idan Engineering. Al Moktail Engineer. So many engineers in the Algorand. Cosimo, Solution Architect. Adriano, Solutions Engineering. Oh, you want? Did you go? Did you go? Okay, sorry, I'm losing track. Massimo, Chief Economist. Chief Economist. All the hard questions can go to Massimo right there. And Warner, General Counsel to the Inc keeping us all out of trouble. <laughs> Joanna, head of NFT initiatives. Hugo Kravchik, uh, research and university programs. Also thinking deep thoughts about the future. PG head of gaming at the foundation. Head of gaming at the foundation, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, those gamers know, those gamers know how to applause, isn't it? Those gamers know how to applaud. Uh, Ryan, working on funding, but announcing some ex exciting stuff at 2 o'clock, so see you there. OK, all right. all right. Alex McCabe, head of IT at the Inc. Ryan Fox, DevRel. Okay, does anybody here not know Ryan Fox? Because if you don't know Ryan Fox, you really shouldn't be in the room. Hi, I'm Anil Kakani, reigning ping pong champ for another day at least, <laughs> and uh, the new head of uh, Algorand Foundations India operations. All right, we, are we announcing? We're not, we're not announcing that until tomorrow, are we? Okay, that's a sneak peek for you. <laughs> Anil Kakani running our India after. How exciting is that, huh? Okay. All right. Zef Grinchlog. Software Engineering at the Inc. Okay. Deirdre Cecilo at the Foundation. Poached from, poached from Revolut. I'm just bragging a little bit. Adri, Governance Program Manager. Okay, all, this is the agreement. Any compliments you have about governance, please bring them to me. Any problems you have, please go to Adri directly for all the. Simon, Head of BI and Data Analytics. Okay. Micah, Head of Growth Marketing. Oh, Mike. Okay, okay. Eric Ragg, head of business development and capital markets at the foundation. Okay, Eric. Joe Polney, Devrel at the foundation. Devrel. Uh, 
David Morthy, Head of Ecosystem Access at the Foundation. Okay, I got more, more tweets and retweets and likes when Devin came on than for anybody else I announced. <laughs> Harpal Singh, CFO at the Foundation. If you don't think we're spending as much money as you want us to, that's Harpal to complain <laughs> to you right there. Eva, Student Engagement Lead. Okay, Student Engagement. Autumn Penaloza, Head of Community for the Americas. One of the first three, one of the first three, Head of Community. Dora Angali, Head of University Programs. Uh, Brandon Wolf, VP of Technical Business Strategy and Interim CTO at Napster. Okay, that's a big title, that's a big title. Hey, Jason here, Global Head of Community for the Foundation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love you too. Chris Pikert, uh, Head of Cryptography Research at the Inc. Okay, Chris Pikert, state proofs and quant post-quantum and all that stuff. Hello, everyone. Ryan, Community Manager for the Middle East region. Okay, this is the guy right here. Take a step forward, take a step forward, okay? You need to know him. You need to know him. Okay. <laughs> Alessandro, Head of Developer Tooling at the Foundation. Developer Tooling. When all that developer tooling gets easier, this is the guy. Wasim, I'm the UK Community Manager, and can I just say, me and Ryan will be meeting the community here. You guys are beautiful. You've shown so much love to us. And we're so glad to be here, honestly. Yeah. Thank you. Mkere, Market Analytics and Research at Foundation. And how long did you run this summer? Uh, 331 kilometers. Yeah, 331 kilometers. We're in here for the distance, you guys. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nin, Ecosystem Growth. Recently hired head of Ecosystem Growth. Growth, growth, growth. Hi, Patrick, Community Manager for Central Europe. Okay. Uh, developer IE programs, and we have our build um, final pitch competition at one o'clock today in developer greenhouse stage. Joe's another one. Everybody, you got to know her. You got to know her. Carolina, head of events. Hi, Carolina, who put this event on? Hello. 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 Round of applause. Yep. Uh, good morning. Jack from the community team. <laughs> Hello, Dave Graney. I work with our awesome devs on a number of outreach programs. Okay. Hi, Jason Paulos, engineer. Uh, Steve Farino, aka Nullen. Uh, I'm in Devereux. Okay. Hi, Navida Sonola with the Inc. A little bit of everything, but lately, coachings and energy. Okay. Chris Kim, Devereux. Okay. Hi there, Shamir. Sh good morning. Shamir Zeri, head of Web3 at the Algorand Foundation. Come on, Shamir. So give it up for Shamir. Hi, Pranjal Bhardwaj. Uh, I'm Devel for Asia. Okay. Hi, I'm Jack Chan, head of uh, developer programs and integrations. Coach him from Harmony, just want to say. Hello, I'm Nikhil Verma, Tech Lead India, Algo, Algo and Foundation. <laughs> okay, great. And Kenyon, Product at the Inc. Okay, and Kenya, you're presenting later, right? Okay, um, Cooper Daniels, Cooper Daniels, can you come up here? Where are you? Cooper, Cooper Daniels, are you up here? Okay, um, Devon, can you come up here? Uh, we have our first announcement of this conference, everybody, um, and I'll give you the mic. But before I do, Cooper, did you want to apologize to Devon for anything? <laughs> um, well, uh, we're, ta we're talking about. Um... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. <laughs> oh, did you guys hear about that? Oh, 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 Yes, you can. You go. Thanks, Coop. Uh, hi, everyone. First announcement to make of Decipher. Very, very excited to, to let you all know that as of tomorrow, Deposits and withdrawals of USDC on Algorand are going to be enabled on the world's largest exchange, Binance. Binance! Woo -hoo 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 -hoo! And, uh, you know, while I very much like taking the credit for things, and, you know, Coop, you did uh, steal that from me. Yeah, uh, two weeks ago. Exactly. But yeah. that wasn't the result of a leak from the foundation or from Binance. It's kind of a result of being on an open blockchain, right? <laughs> People on Twitter saw activity happening. They put two and two together. They did some sleuthing, so no apologies needed. This is going to be, you know, huge for the existing community on our ground, but also even bigger for those people that are looking to come into our ecosystem that we obviously welcome with open arms. So. Thank you to everyone from the Algorand side, from the Binance side, from the Circle side that made this happen. And we're just really excited. All right, our announcement number one. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. We work for you. This is your team right here. Have a great decipher. Okay, up, up next. 
Paul Regal, who needs no introduction. He's the head of product at Algorand Inc. And he is going to tell you about the Algorand roadmap for next year. When I was a board member and I came to Decipher uh, last year, I watched his talk like five million times so I could figure out uh, everything that was going on. So Paul, with, I have two microphones and a clicker here all of a sudden. Paul, with uh, no further ado, let me introduce to you Paul Regal. Where is he? I lost him. Thank you, Stacy. So, my name is Paul Regal. Uh, I'm the Chief Product Officer here at Algorand. I get the distinct opportunity today to talk to you all about our core technology strategy and a little bit about our protocol roadmap. You guys ready? Everybody ready? All right, cool. I'm going to start with a little bit of a left turn here. I'm going to start with a quote that I, I really like, uh, I've liked throughout my career, and I've been thinking about uh, a lot lately. And that quote is, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. This is a quote from a gentleman named Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, if you're familiar with him, he was a science fiction writer, he's a futurist. Uh, if you're into that genre, he's maybe best known for co-writing 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, but the quote, so uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Why do I like this quote? First of all, because I like magic, it's fun. Um, but second of all, I've been thinking about it a lot lately because blockchain technology, I think a lot of people in this room would agree in certain areas, is sufficiently advanced uh, that one can maybe think of it as magic occasionally. And I think this is an important thing. I think it's fun as a, as a technologist. I think that you need to be able to take joy in the technology that you represent. You need to be able to leave behind the constraints of the practical world. You need to be able to uh, leave behind critical thinking, leave behind established science, and really just believe in what the technology could be. And it's important to do that. It's important to be excited about the technology. But like anything, uh, too much of a good thing turns into a bad thing. And I think what we've seen in our industry is we've seen a lot of people decide that they're just going to buy into magic generally. I don't want to actually have to learn the underlying technology. I don't want to have to actually figure out what the nuances are between these blockchains. I'm just going to go with magic because it's fun. The problem with that is when you start trying to compare underlying technologies or compare magic, it's really hard to compare magic. And so what you do is you start chasing magicians. So this is Chris Angel. The internet has assured me this is a very famous magician around the world. Uh, and I'll tell you what, I can understand why people like to chase magicians, because searching for pictures of magicians lead me to things like this. And this is a live show. I mean, it seems like a little cooler than my show. I want to go to this show. I get why magic is exciting, okay? And it's particularly more exciting than this, right? What is this? This is like uh, decision flows, and it's Excel sheets, and it's primary research, and it's like, well, I've got a technology stack for a product that I'm building, and I'm looking for a new technology to bring into that stack. How do I think about actually uh, which technology to use? And once I decide on which technology to use, how do I actually get that into my stack? All that's hard. All this is easy. easy. I like it. However, the problem is if you start chasing magicians without fail, every one of these magicians, they're going to let you down. And they're going to let you down because they're not actually practicing magic. They're practicing sleight of hand. They're practicing smoke and mirrors. So what do you do then? I, I've just gonna be up here, uh, stood up here and told you, hey, you can't think about magic. Well, you should think about magic a little bit, but not a lot, or you're going to get yourself in trouble. So how do you think about technology, and how do you really get into uh, what it is, the differences between these technologies? How do you apply them? There's a couple of things you need to be looking for. Number one, you need to be looking for a clear vision. Should it be exciting? Yeah, it should be exciting too. But it should be clear. You should be able to understand it. You should be able, it should stand up to questioning. You should be able to explain it to other people that you know. Two, the science needs to be sound. This is uh, a sufficiently advanced technology, as we were saying before. It needs the science behind it. A white paper is not science. Science is science. Okay? And thirdly, you need to be looking for projects and teams that execute. They ex execute consistently. They continue to shape the technology. This is not an environment where you just decide, hey, I, I built a blockchain, kick it out the door, and go, you know, go figure it out. This is a thing where you have to bring it every single day. You have to execute, you have to shape it, you have to make it uh, better, and you have to keep it at the forefront of technology. And I'm going to get a little bit fired up today, so hopefully that plays well with you guys, but uh, that's just what's going to have to happen. So we talk about execution. I want to talk about what we are executing on every day and what our team goes to battle with every single day to, to improve. And it's uh, these three things up here. This is our strategic priorities. Core protocol properties, programmability, 
interoperability. If you were at the Cypher last year, you would have seen the exact same three strategic priorities. Why is that? Because these are the brass tacks. This is what it takes to succeed. If one of you comes up to me after this and says, hey, look, I'm thinking about starting a blockchain. What do I need to be thinking about? I'm going to talk to you about these three things. Every single day, making them better. They don't get done. You continue to improve them. So I'm going to talk about each one of these in specific. Core protocol properties. Uh, I believe that blockchain protocols will embed themselves in our way of life, just like other protocols have embedded themselves before, HTTP, for example. Um, and when you get embedded, you get access to a huge amount of users. Uh, because you're not really talking about HTTP anymore, you're talking about the value-added products and services that are built on top of that. But in order to get selected to actually get that access, your protocol has to have sufficient properties to earn that. And it's things like capacity, it's things like latency, it's things like finality, decentralization, reliability, it's a lot of things. And that's what we are focused on every single day uh, building this protocol. Specifically in 2022, we've been really focused on uh, two things, capacity and latency. We have improved the protocol from roughly 1,000 transactions a second up to 6,000 transactions, uh, transactions a second, huge improvement. We've at the same time dropped the latency of those blocks, the block latency from about four and a half seconds down to 3.7 seconds. And our focus going forward is to continue to drop that round time. Our goal is going to be somewhere in the, in the two second range. Why is that important? Now, obviously, that's going to lift up TPS. If you're doing the same amount of transactions in a shorter amount of time, you're doing more transactions in that unit of time. But more importantly, we're focused on this because of the user experience that it brings. The difference between Web 2 and Web 3 applications is a lot sort of philosophically and under the hood. But the tangible difference is the user experience that some blockchains enforce and impart upon the applications that you're building. Your user experience can be limited by the blockchain you choose underneath it. And the easiest thing to talk about here is sort of what I call transaction finality. So if you're on an app, a user's on an application, they click a button. How long does it take from the time that I click that button to the time that thing is actually done, right? And I know you're probably told there's no math. Uh, there is some math, but fortunately, it's very simple math. This equation is really easy to think about. There's two pieces that you're going to add together. The first thing is your block latency. When you press that button, transactions are going to be sent out into the network. It's got to get into a block. It's got to get washed through the system. The second piece is the block finality. OK, you've got a block. How long does it take for that block to be final? Right? It's two pieces. You add them together. That's what that user is going to experience when they click a button. So I'll give you an example of a hypothetical blockchain that is not Algorand. Let's say it's got 500 millisecond blocks. Bang, 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 block, block. Block, feels pretty good, feels like a Web 2 experience, except for there's two pieces to that equation. Second piece is the finality. Let's say that finality is 10 to 12 seconds. They press that button. Hold on a second. Okay, and now we're done. That user experience is an unacceptable user experience for a, a Web 2 user. And make no mistake, we are after the Web2 users. That's where this is going. So you have to really be focused on that user experience. Now, at Algorand, that was a hypothetical blockchain. We're a little bit different. We have the same equation, block latency, block finality. Our block finality time is always zero. And as soon as the transaction gets into blocks, it is final. So lucky for us, we just get a focus on block latency. And that's why we're continuing to squeeze that down, sure, higher TPS. More importantly, it allows you builders to build applications on Algorand that simply are not possible on other blockchains because you're limited by the underlying technology. Second thing on this page, reliability and robustness. You might say, hey, Paul, I don't think you guys have a problem there. I think I saw a slide Stacy put up there, zero, zero uh, downtime. Uh, one of the things I like about Algorand is technology that just works. And I would tell you, I agree with that. But I'm also here to tell you that that zero seconds downtime, that uh, uh, technology that just work, it's not easy and it's not cheap. It takes continual investment and continual work to get us there. And we're going to double down to make sure that you guys have a protocol that can support you not just now, but meet the needs and meet your bar for reliability in the future. There's huge emphasis, always a huge emphasis, and I want to make sure that we say that because it's not free. We work really hard for that and we're excited to work hard for that for you guys. Okay, let's talk about uh, programmability. So if core protocol properties is the table stakes, programmability is the game that that stake gets you into. I cannot overstate how important programmability is to not just our blockchain, but blockchain in general. 
that trust minimized applications that the world is begging for right now can only be built on blockchains and can only be built backed by smart contracts. Okay. And by the way, they will only be built on platforms that have world-class smart, smart contract platforms. And for the last year, we have been laser focused on bringing the AVM and our smart contract platform right to the front of the pack to make it the best possible smart contract platform we can. We have increased compute budget for smart contracts by 256x. That's a crazy number. Uh, we have introduced contract-to-contract uh, -contract composability. We've introduced unlimited global storage for our smart contracts. That's in beta net right now. Uh, and we've introduced a, lit a litany of improvements across the AVM, across tooling, across our languages, to make sure we've got the best possible platform out there. And our continued focus now is about the developer experience of building smart contracts, deploying smart contracts, maintaining smart contracts. And it results in features like simulation, which, makes, uh, which reduces the constraints when you're building those smart contracts. Better data access to make your smart contracts easier to write. Uh, a reimagined indexer to make sure your dApps have exactly and only the data that you want to run your app, regardless of how much uh, uh, processing you need to do with that data before it gets to you. And then, of course, we need a cohesive and, uh, and full set of tools to make sure people can get into this ecosystem and understand and use this, this uh, smart contract platform, this world-class smart contract platform. And John Woods from, uh, from the foundation, he's coming up after me. He's going to talk about AlgoKit. It's one of those projects that's going to make a huge dent in the way people interact with this programmability la uh, layer on Algorand. And finally, I'm going to talk about interoperability. So uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about this now. I've talked a lot about this in the recent past, in the last couple months, and a lot of people have. Interoperability is about reducing the risk of cross-chain uh, bridging and cross-chain composability. It is our responsibility, our meaning layer one protocol and all layer one protocols, to help reduce that risk. And we've done that with a piece of technology we call state proofs. Now, there's only one uh, 2022 accomplishment on this slide, but this is the culmination of just a ton of work from our th uh, theoretical researchers to our cryptography researchers to our engineers to our product managers. Uh, putting out post quantum safe state proofs is a game changing piece of technology in this area, and we're super excited about it. We're super excited about it, though, not just because it's fun to push out technology, which of course it is. We are excited about it because of the reaction that we've got from you and from builders throughout the ecosystem who have said, I want to include this in my application. I want to in improve the trust that's required to use my application. Very excited about it. And in order to make sure we get the widest possible usage, we're fo focused on making sure that there are many flavors of state proofs that meet many flavors of use cases. So for example, we have a post-quantum uh, state proof that's out now. Uh, we're going to have a snark version of that for resource-limited environments. Um, there are use cases that are willing to give up a little bit of the post-quantum security for lower latency in, in generation times. We're going to meet those needs. Uh, we've talked to people who are saying, hey, listen, I love these state proofs. I want to be able to commit to a broader set of state than we are right now, typically around composability use cases. Great, we're going to meet that too. State proofs are a game changer in changing the way that people are bridging and using composability. And we are going to make sure that this technology gets out there and is used in as many possible use cases as we can. And so I'm going to wrap up on this. These are the, uh, the, uh, the, the three strategic uh, pillars right here. Core protocol properties, programmability, interoperability. I hope what I'm leaving you with is, one, we have a very clear vision of what we're doing here. It makes sense. It holds up to questioning. Uh, and you can explain it to your friends when they ask you. Two, we are backed by sound science. We 100% believe in that, and our research team drives the really hard technology that we put out there. And that's important because it's really, really complex technology. And then thirdly, I hope you take away that we are executing, and we will continue to execute. And it is our mission to make sure that this protocol continues to stay on the front edge of blockchain protocols and continues to deliver you all the experience that you need to be successful in this arena. And with that, I just want to say thank you for giving me the time up here to talk about this roadmap. I'm going to bring out John Woods. He's going to talk to you about AlgoKit, which is one of the tools for the, the programmability layer. Uh, very excited to see what he's got to say about that. Thank you. Hello.
Thank you. Good morning. How's it going? So, protocol boring stuff's over. Now let's get to the dev tools. All right. So, I'm John Woods. I'm the CTO at the Algorand Foundation. And you might remember me from such chains as Ethereum and Cardano, where I've also worked. But I've come to Algorand because, quite literally, it is the first blockchain that's fit for purpose. It's the, first, <laughs> it's the first blockchain that I think can deliver on the types of things that we say blockchain can do. Today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about DevTools. So a quick note that the Algorand blockchain is open for business. It's not in beta. It's a product that's ready to support your applications right now. So you can bring enterprise-grade applications to the Algorand mainnet today, and it is ready to support those applications with zero downtime and with a user experience that's going to del delight your users. So this is great, but we also need to make sure that we have developer tools that allow folks to realize their vision. We need a developer experience that are going to be developer tools that you're going to want to use. People know that I'm a big fan of Apple products and Apple developer experiences. And when I open up Xcode and I'm using it to build iPhone apps, I get a great experience. Even when I'm debugging, I can blow up the user interface in 3D, and I can, it visualizes everything for me. And so it's fun to use. And that's exactly where we need to take the developer experience for Algorand. So how do we get there? The answer is AlgoKit. So AlgoKit is a soup to nuts complete toolkit that you can use to build, test, and deploy applications for Algorand. I'm going to break down some of the components that are inside so you can get an idea of what it's going to be like. Modern development with tools like Rust, people love things like Cargo. They love a CLI that allows them to build, test, install packages, and help them with their folder structures. Tr Ethereum has this with Truffle, and so we realized that it was very important to have an intuitive command line interface that would allow people to build, test, and deploy right from the CLI. But we're not stopping there. The CLI, the AlgoKit command line interface, will also provide you safe templating. So when you're initializing your project, you can specify what type of project you're using. And this is similar to, or what type of project you're building, rather. And this is similar to the types of things you will have seen in more mainstream IDEs like Android Studio or Xcode. These templates will be an audited, safe starting point. So if you're trying to spin up your latest DAO, you'll have a template to start off. If you're trying to build a safe NFT, you'll have a template to start off. We're also going to have a coherent testing suite. This is going to allow you to unit test right within your favorite uh, uh, code editor. In this case, we're going to have VS Code integration. And you're going to be able to go right through with syntax highlighting and test in a very simple way. So you'll write your unit tests in a Python syntax, and you'll be able to test your product before it goes to mainnet. And finally, one other thing I want to touch on. We're going to have a simulation environment that will allow you to, within seconds, even on a regular computer, spin up an Algorand node and provide a full and comprehensive simulation environment where you can see how your application is performing before it ends up in the mainnet. And all of this is done locally, so it doesn't cost you anything. So I think this developer experience with AlgoKit is going to be best in class. We're going to have a developer preview available hopefully in January, and the first release will be in Q1 of 2023, hopefully in February. So this is great, but we appreciate that this is a new paradigm in how you're going to be building things, so we want to make it easy to learn how to use this tool. So we're going to do learning the fun way. We're going to gamify the education process. We're going to have tasks and, and uh, uh, you know, a, a bunch of things you can do. There's going to be a website where you can go and check different tasks that are available, and you'll get rewards for being able to complete certain tasks. We're going to have a process where we can take you from a protocol zero to a protocol hero. So we're going to demystify and disambiguate the underlying protocol for you. We're going to explain PyTeal in simple language and give you instructions on how to do things in a best-in-class way. And then finally, 
we're going to have bite-sized content and more modular style content with competency-led training. So at the end of these programs, you'll come out with actual skills. And so you'll be able to directly work on certain genres of application, and you'll be confident that you know how to do things the right way. So that's a look at AlgoKit, and it's a look at where we're thinking of taking the developer experience next year. Um, if there's any questions, I'll take some from the audience quickly. Uh, if not, it's been nice to speak with you. No questions? Do I escape? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you very much. Matt. All right. Thank you, John, Paul, and Stacy. wherever you are. That was awesome. Um, so we're going to quickly get the stage set up, uh, and we're going to move into our next speaker, uh, a person who needs uh, no introduction. Um, but you know him as a Turing Award winner. Uh, you know him as the founder of Algorand. Uh, you know him as a uh, multi-award winner in, in many, for many reasons, and he is going to uh, give his second Founders Remarks today at Decipher, and we are really excited to have him speak after those extraordinary talks and to really kind of uh, impart his vision to you. So a person who needs no introduction, uh, please welcome Sylvia McCauley. <laughs> Ciao, Sylvia. Okay. Hello, Dubai. Hello, all Ganauts. The winter of our discontent. We are in crypto winter. Many projects have vanished. Some have been destroyed by the financial greed of others. Others have deliberately brought great shame to themselves and greatly hurt our entire industry. Many people have panicked and fled. Many have become paralyzed. Many have lost hope and enthusiasm. It is a very harsh crypto winter. The winter of our preparation. But not everyone has fled. We at Algorand and never wavered. We have never been distracted by the chaos around us. We have kept the course, and we have kept busy. This has been the winter of our preparation. We have redoubled our effort and have continued to improve our great technology. We have gone from 1,000 transactions per second to several thousand transactions per second not off-chain transaction, but genuine on-chain transaction recorded on our chain by a truly decentralized manner. An algorithm block is now produced every three and a half seconds rather than every four and a half seconds without introducing cost somewhere else. We keep producing blocks 24 seven without any interruption only faster, cheaper, and with more transactions on, on, on per block. And our block continue to be finalized as soon as they appear. State proofs have enriched our tool set, and they are a wonderful tool. They enable our blockchain to speak with a joint voice that is clearly heard and verified. State proofs enable our chain to become resilient against quantum computer attacks and the construction of decentralized bridges. We are proud 
of these technological advances. True decentralization requires true technology. Technology is an integral part of our DNA, of our identity. The Algoan community is united by our commitment to decentralization and our beautiful technology. We are not alone. Yes, these are challenging times. Yet, this is also the time in which Ethereum has transitioned from proof of work to proof of stake. The blockchain industry has become greener as a result. This is good. Blockchain is here to help people, and we cannot help people if we hurt the planet. But proof of stake pre-existed the merge. Cardano launched its proof of stake platform long before it was popular to do so. Two, we believe Algorand's pure proof of stake is the best form of proof of stake. We are proud. <laughs> we are proud of this and all our contribution, but also recognize the contribution of others. We are not alone. There are other serious projects. The blockchain industry needs a diversity of serious projects, a competition of serious projects, and a collaboration among serious projects. For we have two common enemies, the unfair and inefficient status quo bent to preserve the privileges of the few, and a bunch of unscrupulous projects that now more than ever discredit the reputation of our entire industries in the eyes of the world. Make no mistake, these are powerful enemies, but they will be defeated by the collaboration of serious projects. This winter will end when we choose to end it. Let's end it now. Flowers, perhaps no image is more hopeful or more beautiful than a flower emerging from the snow. Here are two such flowers. One, Agrotoken. Agrotoken is a very innovative project. It takes a ton of wheat or soy or corn geolocates it, monitors its temperature, its grady humidity, etc., and turns it into a token on the Algorand chain. Congratulations. Agrotoken provides farmers with liquidity that is not only immediate, but also of the best kind, namely tokens on the Algorand chain. Farmers are no longer at the mercy of powerful wholesale traders. They can now simply spend their token or choose to utilize them in our smart contracts. No longer isolated, they are ready to transact in three and a half seconds with anyone in the world, securely, efficiently, and in sophisticated ways. The government of Argentina had never recognized any stable coin but has recognized Agrotoken. <laughs> Eduardo, Ariel, you and your team are real pioneers, and we are proud to have you in the Algorand family. <laughs> Two, TravelX, the travel ticket has been the last financial tool without any secondary market. TravelX has put an end to this anachronism. It enables us to securely trade our tickets if our travel plans change. The buyer 
on the secondary market knows that she is dealing with a genuine ticket and that she is indeed buying it from its true owner. And the seller is no longer left with a fistful of flies if his travel plan change. Juan Pablo, Facundo, your team is incredible, and we are proud that you too have chosen Algorand for your wonderful project. <clears throat> Finally, we can own our travel ticket, use them as we please, or sell them if we so please. This change is significant in itself, but is also a first solution to a larger societal problem. Today, the world is turning into a society of renters whose rent is capriciously increased. A society where only the few own everything, our data, our songs, our creations, while the many are left licensing things, constantly concerned that what they value and what they love will be wrenched away from them. We'd better change this direction and change it fast. We can help and we will help. This is why Algorand Technology is here, the Algorand community is here, Algorand is here. Technology and humanity. At the core of all true progress is a combination of technology and humanity. Algorand is committed to both. Both, in fact, are our, our greatest strengths. Perhaps no industry has been more affected by the perils of Web 2 than music. Music has experienced a proliferation of rent seekers, those who insert themselves between the music creators and the music loving fans, extracting value without adding any. Algorand technology is enabling deeper and direct relationships between artists and those who value the humanity of their creations. I'm talking about Napster, Dequency, A Note, and others. Music is just the beginning. Our work in music will lead to innovation and new paradigms of success across a variety of industry. Purpose. Technologies and the products that are built up on them succeed when they are guided by a clear purpose. An Algorand's purpose is clear. We believe in true decentralization. We believe in transparency. We believe that art and culture matter. We believe that unnecessary intermediaries must be obviated. We believe that technology is profoundly human and has the power of improving our lives. And we act on our beliefs. We work constantly to endow Algorand with better and better technology. We increase the power of our decentralized, efficient, and green blockchain in order to foster humanity, creativity, and growth and prosperity for all. This has been, is, and will always be our mission. Onward, the path ahead is challenging, but our cause is just, and our commitment is strong. My personal commitment, the commitment of those of us here in Dubai, of those watching the live stream, and all others around the world who bring their tireless energy and their brilliance to Algorand. We shall prevail. Go out.
All right. Hey, just a couple of quick programming notes. Um, that was pretty excellent. Uh, if that doesn't get you fired up, I'm not sure anything will. Um, so we've got uh, a lot ahead of us. Um, we've got panels coming up after the break. Uh, we have um, uh, in the bowl, which will not be live streamed, that will uh, we'll all start at the same time at about 10.45 right now. It's actually, it's later than that. So it's 10.40, about a 15 minute break we'll take, uh, get some coffee, um, relax, come back here. And we've got three uh, more sessions on three stages, just as a reminder. Uh, right now you're in the arena. We'll have discussions here about DeFi, financial inclusion, payments, uh, protocol interoperability, and more. And this afternoon, uh, the second annual panel of the Bulls uh, with ecosystem investors from Hivemind, Arrington Capital, and Borderless Capital will be here. Uh, you can head over to the Bull stage for more uh, intimate conversations. Uh, in the round. It's focused on real estate, convergence of TradFi and DeFi, tools for the creator. Um, and so that will not, again, that will not be live streamed, but they will be on YouTube after, afterwards. Um, sorry if you're watching online, but that will be available uh, after those are over. Um, and for the developers in the house, uh, yep, yes, thank you. That's it. <laughs> for the developers in the house, uh, we've got the developer greenhouse is where you want to be. Um, the engineers and product leaders who uh, literally built the Algorand blockchain will all be there. So strongly encourage you to take advantage of that time, that space with those folks. It's really, it's a gathering that's, you know, it doesn't happen very often. So please, uh, so please take advantage of that. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll reconvene in 15 minutes, have some coffee, come back, get excited, engage, and I'll see you soon.
All right. Walk around the panel here. I've got some panel discussions coming up, which are going to be, I think, pretty good. Um, hi again. I'm, uh, my name is Matt Keller, head of impact and inclusion at the Algorand Foundation. Uh, I'll be with you for the next day and a half. Um, so we're going to start this next session off with uh, a panel on DeFi, um, which this year hit all-time highs in terms of TVL, with many of the top protocols uh, in the ecosystem having reached exciting milestones. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce the panel, uh, and it'll be about 40 minutes, and it'll be followed by a succession of panels uh, throughout the morning, and then we'll break for lunch, and then we'll come back in the afternoon for uh, more engagement. So here to discuss, uh, please join me in welcoming Folks Finance CEO Benedetto Biondi, Algo, <laughs> Algo Seller co-founder Federico Cristina. They are here, I promise you. Yes, and Dan, there we go. Optio Capital Partner, uh, Michael Cotton, Algo Foundry CEO, Jonathan Kay, Algo Phi Co-Founder, John Clark, and to moderate, the one, the only, the There's great so Daniel Oon. Not bad, Do you, you guys hear me? Yeah. Awesome, yeah. cool. So, welcome everyone. Welcome to Su Supercharging DeFi on Algorand 2023. So, we have with here today, Benedetto, CEO of Fox Finance. <laughs> Federico, uh, CEO of uh, Algo Seller. <laughs> Michael, CPO of Optio Capital. <laughs> Jonathan, co-founder at Algo Foundry. And last but not least, John, co-founder of AlgoFi. So, I mean, let's have our panelists quickly share with us about their project and the applications they have been working on. Ben, where do you go first? Yeah. Uh, nice to meet you, everyone. I am uh, Benedetto Biondi, CEO of Folks Finance. For those who doesn't know what's Folks Finance, it's, uh, as defined for now, a lending protocol plus uh, liquid governance. A lot of you may know Gialgo. Uh, but Fox is turning now into a set of DeFi tools, non-custodial, for managing your digital assets. So we are changing to build more and have a new product offering. Federico? Hi, hello, uh, everyone. Federico. Uh, I'm one of the co-founder of AlgoSeller. Uh, AlgoSeller is an infrastructure for digital fund management uh, on blockchain. So basically, we, we are building this infrastructure for everyone to create his own fund on uh, in this case, Algorand, and for everyone to invest in any fund created in the infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure is uh, Oracle-less, uh, non-custodial, and, uh, and uh, we don't use any Oracle. <clears throat> Morning, everyone. Uh, Michael Cotton, Chief Product Officer for Optio Capital. Uh, we focus on three particular verticals, which is capital employment and investment, uh, incubation and acceleration. Uh, the Optio team is led by AJ Milne, our CEO, uh, we, we, in particular, believe that uh, investment is not just about providing funds, but we really focus on helping and supporting founders across a, a range of different verticals, uh, including shared services layer, uh, tokenomics advice, product advice, marketing, and, and really assisting and filling the gaps where, where help might be needed, where we can bring value that also helps save funding and time and, and uh, costs for the projects themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan. I'm the CEO of Algo Foundry. So Algo Foundry is a venture studio that we launched in January in partnership with the Algorand Foundation. And um, our role basically is to work with uh, founders to bring projects you know, out to mainnet on Algorand. Um, this year, uh, the last two months, we've launched a bridge on mainnet called Messina. Uh, we've also launched a multi-sig safe uh, called Foundry Safe. Um, and we worked with a very, very great founder called Edward Lashinsky to launch Algorai which is a decentralized options vaults on Algorand, which is the first one. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'm John, co-founder of AlgoFi. Uh, AlgoFi is a one-stop shop platform for trading and lending on Algorand. 
And uh, over the last year, uh, since last Decipher, the team has built out um, a lending protocol, a, an AMM, a stable swap protocol, and uh, more recently, a governance protocol. And this has essentially allowed retail and institutional users to very cheaply and efficiently trade and lend. And uh, over the next six months, the goal is to start integrating more uh, community developers to support and upgrade the platform. And uh, over, you know, over the last year, the growth has been uh, pretty good, uh, with around 90 million of TVL and about 15,000 users today. And uh, we're really looking forward to growth over the next year. Awesome. Thanks, John. Thanks for sharing. So we have seen Algorand DeFi grow from 35 million algo worth of TVL at the start of this year to what we have today, which is over 500 million algo worth of TVL. That's over 15 next, essentially. So I, I think we have observed the growth of DEXs, and we have even seen DEX aggregators and liquid governance come in this year. So my question is that, what do you guys think about 2023, and uh, what kind of trends do you observe in the market? Yeah. Ben, what are you? Yeah. Um, so um, obviously, this year has been a bit dramatic, but nevertheless, uh, Algorand has done great. I think this is mainly due uh, to Algorand governance, and I'm very excited about the next uh, uh, development of the Algorand Foundation governance. That's great. Uh, Folks Finance has grown together with it, right? We were the uh, first protocol in growth in Q3 on the Phylama in TVL, so that was great uh, during a beer market. Uh, Amazing, right? So um, I'm very optimistic about the 2020, 2023 because um, I think the narrative for DeFi has never been stronger as now. Uh, people are tired of seeing uh, uh, their asset being managed by someone else that they didn't ask for, you know? Like, so uh, that's time to change, in my opinion. That's why with folks we uh, really want to target to build uh, a simple uh, DeFi but useful that can open well to the masses, but as well for uh, uh, experienced traders. So I, I think also that we will see more uh, mass adoption due to the integration of real world tokenized assets going to DeFi. So my answer is that yes, I see that 2023 good because we, as founder, uh, we push for that to build a good product that will uh, compose with everything that is going on on the chain. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Bullish. That's a very great take. So, Michael, what do you think? As, as somebody that's building from the perspective of a venture builder as well as a application builder yourself. Yeah, look, I think um, we're really at a maturation point for DeFi. And I think, you know, one of, one of the brilliant things about Algorand is it, it has the, the performance capability to, in many ways, replicate CeFi, uh, which I think is going to be very crucial, especially for what we've seen play out in recent months. Um, but a, as a part of that key, I think we, we, as this next stage, we really need to see genuine value on chain uh, being created. So things like real yield, real utility, the ability to borrow against real world assets, uh, the, the kind of functionality that will bring in new users to adopt the technology for e exactly what it's meant for, which is efficiency and, and value creation they can't find elsewhere. But I think the core to that is, you know, Algorand does have the performance capability to really replicate the, the usability of things like CFI. Um, the on-ramps are still a, a difficult barrier for us, which will be fairly key to this next sort of adoption point. Uh, we hear talks about Web 2.5 a lot, but that's going to be fairly crucial as to how do we get that next generation of users who will use the technology for its utility and care less about the fact it's blockchain. I think that'll be a fairly crucial piece to this mm. next stage of growth. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned you, right? And when we talk about DeFi, it's always about discussing about youth. So I think my next question, I, I, I think my next question and kind of like speaking into 2023 will go to John, you know, John, you guys are the largest TVL on Algorand DeFi, you are the market leader. So what do you see in 2023 that no has to do with use for your, for your users essentially? So I think for us, it has a lot to do with the user and developer acquisition. Because, you know, over the last year, Algofy and the rest of the ecosystem has built out all of the primitives that pretty much drive what you would need in a DeFi ecosystem. We have trading, we have lending, you know, we have uh, staking, a variety of other uh, compositions of that. But I think what we are still uh, lacking is getting that in the hands of more uh, users, particularly on the retail and partly on the institutional front. So I think one thing that we're super focused on is making it very easy for users to get access to the platform. 
I think this entails a lot of integration, so trying to get integrated in some of the more popular wallets that other DeFi users are on, like MetaMask. Uh, beyond that, intelligent marketing and educational materials to make it easier to access the platform. And generally speaking, just offering good customer service, which has like worked for pretty much all companies since the beginning of uh, company building, so we really pride ourselves on that. Um, on the developer front, though, we're also trying to make it a lot easier for people to build on the AlgoFi contracts. And uh, so one thing the foundation is doing, uh, that John uh, Woods uh, noted earlier, is this Algo kit uh, you know, tool that will make it easier for people to launch contracts. And one thing that we'd like to do is get the AlgoFi contracts, and I would encourage the rest of the ecosystem to get their stack in there to make it super simple for users to deploy apps that uh, compose uh, via inner transaction. And this will allow all sorts of different applications like asset managers, uh, you know, different derivatives thereof of lending and trading to sprout. So I think those two key pillars we're focused on. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, John. So I, right now we are kind of like going into individual application questions. So Algorand DeFi has basically matured right over the past one year. So I'm sure a lot of apps, a lot of users kind of want to learn from a lot of these builders on stage right here with me. So the first question kind of like goes to Ben, you know. So Ben, you know, why is Folks Finance always so quick to evolve, you know? We, when we first learned about Folks, it's a borrow and lend platform. And then shortly after, you guys became one of the market leaders in liquid governance. So can you share about your secret sauce with, with the crowd? Yeah, so uh, we are uh, lucky for a reason because we are backed by a software house, which is Blockchain Italia. So we have all, you know, like a mother teaching us, bringing us, but still. Uh, I, it's, I need to thank the team, honestly. We are 23, and uh, we keep growing, and we keep hiring amazing people, and we are very young as well. Like, we have seniors that teach the young, but the young are very energetic, right? So uh, we keep fighting, we keep building, we never stop. So that's, uh, that's our uh, goal, right? So we, we want to go uh, over of what is defined now. So even when we started, for us, there was Ave as an example. And uh, we look at it like, OK, they were the first lending protocol, but they surely have done something that could be better, right? So because DeFi is very new, uh, we are still uh, in time to, to build uh, innovation that can scale up, right? So that's the folks' finance target. And uh, uh, out of the technology, we are also very community folks. Like, our community loves us. Uh, I, I rarely see a bad comments about Fox, right? And if there is one, we try to solve it as soon as possible. So that's, that's very important for us. Uh, so for me, uh, the reason is also just the team, right? The team and the community, because the community suggests the team listen and the team build. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, we're always building for the community, so that's, that, that's the most important thing. So for, for Federico from Algo Seller, so you know, uh, I, I, I think a lot of people might have spoken to Federico. Uh, he has built uh, DexTF on Ethereum, and uh, after successfully launching on, uh, on ETH, he has made a conscious decision to actually migrate and move to Algorand. Mm. So for Federico, so maybe yeah. you can share a little thing, uh, a yeah. few things about So maybe I do a step back first. So we started this project, it was 2017, it was a different, difficult, different world, of course. At the time, we wanted to create a crypto edge fund. Uh, it was uh, early 2017, but we didn't find any jurisdiction regulation that was... Uh, able to, to make this for us. And so we say, OK, this could be a good, uh, good problem to solve. Why we don't create an infrastructure on blockchain for digital fund management where anyone can create his own uh, crypto fund or digital asset fund, and then one can invest uh, directly in peer-to-peer -peer on, on, on this platform. And that time, we were looking which uh, blockchain we could use. Uh, it was uh, 2017, 2018. We were looking at which uh, blockchain to use. And we actually met with the uh, in to, uh, late 2018 with uh, Silvio Micali and uh, Navid in Singapore, because I'm, from, uh, I, I'm based in Singapore. And so we started to work and think that maybe uh, Algorand could, could be already the, the, the blockchain for uh, engaging with the traditional player, because that's why we liked a lot uh, Algorand. We think that uh, could be a, a blockchain that can engage the B2B. But at that time, maybe both of us were not really ready because uh, we were early stage and also Algorand was not even in mainnet. Uh, and so we decided uh, for obvious reason to go on Ethereum. And so we, to, we build uh, our first uh, infrastructure on Ethereum. We launched in 2020. 
during the DeFi season was, of course, a bull, uh, bull run, so was, uh, everything was much easier, the engagement, the TVL, and all the stuff. But then in 2021, we were stuck when the gas fee spiked on Ethereum. And so we realized that actually Ethereum cannot be really the, uh, the chain uh, suitable for, for the people that we are trying to uh, reach, that uh, maybe is the, the institutional, the, the, financial, the financial, traditional financial player. Uh, and that's why we, of course, we, we start to look around again and uh, we decided to go multi-chain. Uh, so first for chain we developed uh, was Avalanche, it was just a test in, in, in last year, December last year. And then, of course, uh, we got back to Algorand. That was uh, our first choice in, 2000, in 2018, 2019. So, uh, awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's really important right, when we say applications are selecting to build on Algorand at the end of the day, you, you look at several factors and we always share, you know, on, on Algorand, the fees are always consistently low and that's very important for the cash flow and the business predictability for, for businesses, essentially. So I'm, I'm very glad you made the decision to move to Algorand. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. The, the next question is actually for Michael. So Michael, as a venture <laughs> investor, as well as a builder within the space uh, with Opto Capital, we have heard a lot of people share about peak blockchain, you know. We have seen growth in 2013, 2017, and so 2021. So what, what are your thoughts about pushing into 2023? Do you think we will see kind of like a, a slowing down of development or is it going to accelerate actually? I think what we'll see is, is a, a change in focus. <clears throat> so I think what, what we've really had is a period now to really battle test the technology, which, you know, as I said before, has, has proven that Algorand is a high performance blockchain. Um, as we heard Stacey say earlier, zero downtime, transaction speed is incredibly fast, transaction cost is incredibly low. The stage now is, is where do we find that real piece of utility. So I think slow down is, is probably the, the wrong description. Um, I, I think a variation in, in what the focus is. And I, I think that core focus is how do we bring that real utility on chain, which is what will be core to adopting both users and developers. Uh, you know, at the moment, there's an incredible focus on TVL and transaction volume, both obviously very, very powerful metrics and, and great metrics to follow. But at their core, we, we need to be looking at why those metrics exist. What, what does high TVL mean and is there real value being created or, or is there artificial value being created? So I think what we've, we've used is things like token emissions to really prove the tech. We've used incentives to really prove out that this technology can function in the way that we intend and it can genuinely be the infrastructure for both financial tech, but you know, in particular, which is what we're talking about today, but also other forms of technology. Um, so I think what we'll see now is we, we need to change from token emissions creates TVL and transaction volume to token emissions and incentives are actually driving genuine adoption. You know, traditionally in the Web2 space, you would use these as lead-in losses or marketing campaigns that have a true understanding of the long-term value created through these incentives. Uh, and I think we'll see a change to, okay, what, what do those incentives bring? What is the long-term value from those incentives? How do we bring more people into the ecosystem through an incentive program that is gonna create long-term value? Um, so, uh, you know, a great example is, is what does real yield look like? How do we bring people that are actually gaining value from the technology without having to be overly incentivized to do so? Um, so a great example would be digitizing uh, real world assets and allowing borrowing against assets that have traditionally been very, very difficult to gain access to equity through. Um, that's a great example where people are more than happy to pay a, a price to access that kind of a liquidity. Um, so I think that'll be really key to this next stage. So probably, Daniel, less slowing down awesome. and, and more a change to what this next generation of, of tech looks like. Super. And, and I'm actually for it. So I think within DeFi, I think there was one chronic problem that actually bothered a lot of that debts, which is essentially when the Federal Reserve increased rates to like 4% percent that's sitting at right now. DeFi, which was experiencing hyper growth in the past two years, essentially had a 0% organic rate, right? So yep. bringing in real-world assets into the space, especially on Algorand, is going to be very essential uh, to, to the next stage, next stage of growth. Well, and, and to that point, you know, GC Head of Capital Markets of Object Capital, we were talking about this this morning, you know, we need to see returns of 8, 9, 10% for it to now be, be viable to adopting and taking the risk in DeFi, mm -hmm. uh, which is where we need to be ensuring we are creating real yield. And if we are going to incentivize for adoption, great, but it needs to be on the basis that there are adopters that will stay long-term once they're in they have utility, they have value, they only need that first lead-in loss marketing expense to get them on board to then be long-term users. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing. So the next question actually goes to uh, Jonathan from uh, Algorai. So we have heard about 
how large the der derivatives and options market is, you know, in traditional finance, you know. So that is like so much larger than the spot market that we have in, in TradFi. So a lot of players and, and developers like yourselves are actually pushing towards providing derivatives and options on the DeFi market. So what do you see in terms of developments in 2023 and, and, and beyond? Yeah, I mean, we, we're of the opinion that, you know, ha having an active and strong derivatives and uh, uh, options market is, is really important for the DeFi space and Algorand. And I mean, when we were very, very pleasantly surprised because uh, the way that Algorand works is that basically it sells uh, options to market makers. And the market makers have an incredible appetite to actually um, take up options on, on Algorand. Um, I mean, when we first spoke with them, you know, all of them were committing uh, 50 million um, vault with no problem, you know, and they're saying if you can ship more, we'll, we'll take more. Um, so there is a, a huge appetite for it. And I think that um, the, the push going into 2023 is how do we make that easier for people to get into? Um, how do we create structured products that um, uh, are, like you say, creating real yield, you know, um, that are ma making it just, you know, easier for people to get into and then fitting their risk profiles um, fitting the exposures that they want. Um, and I think, you know, as we roll out more strategies and more pro uh, structured products around that, it's, I think, really exciting to see uh, where the adoption uh, will come from and how quick it will come up. But I think we're, we're very high on it. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And, and I want to add that Algorai actually raised $1.5 million in the depth of the bear market during everything, <laughs> when everything was crashing around, they actually <laughs> successfully closed their round. And I think that's a testament to working towards, you no. Know, looking at what the market wants no, and, and what Michael has shared about you, right? So that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, awesome. The next question actually goes to John at AlgoFi. So we have seen AlgoFi grow tremendously. In fact, uh, in the last Decipher, you guys were announcing about uh, AlgoFi V1, right? And, and it had, during that period, AlgoFi has, hasn't even fully launched yet. So a lot, we have seen a tremendous amount of growth on you guys. You, know, to, you guys came out with Zapping, you have stable swaps right now, you have liquid governance. So What's, what's the next step for you guys you know, in terms of your roadmap and uh, what, what are the new advancements that you'll see in 2023? Sure, thank you. Um, so mostly, well, the first piece is the user and developer adoption. Like we have these primitives that are getting used by people, but it's still uh, constrained to our community that we find on Discord, Telegram. So I would say it's still quite crypto native users. Um, so I think uh, getting more developers that are either in Web3 or looking to get involved from Web2 is one of the main focuses. Beyond that, making it easier for users, although with this, you know, with the FTX situation and all the things that we've seen play out in the last couple months, I think it might be hard to uh, entice people that are using traditional Web2 fintech products to get into Web3. Uh, that said, we'll definitely try uh, very hard there. Beyond that, we're also focused heavily on a decentralization roadmap because now that we've built this open financial platform, it's very important to get more people uh, the ability to update it and you know, sort of determine how it will uh, evolve over time because that is one of the core principles of DeFi, the fact that not just the transparency, the fact that it's composable, the fact that it's on chain, but also that people can you know, affect changes on the platform and it's not controlled by one team. So, uh, you know, we've already launched our DAO, uh, which came out about a month ago, but one of the first deliverables will be a fully on-chain execution platform. So we're hoping in the next couple months we can launch something that enables users to launch proposals, vote on them, and then fully uh, make the changes through smart contracts, which is exciting because that'll be the, one of the one of the few uh, fully on-chain execution platforms in crypto and the first one on Algorand. So uh, very focused on that. And then beyond that, just building out our open source contribution procedure, decentralizing the front end, just a number of things around making it more accessible by uh, the community uh, to really espouse that important DeFi principle of like openness uh, and, and yeah, collaboration. That's awesome. So I, I wanted to kind of like speak about FTX, right, and kind of like lead it to the next question. So I'm sure everyone on the panel and everyone sitting here, mm. you guys know someone that has been impacted by FTX and uh, it's, it, wa it was a big event, and I'm sure a lot of people lost a lot of money. So in addition to FTX, we actually have seen you know, Voyager, Celsius. We even had uh, BlockFi recently de declaring bankruptcy. So 
I think my question to the panelists is, how does C5 improve upon C5 alternatives? And why, where does D5 actually fall short, even, even in comparison? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so it is pretty easy for me because the way we build, for example, uh, every loan is over collateralized. Any, uh, any operation is trustless. So uh, it's totally different philosophy, right? So when you use a, a, a centralized exchange, okay, you are having some advantages, uh, but to me, they are much less than the advantages you have using DeFi. Um, so, um, obviously, centralized exchange doesn't work. Uh, at least they must be very regulated as is traditional finance. And they will exist, right? But for me, uh, DeFi is just so efficient. And uh, uh, the composability that we will build, for example, we were mentioning that now we have the primitives on Algorand of DeFi, right? And uh, there is many DEXs, uh, AlgoFi, TinyMan, Pact, Humble, and then there is folks with the lending. And uh, um, the, the way that the new apps that we will see in the next year, they will build more advanced things. So um, to me, we are creating this, let's say, trading ecosystem that uh, traders can use, uh, and it will be better. So you will have a simple stop shop, like to, to buy asset and hold it, but as well, you may onboard also other users that prefer to use uh, traditional exchange because of the efficiency or whatever, right? Uh, but um, that's, that's two words that I don't think they will fight to each other. Simply centralized exchange, they may stay there for those who want this. Uh, and uh, then we will have DeFi, which will become always simpler. And that's on us, like on founders. Uh, I really care about this. Like, we really care at folks because um, every time that someone says, okay, uh, centralized exchange are much simpler to use, I don't think that's very true. Maybe at the beginning, because you have a bit to change mentality, right? But as soon as we will have tools that allow you to not store your, uh, uh, your seed phrase, and that will be something uh, easier, right? And then you have all the primitives, which are good, and they will be easy to use. Uh, then DeFi will, will take over, in my opinion. There will exist both words, mm -hmm. but uh, the growth for DeFi is there and it's inevitable. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that you know, storing of private keys is one of the biggest barriers, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm sure some of you guys are noticing and working on off zero, where you can log in with Facebook, log in with Google, and I think mm -hmm. that's really going to change the user experience for the yeah. users. Yeah, in, in, terms of, in terms of FTX, Federico, what, what have you seen in, you know, in the market? Yeah. The trade five sort of things. Are people getting jittery? Yeah, and, of course. Uh, I mean, yeah. uh, everything was affected. By the way, we lost money. The project uh, lost the treasury. People uh, started to stop the discussion. Uh, of course, uh, this was a big event that, uh, especially for the B two C, so the retail, uh, put a lot of uh, uh, bad, uh, bad, bad, bad things in, in the market. On the other side, I think that uh, instead there are two two different phases in this moment. There is the retail that is uh, affected. There is a disaster, FTX, the drama, everything. On the other side, instead there is uh, still some discussion with the B two B, with the with, with the with the, the traditional uh, traditional player that actually are are, are going much better than before. So I think that they start to understand, they start to be curious, they start to want to, to engage, to, uh, to see what is on the other side. So, uh, of course, I'm totally DeFi, so I'm, <laughs> I'm on, on this side. We are but, based. Yeah, but, but probably, yeah, I'm based, so, but I don't think that at this point is probably the best solution yet. So we do need to find the common ground probably between, uh, between the two worlds uh, to, for them to understand and to be a little bit more easily uh, to come more easily near to this world, and for us just to understand. So my background is traditional finance, so probably I, I can understand both, both of the, the two worlds. Uh, for example, now uh, we are doing, a, a, for us it's important because uh, as a startup DeFi, we are doing a, a POC with the regulator in Singapore and Deutsche Bank. And uh, it's uh, not very maybe, uh, too difficult from the tech point of view because we are just uh, showing them the process. So we are, we are already live in the digital world and they, they said they are in the fiat world. And we are showing them that actually a client from, from their side, they can already invest in a digital fund. They are already all the steps and you just need to connect the dots. And, uh, and the dots are already there. So a crypto to fiat, fiat need to be uh, in a wallet, a wallet need to be uh, whitelisted. For example, uh, we are building a southbound token, this one in Ethereum. 
then uh, you need to find uh, the uh, power of attorney so we can manage the, the portfolio. And then from there, you're already in the digital world. At this point, you can connect, for example, the Apple like ours, but uh, probably also the, all the adapt area. Yeah. And you can uh, do whatever is DeFi. Yeah, that's, that, that's definitely interesting. I mean, he just completed a MVP with uh, Deutsche Bank. Yeah, actually, so, yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, on, on, it's not completed yet, so we'll complete it next month, but uh, it's, uh, awesome. it's ongoing. It's interesting because uh, for us, uh, of course, we have the first interaction with the very tier one bank. And, uh, and, and for them, it um, looks like that they want to understand a little bit more uh, the process. And actually, we're also analyzing for them uh, what could be the uh, role of the bank in the future of, for example, for us, digital fund management became a reality. So how they change their role, how they change their fees, how they monetize, and stuff like that. Awesome. So, yeah, that, 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 that's really cool because even in times like that, we are looking at banks and FIs kind of like making pushes into DeFi, and I think hmm. situations like that really make them realize that, hey, you know, having your values on-chain auditable is really, really important. And uh, I, I believe Cumberland, which is one of the larger market makers, recently had a tweet thread and they were sharing that, hey, we are, they were going to explore a, a lot more on uh, just pure DeFi and on-chain value, which is, which is one of the more important things. So, but kind of like, Michael, do you have anything to add in terms of FTX? And <coughs> yeah, look, I, th I think CXs are absolutely necessary. C currently, they are the core on-ramp and off-ramp. I think even Devin's announcement earlier about USDCA being accepted at Binance is a great example. The reason we're excited is because of access. It, it allows people to enter and exit. You know, to think everything can be decentralized is an unrealistic goal, I think, because in reality, we need money or funds coming or even, even other elements like data coming in from Web 2 and the traditional space into the Web 3 space, and centralized exchanges play an absolutely core role in that gateway between um, with the Web 2 space and the Web 3 space. I, I think what that then presents is, well, you know, how, how do we make it safer? Um, and I think at its core, you know, one, you shouldn't really be using centralized exchanges as a, a storage location, but the reason that, that it is done is because it, it is more familiar, which means it's easier. If it's something you're more used to, it's something you find easier to manage, which means, you know, we, we do need to make DeFi and access to decentralization simpler, which is, you know, something we've all talked about and we all agree on. But I think the other part is how, how do we make centralized exchanges or centralized or non-on-chain opaque organizations more transparent? Uh, things like proof of reserves are not enough because in reality in these cases which we've seen with FTX, liabilities can also exist that we, we don't have transparency on, which means if they've got $2 billion worth of assets and $2 billion worth of liabilities, they actually don't have anything. You know, so it, it's almost a, a live uh, proof of financial health is, is going to be fairly key. Um, and, and this is not just a, a centralized exchange problem. This is, is really an oracle issue of, of being able to get trustworthy data on chain that, that we know is genuine and we know can be trusted and, and actually uh, results in, in the true information we're looking for. Uh, but being able to see live financial health checks, a uh, proof of financial health, I think will be very, very key to, to trusting the centralized organizations more. Um, you know, so I, I think in reality, again, we need centralized exchanges. They are the core funnel for both entry and exit. We need them to be more accountable, and then we need to make DeFi more accessible so we do have more people that are willing to transition into DeFi and not use centralized organizations as their home base. It's, it's really interesting that you mentioned that, you know, having this hybrid model with exchanges and cooperation be between exchanges and DeFi is going to be the next thing, I think. I, I really think that that's the natural next step. We, we, we would see more growth in, in that aspect and there's probably going to be a market gap for service providers, you know, kind of like aligning users on, on both sides. So that's why And look, we are seeing, like you said, all zero um, is kind of a, an interesting middle piece. Mm. Um, you know, the key element there is, is where are your keys in those situations? So, you know, it's not quite decentralized, it's not quite centralized. In, in reality, I think uh, there, isn't, there isn't a proposed method of, of um, being non-custodial and being easy right now. There's only sort of pieces in between and you're giving up on a, on a scales of security versus ease uh, and finding that right balance and, and finding the, the easiest but um, most trustworthy or decentralized method of access will, will be a major piece of this next two to three years. That's interesting. Sounds like a play for middleware. <laughs> it, it definitely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so in, in, in terms of like FTX, you no, know, John, what, what do you think in terms of like impacts on the derivatives market, confidence? Well, I think what's kind of a nice benefit is, you know, we were actually uh, talking to a very large institu an institutional brokerage right now, 
And before the FTX crash, they were looking at um, offering um, crypto derivatives and trading to their customers, and they were actually going to API into FTX. Thank God that didn't <laughs> launch before, <laughs> before it happened. And uh, now the, the conversation has come around to, you know, can we integrate um, DeFi protocols to offer those things instead? And, and I think that's a, that's a good push for us, uh, for all of us on the stage. Um, but, you know, just, just taking a, a thought on, on, you know, what can we learn from the sexes? Um, just that ease of use is, is something that definitely um, is, is leagues ahead of, unfortunately, where we are in DeFi. Um, and, and, you know, improving that, that user experience is, is going to be key over the next couple of years. Um, one of the ways that we've been trying to address this is with bridging. So we, we built the Messina Bridge um, with the intention to uh, enable, you know, enable interoperability, but our real push for it is we don't actually see bridging as a product, we see bridging as infrastructure. Um, the ambition is to work with um, founders and protocols to integrate it into their uh, dApps so that it, the bridging just happens seamlessly. You know, the customer doesn't even have to think. I mean, we, we, we see a future where potentially on Algofy or, or you know, folks, you, someone can come in with a MetaMask, they have USDC um, on ETH, they want to deposit to, to one of your vaults with USDC on Algorand, they just click and it just bridges behind the scenes. It lets them know in the transaction box, but you know, it's that, it's that um, ease of use that we really need to work on, right? Because that's where the centralized exchanges made it so easy for, for um, people to come in. They didn't, like you said, they didn't have to worry about um, their, their passphrases or their keys. They didn't have to worry about which chain they're on or which wallet has access and all of these things. And we, we've got a long way to go, but you know, yeah, that, that's awesome. Great learnings, and yeah. I want to add a bit on this. Like, um, centralized <coughs> exchange exists from a, a bit much longer, yes. right, than uh, than <laughs> DeFi. So we are new, but I think we grow much faster than them. Honestly, I think founders of DeFi they are uh, they are better. Honestly, if you look at oh, the yeah. exchange, they are mostly all the same. Indeed, we are different. Everyone is trying to innovate. And I think we, we will be better in, in yeah. like, we, we grow much faster. I, I think the key yeah. is we, we all have the same goal, which yeah. is decentralization, where it delivers value over centralization is, is the core of what we want to achieve, and our grand as a high performance tech allows that. But I, I think the other piece that we have to be conscious of is I think for most, most humans on the planet, um, I don't know, I've seen, seen singles about humans, but most humans on the planet, won't, under, won't understand how blockchain works, won't really care how blockchain works, that, that tech layer will be absolutely invisible to yeah. them, which is, is in reality the core to adoption. Mm -hmm. They just yeah. need to see the product they're using, see it as valuable, see it as useful, and be able to access it in the simplest way possible, as Jonty said, without having to really understand the technology underneath, because I think it's unreasonable to think yeah majority of the world are ever going to understand or want to understand. You know, the, the reference I always like to use is I have no idea how my email works, but it's brilliant and yeah. it's great yeah, and I use it every day and it's useful. <laughs> and will blockchain will be at the core of the exact same revolution for, for data exchange and, and what we're talking about today in particular is finance. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you summarized it really very, very well, actually. So we have to here today five panelists and uh, just now when I was behind, four of them came to me and said, hey guys, can can we make announcements on, on, on the panel? So I was like, oh, sure, I should carve out some time you know, for, for these guys. So let's, uh, let's probably begin with Federico. Maybe you want to go first and, and share what? Yeah, of course, because of, uh, of the event also. So we decided uh, to go mainnet. So we have, we have the first beta version of mainnet uh, since uh, yesterday night. Uh, we started the development uh, last year, by the way, and uh, we concluded that the smart contract uh, in May, June, then we entered testnet. Then, of course, the market conditions were not optimal to go mainnet. But then now we released the, the first version, beta version in mainnet uh, yesterday, yesterday night, so if you want to try. Awesome. Good. John, how about yourself? Um, yeah, well, Algorai has been out for two months now on mainnet, and it's been uh, going pretty well. So we've only done um, AlgoVault's uh, call input. Um, we're going to be launching next month uh, together with our partners over at Optio. Um, <laughs> Vaults for Go ETH and Go BTC, uh, book calls and puts, uh, and I think that's really really exciting. But the push there is we're going to be growing um, the product offerings. Um, we're going to give you giving more options for people to to get exposure to options. Um, and on the Messina front, um, we have launched the SDK on mainnet, so we can work with that's protocols awesome. to integrate it behind the scenes and um, build an interoperable future. Cool. And uh, as a bank holder, 
I have to hear from Algo 5, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, our goal over the next six months is to fully decentralize the Algo 5 protocol, uh, where we're hoping, uh, you know, the, thing, the goal that we believe we can achieve is get it so that all of the execution and updates to the front end and the protocol smart contracts are fully mediated on chain by the community of uh, governance uh, token holders. And for that, that's a big achievement because for, you know, for now it's been the core developers that are you know, guided by the community, but we want it to be the community uh, that's getting support from core developers. So that'll be our goal. That's really cool, that's really, really cool. And last but not least, we have folks. Yeah, so as some of you may know, <coughs> Folks Finance version two is already in testnet. Uh, we are deploying the new feature a bit by a bit, uh, but Folks Finance version two is uh, it's something that's really never seen on DeFi. Uh, we are going to deploy on the version two stable rates, uh, multiple collateral, multiple run position, uh, flash loans. Uh, we will integrate, we already integrated uh, Deflex, so we will have swap integration directly using uh, DeFi and Alamex, which are the two major aggregators on Algorand. And as well, uh, the swap uh, uh, feature will be integrated in some of operation of the lending and together with the flash loans, so we will be able to do very advanced feature on a lending protocol that is not seen so far. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. Th thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming for the panel. Uh, and it's going live on mainnet by the 12th of December, so get ready. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Give it up for our panelists. Okay. Shout out. Thanks, Daniel. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's another round of applause for Dan Daniel Un in that panel, which I thought was exciting to see what new heights Algorand DeFi will hit in next year. It's exciting stuff. Um, so right now, uh, actually, I have an announcement uh, just in case. Uh, I hope, hopefully, folks are interested. There's the, uh, the build pitch final competition on the developer greenhouse stage at 1 o'clock. And this is the cul culmination of a lot of work, a lot of folks uh, involved. I think that would be really interesting. So that's 1 o'clock at the developer greenhouse stage. So if you can make it, please, please go ahead and support those folks who've worked really hard. So right now I have the privilege of actually moderating a panel um, focused on financial inclusion. And this is about, you know, ultimately the 1.7 billion people in the world who are unbanked. And what does financial inclusion mean for that, kind, for that world, for the most marginalized people in the world. And we're gonna hear from um, several folks who are working uh, in, in different fields, different areas, but the commonality is inclusion. And you're gonna hear folks from folks from Sub-Saharan Africa, from Latin America, from Asia. And I think the, the common purpose that these folks share will come out in this conversation. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, um, a lot, 10 minutes at the end for question and answers. I want folks, if you're interested, to ask these people some questions, get engaged, make some comments. So we'll, we'll set aside the last 10 minutes for Q&A from the audience. And there'll be a couple of folks with microphones walking around in case somebody wants to raise their hand. Um, and please be, please be part of it. So uh, I'd like to welcome the panel on stage. Uh, Victor Mapunga um, from Harare, Zimbabwe, uh, who's the co-founder of Flex ID. Uh, Abhinav Sinha, uh, co-founder of Eco India Financial Services. Eduardo Astra, the CEO and co-founder of AgroToken. Akshay Chopra, who's the uh, head of innovation and design at Visa. And J James Zhang, the co-founder and CEO of Jambo. So welcome these folks on stage and we'll get right to it. Sitting where you guys want. And we'll go around the horn. Thank you. All right.
right, welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to have you here. And what I want to do, um, I think, in the course of this conversation is to understand you know, what the problem is that, that they're trying to solve, how they're trying to solve it, and kind of why. You know, why are these folks engaged in, in this line of work? Um, so I, I want to start it off, uh, I think, Victor, I want to start it off with you. Um, just to tell us a little bit about yourself, but I think, you know, more importantly, really f focus on the problem that you're trying to solve, and we'll kind of come around and go as to how you're trying to solve it. Yeah, hi, everybody. Excited to be at Decipher. Um, so I was born and raised uh, in a little country called Zimbabwe. I love calling it Wakanda because, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of exciting things are going on over there. Uh, and, it's, you know, essentially, like many other people in my generation, uh, you know, we decided to go out of the country for us, you know, to further our education. And it's upon returning home that, you know, I was actually bamboozled by this problem that regardless of this fact that I was born and raised in this society, I could not open a bank account because I did not have my name on a small piece of paper called the utility bill. And that was more than enough to ensure that I had this insane obstacle to access a very basic financial service. So essentially, Flex ID organically materialized from that. And what it is, Flex ID fundamentally exists to fulfill the promise of onboarding the next billion people, not just into Web3, but into the broader economy. And we do this by leveraging our grant to offer a decentralized digital identity solution in order to offer access. Because without access, there is no market for the products we are building. Without access, there will be no users for the protocols and platforms that everybody in this room is eagerly building. And this is what Flex ID essentially exists to do. That's great. And actually, the, uh, the thought of access brings me to you, Akshay. I mean, access, what does that mean for you folks at Visa? And given the outline that Victor has just given us of the, the magnitude of the numbers, and, and how, do you, how do you talk about that? Yeah, look, access is absolutely at the core of everything we do, right? We enable millions and millions of people to pay at hundreds of, uh, tens of millions of merchants, so 80 million merchants around the world and counting. And if we look at it broadly, yes, we want to enable people to get financially included. In fact, the digital payment is, for many people, the very first time they have used any kind of formal financial system. Uh, so inclusion from that perspective, uh, digital payments plays a critical role, especially in this part of the world. Um, and even from a crypto perspective, right, access and inclusion are, are critical. Um, and you, we'll talk more about that, but the average crypto holder struggles to use their uh, crypto holdings at a point of sale, like, uh, you know, to buy a frappe or uh, to, you know, get some bread. And so how do we enable that access? So we are working with more than 75 of the biggest exchanges in the world to actually issue visa cards that people can use to buy groceries, to buy anything at 80 million visa merchants globally. And that's been really popular because we saw in 2021, so this is already, um, you know, when it was still taking up, uh, we saw $3 billion were spent on those visa cards because people wanted to be able to use their crypto um, anywhere to run their lives. Um, and even beyond that, you know, there's so many cases for access and inclusion just by connecting all these people to the different nodes in our network, and that's something really at the core of what we do. Fantastic. Um, and I guess, Eduardo, I'll, I'll come to you next because I know you've got a partnership with Visa, and it's interesting in terms of, again, this, this, this idea of access. But talk a little bit about AgriToken and the problem that you're trying to solve and and a little bit about the how. We can get back to that later. But uh, it's, it's a little bit different from everybody else up here. So I want you to talk about the, the problem itself. Yeah, the problem is I think we are sorry for the boys. I've been... I've been yelling a lot for Argentina on the World Cup last, <laughs> last game. It was the first one, so I get <laughs> um, so I, I ran out of voice a little bit. But basically, we are giving, uh, we are democratizing the grain, uh, the commodities, and we are giving farmers the possibility to trade and to sell and to price their their uh, production, their grains uh, in a um, more uh, fair uh, price and fair part, and to use them in microtransactions, something that they are not able now. So 
that is what we, we are solving. And we are giving access to people we think, uh, well, we talk about this crypto winter, um, and we think people will be willing to have uh, access to other crypto assets, and assets that are guaranteed and collateralized by uh, real assets. That will be uh, something that, for example, in, in Latin America, where we are based and we started, 2% uh, of the people, they don't have, uh, so, sorry, 99% of the people, they don't have access to, to the capital market. They don't have uh, access to saving. Uh, so they don't have their, their currency. They don't have currency. Their currency is devaluating. The, the inflation, we are talking about inflation of 50, between 50 and 100% a year. So they lost all their savings. They don't have a way they can, they can buy a property. They don't have access to financing. Uh, we believe that having savings on, on assets, on real assets that they understand, like wheat, corn, uh, farming, farmland, uh, energy, things that they understand and they can, they can uh, really touch and see where they are, that will be a big, a big difference for them. And the, and the focus is the smallholder farmer focus, that access to capital, that increase ultimately in income is what a big part of what this is about. And we, I know we have some friends from the United Nations World Food Program and others here who are really focused on increasing the smallholder farmer kind of power of that purse, right? We, we, this is to empower the, 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 the small farmer, you know, like to give them access to financing you know, using the grain and to use the grain and spend the grain uh, whenever they want or whenever the, the best price and to give it access to that. So we believe that by tokenizing grain or tokenizing food, you know, like on the long run, we will, you know, uh, a farmer could sell directly to the consumer. Mm -hmm. So we all know how much lettuce or tomato we spend in one week in, a, in our homes. Why we cannot buy from this straight from the farmer and, the, and we have delivered the amount of tomato or lettuce straight to our house in the quality that we like? And we, we can pay for that like a fair price and the farmer and the producer can receive a fair price for that. Uh, you know, we, we, we deposit the money, we leave it in a smart contract, in an escrow account. Once the, once the product is delivered, the money is delivered to the farmer. The farmer will know how much exactly he's going to receive for all his production and how much he has to produce and in what quality. So that, that, is, right. the, that is what we are empowering for those small farmers, that they can have more uh, possibility too, you know, that they, they can see in, in advance how much they have to produce and how much they are going to get for the crops, Some, something that now they have no idea, or someone, they have so many intermediaries in the middle that they don't receive the, the fair price. Right, and that's the, the power of, of new technologies. And James, I mean, you talk about earning, right, and talk about empowering people to actually make some kind of profit. Um, you're all about kind of learn, play, and earn, and talk a little bit about that. Um, and I think it kind of segues nicely into what you're doing in terms of that power of that making some money gives you? For sure. Uh, first of all, appreciate you, man, the Algorand team for setting all this up. Um, quick intro. Hi, I'm James, co-founder of Jambo. Grew up as Victor's neighbor, not too far, um, in DRC in Central Africa. I was there for about 16 years. My family's been there three generations. So honestly, what got me into crypto and everything that Jan Jambo is centered around is around the problems that we think are the most interesting to solve using crypto in the market that's most interesting to solve in the region of Africa. Um, so as of today, Jumbo essentially is an education company where our first product out is called Jumbo Academy. It's a 10 week learn to earn program like rabbit hole, alchemy, every week and learn something new and earn tokens. So essentially Africa is like 1% super rich, 99% the same. So if you're expecting someone to be able to transfer tokens, preload your digital wallet with tokens, 
that's not the 99% of Africa we're talking about here. So end of the day, what our mission is, is for someone that like a 19-year-old in Lagos to be able, because there's 50% smartphone penetration in Africa, don't get me wrong, it might not be the phone that you have, but it's a low data, low bandwidth, low storage, 100 to 200 US dollar phone that's able to access Web3 Rails. And with 60 to 80% unbanked, they're able to be banked. So they first have to have the knowledge of what crypto can do and help them. Uh, so that is why our first product out is called Jumbo Academy, roughly 100,000 users today. Um, the mobile version of it actually just launched yesterday on Android, so we're very excited. As you know, Africa is predominantly uh, mobile-centric, so uh, that's a little bit about what we're doing today. That's fantastic. And Abhinav, and you, I think you started Eco India 2007. 2007, yeah, it's yeah. been a long journey. So yeah. talk to us about the original, you know, what, what was the problem that you were trying to solve and how, and how you've been doing it actually over time. I mean, I think it's sure. a really interesting narrative. First of all, thank you, Matt. Thanks for humbled by the Algorand folks to give me an opportunity to share my story. I, I relate to all the stories of all the entrepreneurs, everyone sitting on the stage here. But let me just share, uh, I started my company in September of 2007. It's been 15 hard years of trying to, trying to create impact in India. But just before I started my company, I had this two years of experience where I worked really close with mobile network operators in India and Middle East and Southeast Asia. And kind of witnessed how prepaid telephony actually grew like wildfire in these regions as well as in India. And India, where there was so much of, in, of exclusion of telephony, we, we saw billion phones get distributed within less than five years. And as a, as a young guy and uh, 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 you know, somebody who kind of understood technology, I thought something's got to be done in the space of financial services as well. And there was a lot of information out there uh, you know, which, was, which was kind of conveying back to us that only about 20% of bankable Indians had bank accounts. And uh, certainly the problem that Victor is solving, solving today, nobody unfortunately solved for us. And we had to go ahead and solve for, for ourselves in terms of ID. And uh, so we recognized that bank accounts were not getting opened by people who could have had a bank account. And once you don't have a bank account, you can't cash in, cash out, payments, etc. is out of the question at all. So the last 15 years, these are the things that you've really solved for. You know, India in 2007 probably w was just about 20% of people who were banked. I'm happy to share that now India claims more than a billion bank accounts uh, that have been opened in the last 15 years. And trust me, it's not the bank branches which, which have opened it. it. It's not, and they're not being opened on smartphones either. These are micro entrepreneurs spread across the length and breadth of the country who are assisting, who are on one side getting trained by the banks and on the other side interfacing with customers and opening bank accounts for them and assisting them with basic banking services. And amongst a lot of operators who operate in this space, Echo is one of them. And I'm just one, I'm just happy to be participating in this, uh, in this, uh, in this sector in India and very proud to be a, a contributor, certainly because, uh, you know, we, we started 15 years back and we were amongst the very first ones who kind of started to do it. We certainly know the history, present, past and the future of this in India. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, you touched on that I, I, notion of identification. Victor, I mean, I've heard you speak very eloquently about, you know, identification as a human right, in a sense. I mean, how, how important is that? I mean, it's a kind of a theme throughout the panel, in a sense, more so for us some than others. But why is that so important? And how do you specifically solve for that problem, particularly in remote areas where, you know, access is, is very limited? Great. You know, fun fundamentally, uh, identity is necessary for social mobility. So let's say I am a farmer that is actually going to be utilizing AgroToken. Mm -hmm. And say AgroToken is working with FlexID. Now, when my mom grew up in her village, they had this bucket system where they would actually harvest the maize or the corn that they would have farmed, put it in a bucket, and they would take it to the school in order to pay tuition. For most subsistence farmers in the world, this is their form of income. But if you operate within the informal sector, the formal economy does not even recognize that as a form of income. Flex ID now provides this individual, even if they do not have a smartphone, with a wallet that allows them to now store these verifiable credentials from AgroToken, who will know that this individual 
is actually economically active at their particular level. Likewise with Jumbo, if this individual is actually earning via their platform, they are now able to issue that individual that credential directly associated to their wallet. And what this means is innovators now like Echo or any other builder can build applications that directly target this individual to verify those credentials and provide service. So what we've essentially done is we've now built the bridge that allows individuals to communicate directly with institutions, startups, companies, and anyone else really, if they want to provide those individuals with service. Because without that, you essentially discover it is a challenge even for companies to scale. Because how are you going to take your company into Nigeria? How are you going to take your company into Sudan? How are you going to take your company into Zimbabwe, into India, if you do not have the infrastructure which is going to allow you to own the individuals that are the most economically active, whether they're subsistence farmers, whether they're commuter omnibus taxi drivers, whether it's a lady who is a vendor. She is earning via mobile money. She's receiving her payments on her mobile phone. She does not have a bank account or a credit score. We are now able to give her a platform that is going to allow her to now have that dignity, to have that financial independence, and to allow institutions to now build services that target markets that traditionally they were never going to target. So Flex ID fundamentally came into existence to solve that problem. And we're excited because as of now, in Zimbabwe, we've managed to acquire over 300,000 active users, and majority of them emerged from the financial service need to open bank accounts, to apply for credit with microfinance institutions, and even in healthcare. We now have individuals that used to have their medical prescriptions and records stored in physical counter books, now storing them in that digital and verifiable credential format. And what this means is they can travel the breadth and width of the whole country, and any medical practitioner who uses Flex ID is able to verify them and provide them that healthcare service. And that was never possible before. Oh, that's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. I must speak to you, Akshay. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Every time I hear Victor speak, I clap. <laughs> Even in my head and walking down the street, I'm thinking about Victor. <laughs> but, but that must speak to you. I mean, in terms of the numbers and the, 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 the prohibitions, in a sense, the roadblocks that people encounter in terms of entering that system. How do you respond to something that, that Victor said in terms of uh, uh, that the basis for access is identification and, and the growth that involves? Yeah, so look, here's how I would respond. Firstly, by clapping. <laughs> um, secondly, by supporting him, right, in every way we can. Um, and here's another thing, access and inclusion is not one thing that you can solve with one solution. This is a broad spectrum of problems from you know basic financial inclusion to getting uh, you know even very developed segments and markets access to things they currently can't access. Um, so we, as a network, as a platform, our role is to enable all these kind of use cases, uh, and that's what we do best. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you a real case study, right? Like with Eduardo with the Agro Token. So these guys have built which I consider an absolutely fantastic model where you take grain reserves, you tokenize them, and uh, you know the farmer wins because now he's able to sell those tokens not just to institutions but to customers. He's able to um, you know, generate liquidity in a way that was never possible before. And where we come in after the great work that these guys have done is, okay, now the farmer needs to also go and buy food for their family or to pay for an Uber or whatever they want to do, right? And so what AgroToken does with Visa is they issue a Visa card that the farmer gets. As simple as that. And right with that card, they can use it at merchants. Through other services of ours, which, you know, for those of you who are payment geeks, we call push payments. Um, we enable people to liquidate their agro tokens and um, push money directly into fiat, into their bank accounts to finance their kids' education or whatever it is. So the innovation that's happening in the space of inclusion and access, like you've heard from these fine folks yeah. here, it's, it's tremendous. It's, it's varied. It's diverse. And um, I, I would say, like, not just for Visa, but all of you sitting here, how can your proposition, how can what you, the value you bring enable some of these kind of folks to do what they do better? Yeah, that's a great answer. And, and James, I'm curious, like, which, what's, what, do you, what do you see in the future? I mean, you talked about smartphone penetration. I think you said something like 50%, even though many of those are relatively low end. But 
it seems to be growing in ubiquity with, with some with, with fairly rapidly. What does that mean for you, and how do you see Jumbo kind of growing and bringing that to more and more people? Um, and how fast do you think that will happen? A great, great question. Um, I think let's throw some statistics out there, right? 12x crypto adoption last year in Africa. Three of the largest peer-to-peer -peer markets for Bitcoin transactions is in Africa. Number two is Nigeria, eight and 10 is South Africa and Kenya. Like these are stats that, you know, Jumbo is not contributing to. I'm saying these are just hard facts. That's what's happening in Africa as a continent right now. I think smartphone penetration is super important because only through that can they actually access a lot of the Web3 rails. Now, if you look at some of the most interesting problems, right, where I said, I, how I even got into crypto is sending money back home to Congo. Well, usually you would use Western Union, T plus five, T plus eight, um, 10%, 8%. Well, using Bitcoin, it's a lot faster. Well, today, let's see, banking the unbanked might be one of the biggest themes around Africa. So in our main application that comes out next year, our non-custodial wallet is one of the most important functions. But let's say tomorrow you could airdrop a non-custodial wallet to everyone in Africa. Congrats, you just banked the entire continent. The problem is people still would have no access to the broader financial infrastructure because they don't have access to credit. So flex ID, very important, yes sir. Um, so yeah, credit is something we've been thinking about since day one, since Jumbo launched exactly a year ago. Um, how you can build up a credit system for people that, that is predominantly 60 to 80% unbanked. Is that through, because everything in Africa is right now is done through your phone number, right? It's monopolized by a few telcos. 4G penetration is great in Africa, it's just very expensive. So you have to work with a lot of Web 2 and Web 1 folks and individuals locally in order to actually get to that Web 3 stage to help them bypass legacy gatekeepers. So I think credit and a non-custodial wallet is two of the most important things for Jumbo moving forward next year. And the last component is around the exchange, right? Anytime you're talking about Africa, uh, 54 countries, every region is so different. Like I grew up in Congo, uh, that was a Belgian colony, so I grew up speaking French. You move to East Africa, Kenya, that's Swahili, English. You go to Senegal, that's Wolof in French again. Every region is so di di different. And how are you gonna penetrate that fiat to crypto on rail? So from Congolese francs, you know, to uh, Naira, et cetera. Because today, M-Pesa is probably one of the best networks for mobile money in Africa. Um, but you cannot send money from Kenya using M-Pesa to your boy in Ghana at all. So crypto obviously can solve for that. But before that, it's who can build the infrastructure and help users be able to have a mobile wallet, be able to have a credit system to access the broader financial infrastructure, and then creating these trading pairs and local currency to crypto. I mean, imagine that cross-border ability to send money it's like if you bets would be a game changer but I have enough you know James, James talked about um, uh, you know the future and what that holds and you talked about a billion new accounts since 2007 I'm just thinking why this is so important what have you seen since then in terms of you talked about the increase in the number who have access what does that mean for a country like India, what has that meant in, term, in terms of economic growth and personal growth for people who had been locked out prior to that? Because you have a, a relatively long uh, stay in this, in this, in this. Certainly, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, the kind of visibility that we have, uh, just to share a few numbers, uh, at least from, from, from an Echo's perspective, uh, we have about 300,000 micro entrepreneurs embedded on our platform. We help about 200 digital brands reach to 50 million customers over the last 15 years. And these brands would uh, span across certainly banking. Most of our work has been across uh, with banks. But we've also started to work with insurance companies, um, utility companies. We've, we've now also started to work with ed tech, gaming, entertainment, and stuff like that. And one of the biggest learning, you know, if you kind of take a step back, one of the biggest learning that, that we had is that, uh, you know, India is brimming with, you know, we are dripping with, with innovation every day. And there's, there's almost a digital brand taking birth every day, right? And what's happening is that digital brands across these categories think of digital journeys for customers to consume their products and services. Now, what we've understood is once, once great user experience are created on the mobile phone, while it certainly creates inclusion for a certain segment of the society, what's happening in India, it also, it, it parallelly creates an exclusion as well. You know, certainly everybody probably has a smartphone, but somebody 
is unable to understand the language of the mm -hmm. of the application somebody is hesitant to use it etc cetera, etc cetera. many other many smaller bigger reasons lead to exclusion as a result of which what we are saying is there is a need for physical assistance now today that assistance may be needed for banking tomorrow it may be needed for insurance you know five years down it may be needed for wealth wealth management maybe at tech etc cetera, etc cetera. but there is a space for assistance along with self service and what really made a billion accounts possible yeah. was assistance right people weren't walking into pe people don't have formal jobs as a result of which the organizations don't really help them open bank accounts people weren't uh, you know walking into bank branches etc right so there was need for assistance to be provided over the last 15 years we we've, we've kind of noticed that assistance is not only required in in banking and therefore financial inclusion tomorrow we'll be talking about insurance mm -hmm. inclusion you know five years down we may be talking about entertainment inclusion mm -hmm. right and uh, that's what needs to be solved for and uh, as far as uh, you know india is concerned a billion billion uh, bank accounts uh, you know one of the most one of the most important things that uh, infrastructure like ours also solved for is that during covid uh, you know i don't know how many of you kind of noticed that there were millions of people who were walking back home from industrial cities and towns in india to back to back to their villages you know because the government announced a lockdown and there were a lot of people out of jobs and the government then kind of came in and and decided to do benefit transfers right now you start transferring money from the federal government mm -hmm. onto the bank account of the people who live in villages guess what there's no atms yeah. how do you and and they're not you know using digital modes of payment but there were these small micro entrepreneurs with biometric devices in in their hand who were providing cash out services to millions of people and just to give you a scale i think uh, the federal government disburses close to about 7 to 8 billion us dollars monthly which gets cashed out to infrastructure like ours and not the traditional banking infrastructures of atm and bank branches and that's how huge this infrastructure of let's say branchless banking if you want to say agent banking you want to say has come about so there's massive economic uh, 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 development because of this infrastructure there's massive inclusion because of this infrastructure and just to kind of you know talk about you know we've we've spent 15 years building this access building the technology and uh, you know when i hear uh, james talk about inclusion with with crypto wallets it's like wow I wish that some of those things were available in 2007, but in 2007, we just had to do the hard work, right? right. And uh, so here is a company 15 years, 15 years old, which has built everything in Web2. And uh, now we are really kind of deep diving into what the technology can kind of offer us. And because eventually we are all about inclusion, right? We're democratizing so many services to, to citizens in the country. What we've understood is finally there is a technology which helps us do that too right it is fundamentally you know algorand or blockchain is built for for democratizing access and there are like tons of use cases you know we are we can now think about you know where we break our existing tech stack put them on the blockchain and there's so many more beautiful things and better access can 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 get created well that democratization of access is a theme that is running through this panel it's a theme that runs through what we do at, at impact and inclusion i want to Open it up for questions, but Eduardo, what does this mean to the smallholder farmer? And give us an example of why, what it means in somebody's life, a concrete, you know, this is why this is important. Because I think as we talk about blockchain and we talk about the, the things like this in this space, it's important to remember and to focus on real life use cases and what they mean to people around the world. So if you feel like it, please, please do. Yeah, I think. Just to explain you, I'm going to use uh, the examples of all that we are here. Um, what, what is uh, just uh, Victor said about his, his little community or, or town where people grow corn and put it in a basket uh, is a collaborative, no? Uh, and, and these are small farmers. They work together, small piece of land, and, and they want to get the best for, for what they produce. At, at the end, what they, they, they produce what is food. is what we eat at the end of the day. is what we have on, on our dishes. And, and maybe they don't get, they get the right price for that and the right value. I think uh, during COVID, uh, people start understanding the, 
the new luxuries in the world, no? That is, you know, food, energy, now with the war and all that. But uh, basically, all of us, we are doing a collaborative world. And I think blockchain and the new technology is super collaborative. Because at the end, we are working all together for the same. He's giving identity to these people that we can certify that production, that corn that they produce, okay? That we, that's what we created. We created the proof of grain reserve. That is the proof of existence, a proof of liquidity. And that is the documentation he will create. Uh, Jambo is going to create us the, the way, the access for that, uh, that tokens that we created to use as collateral, you know, for, for, for a financing for these farmers that they didn't have. You know, uh, the, we are going to use uh, this access to the new fintech, that Web2, because at the end, the Web3 is a little bit complicated, maybe, for farmers that they don't have this uh, education. And how they are going to use it with Visa. Mm -hmm. Visa will give them access to all these uh, places, to all these merchants where they can use this, this corn that they produce. At the end, what we are doing is with AgroToken is going back to barter. Mm -hmm. Instead of coming with a bag of corn <laughs> and paying you know, for a coffee and, and taking the grains out of the bag and put it what is left on the back, he's coming with a visa and paying straight with his tokens, his, his corn that is flying, you know, from his account, from his wallet of corn to the, to the wallet of the uh, Starbucks, mm -hmm. let's say. Right. Uh, but but this, is, this is what we are doing that is, looks, sounds complicated, but it's simple. It's coming back to the roots. It's, it's where everything was created uh, before. And, and this is, uh, at the end, what will empower these small farmers to, to can be, you know, be, be a, how you say, rewarded in the right way and the fair way for what, what they do and they produce. That is, at the end of the day, it's food for us. No? That's great. Well, thank you. And, uh, and this is all happening now. This is all, <laughs> it's all happening now, which is fantastic. Um, so I, wanted to, I wanted to throw it out since anybody has questions. Uh, we have you know, several minutes left. Anybody who's interested in asking a question, just raise your hand. There's somebody with a mic will come over and, and, and feel free to speak up. And you can introduce yourself as well if you want and tell us your name and where you're from. Yeah, hi, thanks very much. Wonderful panel. Um, my name's Jane Thomason. Um, you've talked about what's needed to take it to scale and people have talked about infrastructure, but I'd love it if anyone from the panel can talk about regulation and jurisdictional challenges in scaling these solutions. Actually, you want to yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's such a complex area to look at, right? Like the regulation challenges. So I think, looking at Victor's world, KYC, know your customer. That's the literally the doorway to get into any kind of financial product. Um, so many different uh, regulations around that. You have places where they say you don't need to ever come to a branch. You never need to actually meet someone. You know, just scan your face and we'll verify your identity. You have places like India where you know <coughs> biometrics and identity are tied together in a government database, so it makes it really easy. And then you have some markets like I used to work um, in Asia Pacific before this, and there was this one Southeast Asian country which just would not let go of the wet signature in anything financial, mm -hmm. and so. Ultimately, I think we managed to change their mind because we went with a fintech partner. We actually built a proof of concept about how a uh, rural citizen can simply sign up for financial services. And all they had to do was a few things, verify a couple of documents on their phone, take a couple of pictures, put in a couple of IDs, and that's it. And we told the, the government that, look, from start to finish, from literally being unbanked to having a visa card, this took five minutes. And all you need to do is remove the wet signature from this equation. It was the central bank, actually. And, and it did actually change their mind. So I feel like we have to kind of show them the light. And uh, I really believe in the power of prototyping and co-creation. We've done several with uh, AgroToken. Um, and building these things in a very tangible and visual fashion, taking them to the regulators, I hope that's how we can change some of these minds, make it a more homogenous uh, world. Thank you. Thank you, Akshay. Um, any other questions? Anybody's got a question? Raise your hand. That was one in the back.
Hi. Um, I have a question for Victor, and I think for James. Um, you mentioned that Africa is a very complex continent to work on a pan-African level because of all the jurisdiction differences, the historical differences, the linguistic differences. And when we hear uh, about innovation and digitalization, we often hear about Kenya, South Africa, um, often English-speaking countries in which digitalization, uh, mobile money, uh, where M-Pesa is already you know, often established uh, uh, a baseline. I'm curious to know how might we reach those people um, in some of the countries in Africa that perhaps are the most excluded, that perhaps speak Tigrinha or perhaps speak Portuguese, or are not naturally included in that kind of, if I may, leading <coughs> half of countries um, in Africa? Thank you. Awesome. So one of the key things, um, you know, that's right about that Africa has 54 uh, countries. Uh, and they're all diverse. Southern Africa, East Africa, Central Africa, West Africa, uh, North Africa, which is you know, Arabic speaking. And a key challenge for most companies and most businesses is you know, actually coming up with that decision as to where they're gonna launch their products and in which jurisdictions they're gonna work. So unfortunately, over the past 10 years, the narrative has focused on about just a handful of about five countries, right? So Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, uh, in some cases, Egypt. And these are really, for the most part, even when it comes to venture capital, they've really monopolized uh, a huge chunk of the pie. Uh, living out massive markets like Congo, massive markets like Ethiopia, you know, places like Angola, Mozambique, which are Portuguese speaking. And the way we are actually solving that problem is number one, we actually leverage existing infrastructure that other people would have already done the hard work for. So to give you a very good example, if you look at the telco companies, companies such as MTN that have a pan-African presence, if you look at some of the financial institutions across Africa that some are headquartered in South Africa, so whether it's your abs as it's your net banks, they have this multi-jurisdiction presence. And if you look at your internet service providers, such as your liquids, they basically have what's called kept to Cairo, which basically means that from South Africa, all the way to Cairo in Egypt, they're present. So as Web3 companies, one of the key things we ought to be doing is piggybacking off this existing infrastructure and actually partnering with a lot of these institutions. One of our main focuses at Flex ID has to be, has to be the institutional relationships that we've been building. And what it allows us to do is we actually have a strategic way in which our company is going to scale that is advised by the institutions that we decide to partner. It is not a race that you ought to be going alone. In Africa, there's a very important saying, which is, if you want to go fast, you go alone, but if you want to go far, you go together. So it's a key philosophy that we take at heart at Flex ID, which has allowed us to partner with multiple organizations in different jurisdictions. So yes, if I want to be in Kenya today, it is very important to have Safaricom and M-Pesa. If I want to go to the Congo, I'm going to have Jumbo be my main partner, etc. with other countries on the continent. So, I think. Yeah. Appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, great, great question. Appreciate the question. Uh, maybe I'll answer this from the perspective of Jumbo, and I can't speak for how anyone else is entering Africa and tapping into all these markets. Um, I think end of the day, it really depends on the founder of the company as well. So I only, I speak French and English, right? I, I don't speak Portuguese. So it's gonna be hard for me to tap into Mozambique and Angola, not gonna lie. So all of Jumbo's content is in English and French. So I think that's a good starting point to make your content and your local ambassadors in both languages and in the WhatsApp groups. Um, so for us right now, where Jumbo today is 105 people on the ground in Africa across 15 countries, and we're really trying to tap into Francophone Africa, but of the 100,000 users, I would say, 80 to 90 percent is still in English-speaking Africa with a focus on Lagos, Accra, Nairobi, um, and some in South Africa. So it's definitely a challenge um, tapping into a lot of different markets and different languages. I mean, if you look at a market, let's say, that is maybe 20 years ahead of Africa, that a lot of tech has happened, innovation of Southeast Asia, the unicorns there, you know, Gojek, Tokopedia, Bukaloko, Grab, they start off in either Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia. They don't expand into each one of those simultaneously. And that is predominantly one language, but different cultures. Africa has different cultures and different languages. So 
Um, I'd say it's, it's definitely a big challenge, but for us, how we're trying to tackle that is mostly using language and localization with a heavy boots on the ground operation. All right, even though I'm the MC, we're out of time. I got to move you guys off. Unfortunately, we could talk about this for a long time. Uh, this is inspiring and please find these folks around for the next day or a day and a half, ask them questions, introduce yourselves. Because as Victor says, it's the, to go the long distance, we have to go together. And I'm glad you kind of closed with that. So please give these guys a round of applause. Um, and thank you very much, you guys. Awesome. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Matt. Great. Uh, thanks, James. I appreciate it. All right. I love that. It's the, I don't know, there's a U.S. politician, his name is Bobby Kennedy, and he would, he would say that some people, that some people look at the world as it is and ask why I dream things that never were and ask why not. It reminds me of that. It's like they look at the world as it is and they say, they dream things that never were and they ask why not. Anyway, um, so next we have, uh, okay. So we're running a little bit late. Um, lunch will be, we have a, a speaker and then we're gonna have a panel and then we're gonna uh, break for lunch. And so I'll give you a little bit more information about that. But now I'm pleased to welcome um, Chavarel Chowdhury, the CEO and founder of Wairu, which is working to decentralize internet infrastructure in Latin America, which is hugely important and an important partner of the Algorand Foundation um, he, like I, believes that uh, connectivity, that access to the world's body of information is a human right, and he's dedicated his life to this. So I'm excited to hear his talk, so please welcome. Yeah, I need this. Next, back. Okay. Hello, everyone. Very nice to be here. Thank you, Algorand, for putting this together. So let's begin. Do you guys know that one out of two people alive today don't have internet access? Think about that for one second. What would your smart smartphone be worth if you had no internet access? Do you declare internet access a human right 10 years ago? But today, almost 4 billion people in the world don't have connectivity. Let's say Senora Gladys here as an example. She lives in a low-income community in Latin America. She has no internet access. Her kids couldn't study during COVID, and they were left in the dark. Just like her, 1.5 billion people in the world live in a condition called internet poverty. This means that they cannot access at least one gigabyte of data a month, at at least 10, megabytes, 10 megabits of speed, paying less than 20 cents a day. In Latin America alone, there are almost 400 million people with no internet access. That is about 80 million homes without connectivity. And this happens because most of the telecom sector is managed by just a few players. These providers do not focus on expanding their coverage to connect more people, but they rather look for new verticals to increase their centralized profits. And this is one of the main reasons why so many people are still disconnected today. Hi, my name is Charve Chedrawi. I am CEO and founder at Weiru, a decentralized and tokenized internet service provider looking to democratize internet access and ownership of internet infrastructures in emerging countries to help close the digital gap once and for all. Weiru is a network built, operated, and owned by the people. We provide internet connectivity to people, to businesses, and to homes using proven technologies like fiber, wireless mesh, unlicensed spectrum, and blockchain. We build networks with the help of the community. 
where everybody can get involved to improve and to increase the network coverage, either by deploying their own hotspots or by investing in the growth of the network through digital assets. We use Algorand to build the ISP of the future, fully transparent and blockchain-based, where every transaction where every transaction going from cash payments to data usage is burnt into the blockchain. We, uh, we create a sharing economy with our token at its core to reward everybody for their participation. So we get node operators rewarded for network expansion, we get pool token holders rewarded for helping us bring connectivity to places where there is no connectivity. Of course, stakers for supporting and backing live nodes and our users for constantly connecting to our network. So earlier this year, we released uh, one of its kind Wi-Fi proprietary device, which is a plug and play device, very easy to use. You just get your device, you connect it to your internet router and you start make, making rewards every time somebody connects to your Wi-Fi. You earn crypto with every connection that you receive. We want everybody in the world to join, so we want to bring the masses in, so we have been working in compatibility with thousands of devices based on OpenWRT so that anybody in the world can get an off-the-shelf device like a Raspberry Pi, like a TP-Link, or like a microtik, flash the firmware, start sharing Wi-Fi, and earn crypto rewards. We also build internet networks from scratch, and where, pe well, where people most need connectivity, right? Going that extra mile to connect the unconnected in Latin America. It works by, it works like this. We build an infrastructure, we tokenize it, and, and into something that we call hotspot pools. Then we allow anybody from anywhere in the planet to invest in these internet infrastructures starting at $50 and, so, and earn rewards for the performance of this network. So basically we are allowing people from one place of the world to help people in other places to get online and get rewarded for it. How cool is that? So just like me, you're going to be amazed at how huge this opportunity is. The Latin American broadband market, which is our main focus, is a $40 billion market. The worldwide market is $400 billion and is expected to grow to $1 trillion in the next decade. So let's suppose that we provide connectivity at an average of $0.10 cents a day per user only by connecting, connecting less than 1% of the people that are not connected in Latin America, this could become a 100 million annual recurring revenue business. Weiru drastically lowers the cost to access connectivity, financial services, and education. Most importantly, education. So, where are we today? We were part of the Adrian Miami Accelerator with ended which ended in February. Thanks to this, we deployed our first pilot in a low-income community connecting thousands of people today in Latin America. We have already deployed over 50 kilometers of fiber in a city called Quito in Ecuador. And we have sold over $100,000 worth of pool tokens already with a list of over 3,000 people waiting to get our fixed internet services. We have partnered with WOCU, which is the World Council of Credit Unions, to get connectivity to people that most need it. And we are in conversations with the United Nations to bring connectivity to the most vulnerable people around the world. Our testnet is fully live, with thousands of early adopters helping us improve our technology with their constant feedback. So I have dedicated the last 10 years of my life to the telecom sector, innovating around it. Uh, I developed the first Wi-Fi marketing platform in Latin America, and my previous startup helped businesses at the bottom of the pyramid to make money by sharing Wi-Fi. 
When I started this, I was a solo founder a year ago. I only had a landing page and an idea. A couple of months later, I found my co-founders, and they helped me put together this amazing team of multidisciplinary people with knowledge in technology, telecommunications, business, marketing, and of course, blockchain. Disrupting the telecom sector is no easy task, but we all believe that it's worth to try. So, we are the only decentralized internet network built on Algorand, focused on connecting the unconnected in Latin America. We democratize ownership of internet infrastructures all the way from the top layers to the final users. We are vendor agnostic, and we solve the capex problem that traditional providers have. So what's coming up next, right? We believe in interoperability, so we are not just working in compatibility with other network devices, but we are also working in compatibility with other blockchains so that we can bring value, so that we can bring value to Weiru, thus value to Algorand. So we will allow people from Ethereum, from Polygon, or chains like Avalanche to participate in Weiru's ecosystem on a piece of of the internet infrastructure and start earning rewards. Everything built on top of Algorand. So, remember Senora Gladys here? Well, back in March, we provided internet connectivity to her and to her family, and thanks to that, her kids can now study. They could study during the pandemic, and she even started her own photocopy business. This photocopy business is receiving dozens of people every day only because she's providing free connectivity to her neighborhood using Weiru. If you like what we are building, please reach out today or tomorrow. Uh, let's have a conversation and help us build more networks, connect more people, and empower more communities with reliable and affordable internet access. Again, my name is Charo Chedrawi. I am CEO and founder at Weiru. Please join us to build the future of the internet today. Thank you. All right. All right, this is the last panel before lunch. Um, and thank you, Chevrolet. That was, was great, uh, as usual. So the last panel is going to be um, how blockchain is enabling a revolution in payments. Uh, and again, I, I, I sound like a broken record, I know, but this is important and interesting. Uh, so to discuss, please welcome Chris Scanlon of People, Sanzar Kakar of Hasab Pay, uh, Khalid Mohamran of WASPay, and to moderate, uh, we have uh, Rachel Wolfson of uh, Cointelegraph. So come on out here, folks. And again, this is the last panel before lunch, so we'll break after this. We'll come back and we'll give you the, the, uh, the rest of the day schedule. Let's sit here. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, can everyone hear me? Hi everyone, thanks again for joining us for the panel right before lunch. We're all uh, glad to have you here with us and thanks again to Al Grant for hosting this great event here in beautiful Dubai. My name is Rachel Wolfson. I'm a senior reporter at Cointelegraph and I'm going to be moderating this panel on payments. Um, before we get started, I'm just gonna have the panelists briefly introduce themselves and their company and then we'll get started with the panel. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Chris Scanlon, Group Head of Investor Relations at People, a non-bank financial services technology company focused on the Middle East and Africa. Hello, my name is Sanzar. I'm the founder of Hesab Pay, which is a digital payments platform. Hi, my name is Khaled Muharram, and I head the Middle East North Africa for What's Pay. Great. So the panel is about payments and how the payment revolution is here now. So let's just talk a little bit about crypto and blockchain payments, but first let's, let's differentiate between the two, and then we'll talk about how um, both of those are advancing payments. So who wants to start off by 
sure. talking about the differences. I think, thank you, Rachel, for starting up with this uh, great question because uh, there is a misunderstanding when you say blockchain, people relate that directly to crypto. Crypto is one use case which can be used in many uh, different industries, but blockchain is far broader than crypto. Blockchain can be used for uh, property ownership, for your car registration, uh, tokenizing, and, and maybe we'll talk later, there's some projects we are doing for tokenizing minerals in Africa. Uh, and when I see the difference between blockchain and database, there is a huge advantage of the technology to be used today. So blockchain, uh, as, as an example, just uh, taking data in general, storage of data. So on database, you can store data for five years, seven years, but then data disappear. Uh, but in blockchain, it's from block zero. So data will always be there. Uh, double spending cannot be done on a blockchain. So that's great because you avoid the fraud and manipulation with the, there is, there is many other advantage, but for me, it's the difference between a fax and a mobile phone today. It's limitless blockchain. Chris, did you want to elaborate on that, the differences between blockchain and crypto for payments? Absolutely. Firstly, people addresses an 800 billion uh, market in the Middle East and Africa, mostly who don't have a bank account or are underserved by their financial institution. And how do we solve this problem? Uh, we offer a mobile wallet with a virtual prepaid card, which enables people to load money onto the wallet using our cash agent network and also kiosk network. So if you're unbanked or underserved, you can go from the cash society into the digital society, and then all of a sudden you have that magic 16-digit card number which allows you to use uh, access e-commerce, which is a huge use case in Middle East and Africa. Uh, if you're in the gig economy, you can uh, advertise your business online, uh, pay for services to develop your business, and also, uh, I guess in terms of blockchain, it's, I guess it's an, it's an important point to recognize that it's, it's used as a, as a technology uh, versus uh, digital assets. Uh, and another huge use case we find is remittances. And I think remit remittances can be uh, a little bit misunderstood how, how large an impact they have. For example, development aid is seen as the most important way for emerging economies to increase their prosperity. However, this is greatly outweighed by remittances. Um, so, for example, in Egypt, uh, development aid in 2020 was 1.5 billion, while remittances inflowing into Egypt were 31.5 billion so US dollars. So that is 20, 20 times. And if you look at the transaction costs of remittances, uh, the average is about 7 or 8%, which runs transaction costs into the billions. So by using the blockchain technology, removing the double spending, and the FX risks, you can charge lower transaction costs while still having a, a healthy margin because at the end of the day, we need to have a sustainable business uh, to prosper as well. Um, but this drives the transaction cost down for, for the users. And I'll give you a specific example. So a Pakistani national who's an expat here in, in Dubai, I was talking to, he earns 2,000 dirhams a month. Uh, his company pays for his, uh, puts him up in accommodation. 600 dirhams he lives on for food, and then the 1,400 dirhams he sends home every month to his family in Pakistan, and not just his mum and dad and his children, but his, uh, sorry, his wife and his children, but his mum and dad as well. So this reduction in transaction costs using the technology really has an impact to the people who really need it in emerging economies. Right. So I guess that leads me into the next topic that I want to discuss now that we know the differences between blockchain as a technology and crypto for payments. Um, let's talk about use cases. So what use cases are we seeing today that are showing, that are demonstrating how blockchain is advancing the payment sector and how cryptocurrency is advancing the payment sector? Sure. So I'll, I'd like to tell you a story. And it's, a, it's one of my favorite stories. It's a true story. It's a story about the London Shoe Company. About 100 years ago, maybe 150 years ago, they sent two salesmen out to Africa. So these two guys, they went separately to Africa, and they were trying to see if there was a market for shoes. And the first one came back, he said, ah, forget about it. You know, no one wears shoes in Africa. There's no market there, just forget about it. We can't sell any shoes in Africa. The second guy came back and he said, ah, you're not gonna believe this. No one wears shoes in Africa. We can sell shoes to everyone. So that's kind of how I see that question about use cases. So when we talk about, okay, who's going to use a blockchain? Who's going to use this? You actually have to talk about the other side of the equation. 
there's one and a half billion people in the world that are unbanked or underbanked, right? 40 million of those live in my country, in Afghanistan, right? So to be able to give them access to make payments, to send remittances around the world, to receive donations easily, cheaply, not to have to wait seven hours in line to get a little you know, food to eat. You can do that instantly wherever they are, anywhere in the world, without having to rely on these archaic systems. So use cases are limitless, and the potential is also limitless uh, to be able to go out there. Right. Do you wanna, does anybody want to elaborate on a use case so the audience can better understand? Um, I, mean, I think that's great, and Chris doing something which impacts people's life is uh, absolutely honorable to, to do. And I think one of the use cases that we try also to ease people's life is, is a project that we just launched for pilgrims who travel every year to Saudi Arabia for Hajj, maybe once, but for Umrah on a regular basis. So this uh, multi-billion dollar industry, uh, and it's done today by cash. So people carry cash with them while traveling. There is an FX, there is a lot of uh, charges operationally to manage this cash uh, uh, distribution. Uh, and again, this is not very easy to use because as a pilgrim, you could be out of cash at any point of time. So you struggle to get the money in. So tokenizing this money and creating an acceptance solution on uh, a one million post terminal uh, process uh, point of sale in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we even catered for people who does not have roaming on the internet, so it's a QR based. So even if they're offline, still the payment will be accepted. And then it makes it so easy for them if they're out of cash, they can ask any member of their family back home to upload and put more points or, or tokens uh, into their wallet. Uh, so I think, uh, and again, this thanks to the technology that enable all of this type of innovative uh, product to ease life of, uh, of people. Same like when we talked about remittance. But I think, uh, let me go back to the crypto uh, side of it. Mm -hmm. So crypto today is a locked money. Many people in, uh, in the world buy crypto, but it's not in use. You buy it, you wait for it, grows, etc. So acceptance of crypto itself is another uh, industry that, could enable people to use it, actually. And this money, when you think about it from a regulator perspective, this money is outside of the economy. So by enable the acceptance side, it comes back to the economy. It comes into circulation, uh, back to it. And uh, maybe we'll talk later about stablecoin and the importance of stablecoin when it comes to remittance or even on acceptance because you avoid the volatility of the, the mm. crypto because instantly you convert whatever currency it is, uh, cryptocurrency, to stable token, so you fix the rate. And then the merchant at the end of the day receives fiat into uh, a normal FX. Yeah, I think we should talk about stable coins actually. Let's elaborate on that because uh, Sanzar, I know you had some interesting perspectives on stable coins versus crypto. Do you want to share that? Sure, there's so many countries in the world that when you just mention crypto to them, especially after the, the recent events, that they just have a heart attack. <laughs> They're like, Crypto, you know, crypt, you know, speculative currencies, they don't understand it and they fear what they don't understand. But like Khaled was saying, there's a difference between you know, blockchain and speculative cryptocurrencies. And particularly on a blockchain, you can do you know, stable currencies, stable coins, and within stable coins, then there's you know, algorithmic and fully reserved. But the, 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 the user doesn't need to understand that. The, what, what the governments need to understand is how you could have digital payments through SWIFT, where you used to work, uh, around to transfer money around the world, or you could have crypto rails, which is so much faster, cheaper, more secure, more reliable. And so they're not losing any control or power or, you know, to have, to fe have to fear that and have to fear people losing their savings by, you know, volatile cri uh, cryptocurrencies going around, but rather those c same fiat currencies could be stabilized and made more secure um, through that. So in many countries around the world, uh, actually, it's not you know, due to SWIFT, but the, the, the countries are being de-risked, right? So banks are saying, ah, it's not worth our time, uh, it's not worth our risk uh, you know, to, to deal with those countries. And so many of those governments are starting to say, well, maybe we can look at stable coins. Um, that's not speculative, so we don't have as much risk there, but we have all the benefits of having the blockchain. Um, so countries like Iraq, um, Lebanon, Syria, Somalia, and of course where we are in Afghanistan, are looking at ways to be able to get funds into the country, out of the country, um, securely, in a compliant way, reliable, transparent, um, uh, without having to worry about um, you know, all the different uh, drawbacks of using the traditional systems. So stable coins, we're seeing 
a huge demand and use case in emerging economies, especially in Africa. If you look at the Nigerian Naira, you look at the Egyptian Pound, it's a constant step down uh, due to high inflation and a devaluation of the currencies. Uh, so we're seeing huge demand for people wanting a, a proxy for the dollar, so USDT, and often it's, it's the young, technically savvy people who are actually showing their parents, hey, you should be moving your money out of the local currency. There are currency controls in, in many of these countries, and they find a way to get it onto, onto the blockchain, onto uh, a crypto wallet, but again, it's not a digital asset, it's really a proxy for the dollar, uh, which is much, much better for them. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a huge, huge demand for, for, for economies like that. Khaled, do you want to add anything there? Sure. Uh, I mean, I cannot also ignore the fact of what happened in the market with stable coins like Luna, which are based on algorithm. So just to be frank over here and very transparent, a stable coin back to a dollar or back even to gold or whatever it is, is very important to the industry to, to build up the rails and avoid the sudden shocks which, which happen in the market. Uh, and I think this will also bring me that we need in this industry more regulation. And I think we have seen what's happening in the market uh, from ups and downs and some uh, interesting stories happening. But regulation does not come to stop the business. Actually, I see it uh, that when the regulation comes into uh, the industry, it ease up the process, it protects the consumer, which is a very important thing, uh, because you need supervision when, when payment is, is touched, when money is touched. Uh, you need somebody to supervise that, to regulate it, to put terms and conditions, to protect both the consumer, which is the main interest, and also to protect the industry from this type of shocks and uh, uh, instability. Mm -hmm. So I think stablecoin is great. It has many uses. Also for remittance, mm -hmm. it's, it's very important because you want to fix the rate. Uh, on acceptance, it's a pillar because once the purchase is done, you have to convert it immediately because of the volatility of the other uh, currencies. Uh, like you can see the Bitcoin is like uh, uh, a chart which, which goes up and down. So it's definitely a very valuable to the industry, but it needs to be regulated and it needs to be supervised. Right. Absolutely. Sanzar, can you share your thoughts on, because you're, you, you have a stable coin, right? So, and because you're implementing that in certain regions, what has the reaction been from those regions, from the government, for instance, when you tell them about the stable coin? Sure. So um, the government um, in, in many jurisdictions, particularly where we are in Afghanistan, um, you know, try to lump a lot of the things together. So FX of even fiat currencies are, are considered, you know, not to be Sharia compliant. Um, with cryptocurrencies, they're worried about, you know, consumers losing, you know, not being protected and losing their, their life savings by trying to, you know, ride certain waves up and down. Um, but then when we go back to Khaled's first point about the difference between blockchain and uh, speculative cryptocurrencies and investing in those and explaining how it's a, um, a secure database. So instead of using a traditional, you know, core banking system on SQL, we're using, um, you know, the Algorand uh, blockchain, which settles, which is more secure, which is more transparent, which is faster. In so many different ways, uh, we can bring those uh, benefits in. And once we, we frame it that way and, and we explain the technology around it, then um, a lot more understanding comes into place. And then they can see the benefits benefits for a country, for people, where they can um, very um, easily transact. Um, even without um, having or understanding all the complexities behind it. So most people in the world, you know, the 8 billion people in the world, they're not going to understand the difference between algorithmic stablecoin or a fully reserved stablecoin. Maybe the people in this room do. Um, but the common uh, you know, user in the world that we're targeting in our niche is, is not someone that necessarily understands that, that might not be financially literate, might not be literate at all, might not have a smartphone, might not have internet access. You know, we, talk, we heard earlier about internet access, you know, lacking around the world. Might not even have, you know, access to reliable telephone, uh, you know, connection. But we can still use the power of the blockchain for that. We issue a small QR code card. Um, so recently, we provided uh, QR code cards to 7,500 widows in Afghanistan, where they didn't need to have, you know, a smartphone or understand how blockchain works. They just went to the shop 
every month with their QR code card, showed the shopkeeper who took, you know, scanned it and was able to deduct from their Algorand wallet um, the funds that they'd received donation that month. And similarly, um, you could, you know, scale so quickly in so many parts of the world um, to be able to, to handle that and use the benefits of blockchain without, um, you know, getting into that fear and that confusion about, um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, uh, about, you know, that's around the word crypto itself. That itself the word itself is very, um, uh, you know, strange to a lot of people because they don't understand it. So when you explain, hey, it's just a card, you could have a, you know, another payment card or you can have this payment card and it's kept in a secure database, that really um, uh, solves a lot of problems and helps um, uh, not only governments but the general public um, uh, uh, allay their fears. Right. Um, now we're also, you guys mentioned remittances. Can we talk a little bit about why blockchain is an efficient system for remittances versus like traditional uh, systems that we're seeing today? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess the blockchain network that we use is a replacement of the SWIFT network, which is really archaic uh, from experience. But what the blockchain essentially allows us to do is to uh, get our partners and ourselves onto the blockchain, onto the same system, and then settle the transaction instantly, remove counterparty risk, and also FX risk that we pipe in uh, Thomson Reuters API, and that al allows us, as I said before, to really reduce the transaction costs, and also to, to allow to settle the payment instantly, which reduces a lot of the anxiety for users. You know, is my money gonna end up I I with the recipient? Is it gonna be the same amount that I sent uh, at the point of transaction versus the person at the receiving end? So I think blockchain is a very much more efficient, uh, transparent, and, and speedy way of, of cross-border remittances. Right. Um, I forget if it was Hollett or Chris, but somebody was also mentioning that blockchain for remittances is safer in terms of like for women, for instance, when mm. they go to get money, but blockchain actually enables safety. Does somebody want to mention that use case? Because I think that's uh, interesting. Sure. sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, ah, it's, okay. it's it definitely us. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it is, um, you know, uh, safer in, in, in many different ways um, because you can also protect identity. Um, a lot of the traditional ways, if, if in countries where SWIFT doesn't work at all, mm. um, then they, give, they print out the lists of names of people, how much they're going to receive, and they have to give those papers to one another. And so you have Hawala dealers and you have many other people in the chain, you know, dealing with personal identifiable information. And so um, that has a lot of risks. There's, there can be interference, there's fraud, waste and abuse, you know, to many different ways. But if you could um, do that all on the blockchain, um, you could prove the transaction, you know, took place and you could, you know, cash out without having any personal information available. So um, even the processor doesn't need to know, uh, you know, personal information about a, a certain family, their condition, their, you know. Uh, so especially in war zones even, or in um, areas where, you know, uh, you know there's different faction parties or, uh, you know, political rivals. Uh, sometimes, you know, funds and grants can be, you know, held up in different ways. But being able to use the blockchain, um, you're able to protect uh, the consumer, you're able to, you know, protect the environment, um, and when you're providing that aid, they're doing it in an anonymous and, uh, and way, with dignity, uh, instead of having to go and kind of beg and say, okay, I'm waiting in line now, give me this, you're at home and you get funds to your phone and you can go directly to the shop, as opposed to, you know, imagine uh, a mother of five waiting in line for seven hours every month just to get a bit of money to be able to feed her kids, as opposed to immediately going to the shop and receiving it on the blockchain. So it, it, safety is, is really, really, paramount and, and, and then it, it saves money for even the centers because it's not just them waiting in seven lines, it's all the administrators and security to provide to protect a big crowd of people you know, trying to collect um, uh, money or food or interference from outside parties that want you know, to add their own beneficiaries to a certain list. So in, in so many different ways, um, it, it protects the entire uh, chain, the people, the government, the end user, the consumer, and the donors to make sure that what they want to give ends up to people that need it the most. Right. Um, so we've talked about a variety of use cases now. Let's talk about the challenges that may hamper adoption because while these use cases are really innovative, um, I think that mainstream adoption, education, regulations, compliance, all of these are challenges. So I want you guys to discuss those challenges and how we may overcome those. Sure. Uh, I think one of the main challenges is uh, interoperability because uh, blockchain by nature work in silos. 
So you need to build up the bridges between the different players within that ecosystem to have uh, a solution which is fast to the market and capture for many things. Like as an example, when we work with Algorand uh, on the project in Saudi Arabia, that because it's a Sharia compliant, so it address uh, a major thing. Uh, again, the other point, which is the TPS, the transaction per second. And I remember in the opening, uh, you have seen that the TPS have went from 1K to 6K. So that's scalability of the product uh, or the ecosystem. And there is one which is a bit underestimated uh, in, in the industry so far, uh, which I think we put it as a priority when we built up the ecosystem, is the compliance solution because you need to filter. You cannot just ignore that. You need to filter the sanction screening list. You need to avoid anti-money laundry. You need to look at the fraud detection. So if you don't have a robust compliance mm. Uh, system in place connected to that and also the the main challenge is to connect the old world to the new world so again that's all bridges uh, but if you don't have all of this you you will hit into a crash trust me and and you see this happening in the market today mm -hmm. so you have to build all of that very carefully it take long time but the objective at the end of the day is to give to the customers uh, consumers uh, p2v whatever it is an ecosystem which is fast to the market secure, addressing the compliance and risk management uh, issues. So I think that's uh, one of the main uh, challenge within the industry. Right, what about mainstream adoption? Sanzar and Chris, you can probably both talk about that, but is it, has it been challenging pushing these solutions out to regions where people may not know about crypto or blockchain? How are you getting them to use these solutions if they know nothing about what they're using? Or maybe they do know, I don't know. I think that's a challenge. I think the world's demographics are, are, are kind of reversing. So a lot of people were thinking, you know, people in the West or in Europe or, you know, for example, in Japan, that's where, you know, the cutting out of, edge of technology is. Um, but if you just look at the demographics of the world right now, those populations are aging very, very quickly. They're not having a lot of kids. And Africa, Middle East, India, the, the youth are, are rapidly, uh, you know, exceeding the elderly. In Afghanistan, in my country, 77% of the population is under the age of 25. 77%. So how many 25-year-olds do you know that don't know how to use a smartphone or don't know, you know, they, they grab it. My two-year-old daughter is, is, is hacking my phone now. I mean, the, the, the rate of adoption for, for the use is massive, and that's going to be where the, where the potential is. So in Africa, Chris and I were talking about earlier, the... That's the, the, as soon as you kind of just hint it to them and they can then figure it out and they can run with it um, so much. So the, the future is really in the emerging markets, in the developing economies, and we haven't seen any problems. Even with people that are literate, they can figure out, okay, if I need to feed my kid and I need to you know, do this and this and I'll go to that store, they'll, they'll figure that out. Uh, but getting that word out, um, uh, making sure that you know, the, the governments, I think that's where more interoperability, making sure that we can work with everyone else, there are so many different systems, even in this room or with Algorand, I'm learning about all these incredible products. Um, if we could all work together to integrate our own systems, that would be huge uh, to be able to offer so much more functionality, revenue lines, so much more um, you know, benefit to the people that use it. Right. Yeah, and I think it's important to know that in developed economies, the fintechs that have emerged as, as the winners in their regions are really providing a service for people who are already banked, and it's a supplementary service, whereas in the Middle East and Africa, it's really not uh, a want, it's a need. These people really need these things to, to, to prosper, to need innovative technologies. So I think it's important to note that. And in terms of challenges, uh, COVID has really driven uh, change in people's behaviours. We've all had to change, we've all established new habits of working remotely and, and other things, but despite that, there are still uh, people who go to the local exchange house, it's a social event, they go and queue up, they send their money home at the local exchange house and they pay exorbitant rates and it's comfortable, it's a habit and it's really up to us to educate them about these technologies so they're comfortable with them, uh, you know, have community and salespeople going down there and really educating them on, on what the technology can do for them, how it's going to reduce their transaction costs and I think that's uh, to change consumer behaviour and also to, I guess, create new habits and a new lifestyle for them that's gonna enable them to prosper as well. Yeah. One more thing I just to mention about that. Um, 
I, I, I have some work in the U.S., and when I go there, many times they're like, oh, send me a check. So they want me to write out a check and put it in the post mail and mail it to them, and reconciliation, you know, a couple weeks later, uh, which is just maddening because that's how, and, you know, many f houses are still connected with, you know, traditional phone lines. Um, but then you go to other places in Africa or in Afghanistan, where I'm from, where they've just leapfrogged straight to, you know, 4G and 5G technology. Like, it's, it's such a, a, a big leapfrog. And so similarly, I, I think most of the innovation, the cutting edge is going to come in, in, the, in the areas that were the, the least, you know, uh, served earlier. So, you mm -hmm. know, parts of Africa jumped straight to mobile money. Yes. Um, and, and similarly, I think a lot of the innovation in Algorand and the future of, of blockchain is going to happen in those communities because they're going to leapfrog over the traditional systems because they're going to go straight to the new ones. They're not going to be, they're, they're not going to have the old institutions of checks and, yes. you know, dial up internet to be able to get over that, but they're going to go straight to what works, the fastest, cheapest, best alternative. And Africa is the fastest, you know, growing region in the world in terms of population. So. Yeah. The innovation will drive adoption of, of digital ways of, exactly. of paying for things, and that will drive uh, prosperity and economic development, and also attract more investment. So I think I really agree that emerging markets is, is the best place to deploy, deploy capital. You know, we're in the right place at the right time in the right sector, and I think it's only just getting started. Yeah. Exactly. Maybe if I just add to, to this, and I totally agree that also the region over here have took some important steps from a regulation perspective. So today you have regulators like uh, Abu Dhabi Global Market, uh, VARA in, in Dubai, which is the Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority, Central Bank of Bahrain have already issued some regulation around it. And I think that's very important because today everybody who play within this industry come and have a presence over here because the regulator is doing something with it. So avoiding regulator, for, for me that's a, just a simple summary, avoiding regulation is a mistake and for both for the consumer and for the technology provider. Having a regulator who's innovative and thinking, brainstorming, there's many sessions happening in Dubai for the past uh, six months, one year with the regulator to understand what we want to achieve, what they want to achieve, etc. But having the regulator playing his role within this industry is very important. And I think this region is blessed by having three regulators so far uh, issuing uh, uh, regulation, guidance, etc., etc. Yeah, I agree, which is why I think it's the perfect place, Dubai, to host an event like this, because a lot of innovation is happening here. Um, and it's important because I think that we're going to see regions like Dubai and the Middle East drive innovation in other regions like the U.S. I think that we're going to start seeing those use cases for payments with blockchain and cryptocurrency and stablecoins happen here um, and actually be used versus happening in the U.S., where, I'm, where I live. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and maybe just collaboration, because we talked about it, and, and thanks to Algorand to bring all of us over here. But this panel is a real example. So from yesterday, we are discussing three of us, mm -hmm. and we see that we complement each other. Mm -hmm. And we actually built up some use cases that we are discussing. We just met yesterday. And, and like, <laughs> it's amazing to find uh, great uh, brains and uh, great solutions and link that together and collaborate on a, a network which is scalable uh, like Algorand. Right. Khalid, you, you bring up a really good point. Collaboration is key within this industry. And I, I would love to hear more about how you guys think it's beneficial to collaborate with the solutions that you're bringing to market. So maybe just explain that a little Super. bit more. So I think one of the examples in, uh, when, when we start talking the project of pilgrims in Saudi Arabia, the acceptance uh, in general, it have attracted Sanzar also and, and uh, Chris. Uh, and Pakistan, Afghanistan, APAC in general is the sending country. So this is where the pilgrims come from, the high number. So you have the largest number comes from Indonesia, followed by Malaysia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the QR, the, the whole solution that we built is built up on a QR code with a mobile wallet. But the QR card also is brilliant mm. because uh, many does not have a mobile phone, like uh, Sandra have mentioned. So they have already the reach from the, what I would call the issuance country or the sending country. And they have a solution already in place, which is the card that we can integrate easily with the post terminal over there. Uh, with Chris, we were talking again about 
because they are helping people with the remittance, uh, the buy and off ramp of uh, digital assets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because we ha have built up an ecosystem which is interoperable, so we are connected to many. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get a preferred rate. The consumer, at the end of the day, will get a preferred rate. I don't want to talk much in details about it because <laughs> it's an initial discussion we had uh, together. But I see the collaboration and yes. I see the add value between the three. Uh, companies. Absolutely. I think QR codes are also impressive in reducing transaction costs for merchants since if you accept payments through a card then there's all sorts of transaction costs uh, with, with MasterCard and, and Visa. So for these developing economies to reduce those transaction costs using QR codes is really powerful. And in terms of collaboration, uh, you know, on our, we, we've got a very interesting view obviously on stable coins and digital assets down the road. So we'd love to collaborate on that. And in terms of Af Afghanistan, um, you know, really focusing on that, that pipeline between uh, the Afghans internationally who want to send money home to help their families out. Exactly. Then Sanzara and I are talking about that as well. And I think the Algorand and Decipher conference is a great way for people to collaborate. I was just talking to someone last night who works with farmers in Nigeria and gets them on the social media platform to enable them to sell their produce using social media uh, on a, on a, using e-commerce and accept payments for that. And we're talking together as well about how we can use his acquisition channel, our payment uh, network and infrastructure, and also Algorand using the technology platform to make it um, to make it efficient. So I think that's a great way that we example of how we can collaborate as well. I, I mean, I think almost every different app on Algorand, every different use case has a network effect. So the more users you have, then that attracts more users, especially in the, in the payments uh, arena. You know, it's both merchants and users. The more merchants you have, that allows more users. The more users you have, then the more urgents. So it has this kind of network effect that keeps growing and growing and growing. And collaboration is the best way to, be, to achieve that. Instead of reinventing the wheel in every country, in every jurisdiction, in every government, in every use case, there are so many different amazing use cases here that we can integrate with each other and and, and enable them uh, you know, to be able to use each other and help grow each other. And so don't ever be afraid of competition. Oh, someone else is doing that exact same thing or mm -hmm. doing that there or, or whatnot. Uh, actually, the more you can find people, the more you can you know, discuss and collaborate with them, that's going to grow the entire uh, ecosystem. It's going to be much easier for me to have you know, someone that uses people already to use Hasab Pay as opposed to someone off the street that's never heard of you know, digital payments. Um, so likewise, the more you can do that. And things that you might have you know, no idea of how they might work together, they do actually do work. We were talking about climate change yesterday, where, the, where this company that I met here at Algorand creates these devices that connect to solar panels. And they then count and certify carbon credits from those solar panels. So in Afghanistan, we have over 100 containers a day of solar panels coming in. So massive amount of you know, renewable energy. And they could monetize that. But then I'm like, well, how do you pay them once they've, you know, proven that they own those carbon credits. Well, you could connect with us at Saab Pay and you could instantly give them you know, payment every day for, for doing that. So in so many different ways, if we can, uh, even within the Algorand community, uh, collaborate, it, it, will, it will have tremendous network effects to exponentially grow. Right, yeah, collaboration is key, that's for sure. Um, I just wanna end our panel by asking you guys what you think the future of blockchain and crypto payments are and do you think that will how do you think it will impact traditional payment systems are those just going to disappear in the coming years or, or you know what are your thoughts on that sure uh, I, I, this this remind me like maybe some 25 years back uh, you said the story i also like to say the same story over here and I don't know how many years were born 25 years ago, so, but people who did not see a mobile phone, if at the time when the mobile phone as a technology did not exist and I tell somebody I will have a device and not connect it to a wire and make a call, and not only this, but even if I'm traveling, I'll make a call, he'll say, you must be good. Because it was unbelievable that this technology will take over. Today, I think you can leave home without your wallet, without your passport, without your ID, but you cannot leave home without your mobile phone. And I see the same is happening today, and it's not um, uh, the future. I, I see this happening today itself. The, the move from the database technology to a blockchain technology, this is happening. There is thousands of DeFi projects that already live today. It's not 
coming in a in, in few years, but it's actually happening today. Uh, you have the same on, on blockchain. So many of this is happening. And I see this will be tomorrow norm. So tomorrow, I see that blockchain will be the norm as the mobile is today. It will be a necessity, not a luxurious uh, technology that we will talk about. Everything will be built up on, on a blockchain. Yeah, I, I particularly see in, in point-of-sale devices in the payments network. So traditionally, you have you know, those big point-of-sale devices where you swipe your card or put in your chip, right? Um, and, and the future is going to be every smartphone is going to be a point-of-sale device. So every merchant, you don't need to have, you know, pay a $500 separate device to put on and, and process payments. But every single person that has a cell phone, that's a pause device where you can tap to pay or you can um, you know, tap from a phone to phone, tap to pay, not, not necessarily even having a card. Um, so that's that. There's, I still think there are going to be cards and still going to be, you know, pause devices and everything else in the future. But it'll be just like you mentioned with the phones. There, there are fax machines in the world, but they're just very, very few. There are, you know, wired phones in the world, but just much fewer. So similarly, payments is all going to be um, on the blockchain. All going to be, um, you know, from from phone pause devices uh, in the future. Great. Agree, there's going to be an increased adoption of innovative technologies such as blockchain. I think during the process, there is still going, and there still is, going to be multiple layers that cause uh, transaction costs for companies to be quite high, and therefore that has to be passed on to the consumer. Um, blockchain is helping that right now, but there are still uh, multiple layers that are being built up. And I think as we go forward through the years, there is going to be some sort of com uh, consolidation. There's also going to be increased M&A activity, which is only going to help, I think, yeah. just to streamline the industry as we, as we emerge. Right. Great. Well, we've got two minutes left. So if anybody has a question, I think we have time for, for one question. So feel free to ask. I see a hand in the back. So we'll probably have time just for this question. Then you guys can ask us other questions after the panel. Hello. Can you hear me? Maybe you can shout, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's another mic. Right okay. Here. Hello, yeah, you can hear me? Perfect. Yes. Uh, so this has been super interesting, so thank you for doing this. Uh, I'm asking this question as a person who was in Iraq, who escaped the war and went to the UK, so I'm seeing both of these kind of conditions. So the first question which uh, I'm gonna go for is regarding the anonymous uh, way where you take acceptance for um, in Afghanistan, which is for us when we were doing the rationing, uh, ration How would you uh, encourage people to come to using your products? So for example, right now, online banking has been here for a long time, but you can s still see the older generation, specifically my parents from Iraq, who I barely convinced to use the iPhone a couple of years ago, <laughs> where they were stuck with their you know, uh, solid Nokia device uh, for a long time. And uh, yeah, so how would you solve these challenges? Would how would that, would that be within your responsibility as a yes. product owner to do that? Um, same thing, for example, in Barclays when they do their advertising saying, hey, come to our uh, offices and we will uh, teach you all the generation how to do online banking and that kind of stuff. So I'm interested in how you're going to fix these very tricky issues. Thank you. Very good questions. And, and you hit you know, the, the issue, you know, the nail right on the head. Um, so that, that's a fantastic question. The, 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 in Afghanistan, we have something called the biometric ID, where they have already issued eight and a half million of them, um, and they're issuing about ten thousand a day more of them. So these IDs are have you know ten fingerprints, you know iris scan, you know facial recognition, and so we can issue accounts or create Algorand wallets, one wallet for each biometric ID. 
That's how we can make sure that, that person is identified there. To make a payment, in, some, if in case someone steals your QR code card and goes about it, uh, right now we're, we're requiring all transactions be validated with an OTP. So um, almost all of our users have at least one in one of those Nokia uh, you know, feature phones per family. And so um, we, can, we, can, we link their phone number to their account as well. And whenever they're making a transaction, uh, let's say you want to buy 100 Afghani of flour from a certain store, they get a one-time passcode to that phone on that registered account with that biometric ID. And they have to give that four-digit code to the merchant to complete the transaction. That way, we authenticate them. Um, and we make sure that it's them that's there. Their account is linked to a biometric ID, so people can't double dip and create multiple accounts or, or fraud uh, to be able to do so. So it's a very, very important question, um, but we are lucky that we have those IDs in Afghanistan. Um, there are also ways to do that you know, uh, on the blockchain to kind of verify people's IDs. There's the Global ID, another platform that, that, that we, we spoke to in other countries that, that are looking to, to verify people's identity in that form. Um, or another. Um, we're lucky that we have 27 million regular phones and only about nine and a half million smartphones, but the, the future is all going towards smartphones as well. So it's double digit increases every year, which is massive. And that's where the future, even in Africa, is going to be yes. on, on smartphones as well. Yeah. So the way we get the word out is through digital marketing, di digital acquisition, but how do we get to the older generation who aren't as tech savvy? And I think that's through, like I mentioned before, the younger generation. So in Egypt, particularly, the younger generation are telling their parents, you have to do this because it, 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 it can't just be left to you know, keeping your money in the local currency. They have to tell them. And how do we enhance that? So creating family and, and community uh, features on, the, on our platform, on our mobile app. So you can have multiple cards. You can have multiple ways of paying and, and loading uh, channels of money on the platform, so then the younger generation uh, can run it and then the older generation can, can also access those facilities or, or even child children and uh, you know, parents and their children can access it as well. So that's one way that we address that and we see that being addressed in somewhere like Egypt. Cool. Well, we are out of time. If you guys have other questions, please find us. Um, thank you again for joining us. Thanks again to Algorand. It's been such a pleasure and yeah, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thank you.
Everybody's back. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back for the afternoon. We've got uh, um, more extraordinary people. Uh, I hope you enjoyed lunch and you're refueled. I know it's that time of the day where you get a little bit sleepy, but uh, that's why we have our next speaker and our next announcement coming up, uh, which I think is going to be exciting. And here to give you, you know, what we think is a very special announcement um, is going to come from my colleague, who is the head of ecosystem funding at the Algorand Foundation. And as I said earlier, the great Daniel, Daniel Uhn, this is the great Ryan Terabellini. So welcome him, please. Yeah. All right, man. You got your safety device here. Dubai, how are we doing? Hey, come on, the lunch crowd. Get, need a louder, need a louder. Thank you, thank you. So good to see all of you. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been on the ground in Dubai for 10 plus days. Had a nice turkey dinner here as an American. It was exceptional to find great food here in Dubai, especially for an esteemed holiday. But... I am here to tell you about what we've been working on all year and not tell you about what I like to eat. Sorry, that's just a stupid joke. Let's go talk about filling in the blanks, okay? So this was on the agenda. Everybody's like, introducing Algorand what? Well, some of you are very clever, did some sleuthing, put two and two together. I know Ryan, I know what type of things he's been doing at the foundation. So it must be Algorand Ventures. And I'm here to tell you about how we've been investing and will continue to be investing in the ecosystem builders. So let's take a step back before we go into the future. What is this winding road of innovation that we've been on at Algorand? Well, from Silvio Macaulay founding the protocol to the foundation being formed, grants, multiple funds, all sorts of amazing projects, we have taken it to the next level from grants to this year, which was a bit of a hybrid model. So we did some grants, we did some investments. We've been working very closely with other funds in the ecosystem as well. But now we are going full steam ahead into 2023 and beyond with Algorand Ventures. So you might be asking, what is Algorand Ventures? I thought there's all these funds already. Algorand Ventures is for the Algo fam, by the Algo fam, and an evergreen funding vehicle so that everything that we do for the sustainability of the ecosystem comes back and is reinvested in the next wave of innovation. So. We are in Dubai, United Arab Emirates. The date is the 29th of November, and Algorand Ventures begins here. So, how do we think about what we see in the ecosystem, what type of projects, and what type of verticals? Well, as Stacy told you earlier today, we have amazing vertical leads. We have people who are focused and subject matter experts in all aspects of the Web3 ecosystem, but Algorand in particular. So we have DeFi, we have NFTs, we have gaming, access, dev tools and infrastructure. That's just the starting point. That's kind of the table stakes. But we also have stage, right? We need to think about where is a project in its life cycle? When you're a pre-seed company, maybe you're just an idea, you just went to a hackathon, a, a greenhouse hack, you want to build a team, you have some good concept, but you need mentorship, you need access to capital, you need uh, legal support, all sorts of things that is difficult when you're just getting started, uh, we need to build a dedicated program for those pre-seed folks. Now, I have a lot of uh, friends I've worked with in accelerators. Optio, I see you in the front row there. AJ from Optio, they're working on that. I'll have a bit more info about what they're working on in Australia later. But we've also run great accelerator programs in Miami with Rocker, uh, Eterna, the team there is doing something in Europe right now, so we just launched a cohort for 10. So that is the pre-seed stage. Seed stage is, You've kind of come out, you've built the MVP, you have a solid technology foundation. Maybe you're gonna go into a closed beta on testnet, get some user feedback, polish some things, going through a contract audit, but you are getting ready to launch and hopefully scale to thousands of users, millions of TVL, transaction volume, and beyond. So the three core criteria that we're gonna be looking at for Algorand Ventures is what stage is the company, what vertical is the company, and also what kind of ecosystem ROI can that company or project deliver? And when we say ecosystem ROI, it's really what is the benefit to the algo fam? So if I'm launching a new DeFi application, you know, what is that DeFi utility? What are, is it a money market? Is it a derivatives platform? Is it something new and interesting and innovative that the algo fam will want to use? If it's an NFT marketplace, what's novel about it? Does it have some cool new features or bells and whistles? 
So we want to think about that in a sort of systematic way so that when we report to say Algorand Ventures made these seed stage investments or these um, you know, scale stage investments, what was the actual impact on, in the ecosystem in terms of transaction volume, wallets, et cetera, that resulted? So that's the criteria we are looking for. So while we go about that, we understand that at each stage in a company's life cycle, there's also different needs. So for pre-seed companies, we have our accelerator partners, Optio, Eterna, uh, Rocker, and many others. And we are going to always have an accelerator program running at any time of year. So right now we have Europe running, and Australia, APAC, through the Optio and Axel Ventures team, is recruiting right now. Those will provide great access to pre-seed sort of projects with the mentorship, capital, and know-how that they need to have. Along with that, we are also uh, partnering with various funds in the space. So everybody that's been in Algorand for some number of years has certainly heard of Borderless. Uh, so we are an LP in the Borderless Fund. We're co-investing actively with Borderless and Arrington Capital at the seed stage. So many companies that come out of that accelerator program are then kind of proposed uh, for potential seed stage investing based on the level of their technology, their re readiness for launch, and their traction. Lastly, direct investments. So these are kind of the big, flashy brand names that you might know. Uh, we've looked very closely and worked with Tiny Man, AlgoFi, uh, and many others that I will uh, talk about later, but that is the scale funding needed to take it beyond just the Algorand ecosystem. So sometimes people say, oh, all these apps are just like, you're targeting the same users within Algorand, but we actually need to grow the entire Algorand planet so that people from other blockchain ecosystems and even the Web2 world are coming and using some of these brand name experiences on Algorand. So that is the direct piece. So some quick announcements uh, before we bring out our esteemed panelists. Uh, Axel Ventures is currently uh, accepting applications. So if you are an early stage builder, have a great concept and want to join, uh, you don't need to be in APAC or Australia. It's a global accelerator. You just have to be comfortable with some time zone complexity. So AJ and team sitting there in the front, please go talk to them about that. Um, and we have the Europe cohort just announced. So uh, there's actually some info on the Algorand Accelerate site about that. Lastly, uh, a rule is going to come on stage in a moment. But we co-invest with Borderless Capital in a number of deals. Sometimes we are the co-lead alongside them. So they are currently raising Borderless Fund 2. Uh, Fund 1 was started off uh, at the beginning of Algorand 2018-2019. It even predates the existence of the foundation, actually. So they have invested in hundreds of projects in the first three years of Algorand, and will invest in hundreds more, uh, hopefully alongside Algorand Ventures in the coming years. So uh, Algorand Ventures, we grow with you. It is an honor and look forward to working with all of you. Thank you so much. Now, I'm going to bring out our panelists for talking about the uh, bear market, but the crypto bulls in the bear market. So Mike, Arul, and Matt, why don't you come out? There he is. Gotta be. <laughs> yeah, anywhere. Hello. Hello, sir. Long time no see. Matt, pleasure. Where, you go where, do, you, where do you want us? Yeah, just go over there. That's fine. So, which one of you were at the Cypher last year? I, was, I didn't make it. I was stuck in Singapore. I in my, my hometown. Yeah, yeah. your yeah. hometown. I stole a pillow with an uh, NFT on it. I still have it in my car. Yeah. <laughs> NFT pillow. Yeah. So it's a fidgetal, like you have it, a token in your phone and you can sleep on it too. Yeah. Hmm. Well, what do you think, Miami or Dubai? What's your, what's your venue preference? Well, I live in Miami. Okay, so you like to get out, have a little vacation. But, but Dubai is a fantastic city. And it, anything, anytime you get out of the US, you get a you know, group of people who aren't Americans, it makes things more interesting in my opinion. It's quite I think international. it's great to do it here. Totally. I mean, I live in Singapore, but I have to say Dubai feels a lot more of a vibrant international scene than even Singapore. There's a lot going on. I think India next year. India, okay. okay. We're going to have to do a show of hands, like decipher which country, which city. We'll, we'll do a poll later, Twitter poll. Anyway, so gents, thanks for joining us. Um, well, why don't you briefly introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about you know, where your experience in Algorand, the name of your fund, 
kind of what you're focusing on and what you're excited about, and then we'll get into a more broad conversation. So why don't we yeah. start with you, Arul? Yeah, sure. Arul Murugan, uh, founding managing partner with Borders Capital. So me and my partner, David Garcia, started in 2018, and um, we have invested in 160-plus companies. Um, so I think we go full-fledged across the uh, Algorand ecosystem. We, our sweet spot is uh, seed, uh, but we also invest in uh, early-stage growth companies, and we have done five accelerators along with the foundation. So my background is a serial entrepreneur, exited my business in 2015, and become a VC. Uh, I'm Mike Arrington. I run Arrington Capital with my partners. I, uh, I've been in tech my whole career. Went to law school in Silicon Valley in the 90s. I'm probably the oldest person maybe in the room. Um, so I was there for Web 1. I was there for Web 2. I started TechCrunch, covered all of Web 2 venture funds, got into crypto in 2017 and in, in a full-time way. And I'm more excited about this than anything I've ever seen in my life, well beyond Web 1 and Web 2. Uh, we are a hedge fund with a barbell strategy. We do venture fund, we do venture investing and liquid, but we created a special fund with Al for Algorand, a dedicated fund, and the whole point of this fund is to, is to build this ecosystem. So obviously to make money for our investors, but well, to build this ecosystem. We're uh, also focused on seed, like Borderless. We do a lot of deals with Borderless, a lot of deals with Hivemind, but we've written checks from $25,000 to $50 million. Um, as a hedge fund, we have the flexibility to do that. Um, we like to write the first check in a company, and then we like to support them all the way to whatever their final destiny is. We did that with BlockFi, by the way, and their oh. final destiny <laughs> sucked, but it, you know, it <laughs> happens, so, yeah. Great. Matt, uh, Matt Zhang, I'm the founder and managing partner of HiveMind, and uh, glad to be here. And uh, we actually launched our fund around the same time at Decipher last year. Some of you guys may actually remember. From my previous life, I've been on Wall Street, uh, been a structured product trader for 15 years, used to work for Citigroup, um, and uh, decided you know, to jump full-time into crypto. I've been you know, buying and trading Bitcoin as a personal hobby since 2014. Uh, and uh, I actually remembered last year when Mike and I was on the Cypher panel, you know, he's you know, telling me I've only been in crypto for five minutes, and I told him that was the best five minutes in crypto I ever had. Unfortunately, that turned out to be true, actually, this year. It was literally, <laughs> when you started your fund is when the price of Algorand started to fall. <laughs> yeah. Are those two correlated? So, um, but yes, I mean. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> what was, it was a dollar seventy-five the day you started your fund. So Exactly you know. right. And, uh, but look, I mean, uh, it's a very eventful <laughs> year. And uh, glad to be here and sharing everything we learned and seeing in the market. Uh, very, very quickly, you know, our first fund, uh, we raised actually over a billion dollars. Uh, it's a multi-strategy fund, similar to what Mike mentioned earlier. We actually do both venture investing and uh, trading strategies. Um, early this year, some of the investment we made, for example, we uh, led uh, acquisition of Napster, among many other things. We actually have some more exciting announcement later today about another very interesting acquisition and investment we actually are making. Um, we also trade a lot. Uh, that's actually my background and some of my team's background. Uh, Elgrand is one of the most important ecosystems we support so far, and we see a lot of interesting stuff coming out, and more than happy to talk about it more. Awesome. Cool. So, yeah, obviously a wide range of kind of backgrounds and experience on our panel here. Everybody's got lots of years' experience kind of riding market cycles. I mean, tech innovation, it booms, it busts. Crypto is no exception, and crypto even accelerates harder than, you know, your ex average economic expansion or contraction cycle. But I wanted to ask you guys, what do you think makes this kind of crypto winter or bear market we're going into the same or different than any other one? Is it shifting public sentiments towards the space? Is it the macroeconomic conditions, like pulling down risk capital? Like, what do, what do you guys see as the similarities or differences for what we're about to go through in 2023? Yeah. No, I, I think I'm a big fan of market cycles. Um, I think... Uh, we all know that I think the history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So, mm -hmm. so I, just to give an example, I think we started Borderless Capital at the depth of the winter in 2018. So we launched in New York, and at the time, the price of Bitcoin is like about 3,300 or something like that. So uh, I think the way I look at here is that we should feel stronger during the uh, down cycle because we know that 
there is an up cycle. So, but always feels bad. One difference I would say that I think this is the first time crypto is seeing uh, with the macroeconomic climate that we are facing right now, that is real. I think uh, from the launch of Bitcoin in 20, sorry, 2009, we are not seeing uh, the deviation between the macro and where it is. I think, uh, so now we are seeing it. So, so I think overall it's positive from my perspective. And, uh, but we need to be prepared for a little longer um, cycle with what happened with the FTX. The good thing, I think the Algorand ecosystem is a little bit more isolated with the event. So we look a little bit more stronger, which I think uh, is positive. So from my perspective, I look at is that um, it's not that different from the regular market cycle. So, so I think uh, look for the uh, up cycle and uh, we look at here is an opportunity to invest in good projects. And by the way, we just uh, did the initial close of Algo Fund too, um, and we're looking to invest in companies in the Algorand ecosystem. Fantastic. Mike, any thoughts? Many thoughts. Well, look, I've been doing this a while. Um, in the downtime, everybody says the same thing, including me, which is, sucks, it'll get better. Um, we've seen this before, stay strong. There's obvious advice, like don't do leverage in a, in a falling market. Matt can probably talk about that, not because he's done that, but just as a trader, you understand. But this is different. Yep. Uh, we are in a global macro situation that is, is a total shit show. And the respected market researchers have said, that we, have said and are saying that the market conditions are things that they have not seen in their lifetime. And some of these guys are 70 years old. Sovereign debt is at a crucial level. And we are in a sovereign debt crisis in the beginning stages of it. It feels like we're also in possibly the early stages of world war um, with China and Russia. And so I'm extremely nervous about everything. And um, the one bright spot for me is that crypto was, Bitcoin was originally invented to sort of be an opt out clause like gold was. And so if it ever fulfills that goal, it will be the place to be as, as a safe haven. But I'm nervous. I'm like extremely nervous about the global situation right now. And it feels different to me than it felt at any other point in my career, certainly 2008, definitely 2018. And it has nothing to do with crypto. Crypto, luckily, because of three arrows and all the other fuck ups, is completely deleveraged now. I mean, completely deleveraged. And so that means that Bitcoin's holding up pretty well in this market. But I'm extremely worried about the next decade. And like, wow. And so, yeah. Sorry, trying to be cheerful. What do you about the yeah. macro or just crypto? Well, I mean, as we saw this year, that the, the, the you know the, the macro the macro tail wag, wags the crypto dog, and it, it it is the same thing right now. I mean, it, it, ETH is a is a leading indicator on the Nasdaq. That's just you know it is what it is. And so until yeah. it isn't that, we have to assume it is. And so I'm more I I'm, I spend ninety five percent of my day looking at macro indicators, reading research, talking to smart guys like Matt who understand markets. And I am, I am very, very scared right now. There's an energy crisis, there's a sovereign debt crisis, you have a hot war in Ukraine, you've got possibly the beginning of a hot war with China, you've got, you know, things are fucked up right now. Mm -hmm. Can you swear in Dubai? Kind of agree with both of them to some degree. Like I think if you look at the history, right, like I actually started my career in 2007, right? Just like what Mike said earlier, when I joined City, also City trading the all-time high too. So I don't know if it's like a, a pattern or something. But yeah. anyway, bottom line is, you know, I actually oh, you missed you caused this, the 2007. <laughs> <laughs> so my career was started in the bear market, and that one I remember very vividly, and it was a bad one. Um, I think if you zoom out, that every single cycle look similar in the pattern. But if you zoom in, every single cycle was caused for different reasons, went through a different type of pain, and when you get out of the cycle, it was typically for a reason that you don't expect. At the time, you don't expect. And then the market having to recover. And I remember this very, very early from the 2009 moments where everything was, you know, giving up the hope and stuff, like things really starting to stabilize and felt better. So I agree with Mike in the sense that um, we still spend a lot of time on macro. Um, I think this time, if there's any different from a, a specific standpoint is, it's not just a crypto crisis, 
I think it's a macro crisis, and then we happen to be in a part of the cycle that crypto is condensed a lot of these issues and happen in a very, very quick way. The other problem of this is because the crypto narrative in 2008, for example, if a crisis like this happens, there is a backstop, right? There is a Fed that actually will actually making the banking system not completely collapse. For the crypto, I think the community has made a lot of progress, but I don't think we're at a stage where if this ecosystem collapse completely, there's anybody who will be providing that last resort and trying to make things be fine. All that being said, I think um, the space today is, if you excluding all the stable coins, it's $650 billion. This number last year deciphered was four trillion. So the question is, who is the marginal buyer? And who is the marginal seller? And I think four weeks ago, when we're sitting here, there are gonna be a lot of the marginal buyer coming from institutional investors. From what? From institutional investors. I think the FTX probably has changed the course of if they're coming in and when they're coming in. Um, which means that maybe the bear market is here longer than people think. Maybe we actually haven't even seen the worst, even though that's all we're hoping not to. So, which is more reason for us to making sure we're focusing, building, and investing um, the right way and the more disciplined way. Yeah. So I, now that we've sort of laid out the bearish case, obviously all these macro risk factors, um, a high degree of correlation between crypto and equities and stuff, which I think maybe going into the last bull run, people thought, oh, you know, Bitcoin might be an inflation hedge. So, you know, if interest rates remain low, dollars are getting printed, that's good for the currency. But now it just, as it delevers, it's the deleverage also hits the crypto market simultaneously, right? In addition to interest rates, you also have obviously, um, you know, systemic risk and exposure between counterparties and all this other stuff happening. But having said all that, is there any cause for optimism? Is there any light at I the end of the tunnel? Is. Or are we Absolutely. just, uh, or yeah. do we totally misname? We screwed up this panel, right? We totally fucked up the Absolutely the there's causes for optimism. <laughs> We've had a complete destruction of, of, of leverage in the system. And but yet DeFi like was beautiful and performed perfectly and flawlessly. Yeah. Now, because of other reasons, the, the TVL in DeFi is extremely low, um, but the, the foundation is there and it works and it didn't fail. And you don't need the Fed or somebody else to come in and save you like they did in 2008 when um, you don't have, you know, counterparties leveraging themselves off of your, you know, off your money when you didn't know it was happening. You just, so DeFi is clearly the way to go. Absolutely. And there's stuff to be built. There's like 5% of what we need built has been built that we even know about. And then there's stuff we don't know about yet. So I'm super optimistic. Mm. The reason why I'm beating everybody down is because I need you when you come to us and ask us for money to not say, and we want to raise a $10 million seat on, your, on an $80 million pre, and then look at me funny when I start laughing at you. Like, you have to understand that things have changed, and you've got to find a way to raise money in a way that's realistic to investors. But the nice thing is there's lots of people unemployed. You can hire them. You don't have to pay them as much as you did. I mean, everything changes in a down market, and this is when the giant companies get built. And I agree. I yeah. think the optimism coming from what has not changed and what has not changed is the technology advancement yeah. is there. And I think even over through the yeah. course of last year, the adoption of this, the topical situation that people were talking about from the mainstream media and through the communities means this technology is here to stay, right? Actually more focus and attention you're getting from the regulators and communities and investors proven the point that now this is a mainstream topical investment asset class. Mm -hmm. What we can't tell is, are we getting out of the bear market in three months time or three years time? Yeah. So if I- And we truly everything. don't know. We don't know, yeah. right? I don't think yeah. anybody would know, yeah. right? Because this is not just about a crypto crisis, it's about the macro crisis. So I think if you are optimistic coming from that you believe in the long-term adoption of the technology, just like 20 years ago about internet, which Mike knows very, very well, I think that's the single most important thing. Like, you'd rather that is we're here to stay. Mm -hmm. So you just have to really focus on making sure you're building something which is enduring. In the meantime, every single founders out there need to figure out how do they survive the winter? Because the optimism thing may happen in the end, but they need to survive to be able to see it. Which means you probably don't really care in January this year what you burn, right? How many people you hire. Yep. You are beta, you go to market, how quickly you can get to the market. Now I think everything comes back and actually 
become a lot more meaningful. So I think that is something which needs to be changed. Right? Yeah. The fear of God is going to make people find product market fit, innovate on product faster. So it sounds like the arc of human innovation will kind of overcome all the macro conditions at some point. It's yeah. just a matter of time, yeah? You agree? Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, talking about optimism, I think I say, like, be greedy when others are fearful. And as I said, the market cycle continues. So, so I think if you believe in the market cycle, this is the time. And uh, the way I look at here is that I think with FTX, people are not going to believe in centralized. I think uh, we are going to have much more stronger infrastructure being built for the next stage of DeFi and other things. So we are going to remove a lot more intermediaries. I look at the next market cycle is going to be the real mainstream, the real world use cases. So I think in borderless, we are going to be a lot more focused on the real world use cases. I think when we started in 2018, 19, there's not much to do that actually. So now what we're looking at is that the infrastructure is built. We are truly there to have the real world use cases. So, so I look at that as very, very positive. If you look at, I think, um, in 2018-19, we said that, hey, it's better than the previous cycle, but this time I strongly believe that uh, we would see a lot more real-world use cases. I think you saw Sylvia talking about AgroToken and TravelX. I think those are two beautiful examples. And I think we are going to lead with those companies. Uh, we led the round for both of them last time, and we're going to continue to uh, lead the round in the next cycle. So that shows our confidence. And I think uh, that's what I would tell everyone, like, uh, um, don't worry about it, focus on building, and I think uh, focus on real adoption and the real world use cases, actually. So, yeah. And, and at what stage would you like to focus on those? So, like, given all the macro uncertainty at play, what's the tr sort of trade-off on the spectrum between pre-pre-seed, early, early, you know, low valuation versus something that's a bit more risk mitigated because there's a product and it's kind of traction in the market. Yeah, so we look at two kinds of projects. One, if you are natively building in blockchain protocol, there are only two stages. Um, it's kind of a seed and post seed. There's something like a series A, series B, series C. Mm -hmm. You just have only one or two opportunities. So half of our investments goes into those uh, protocols built natively. And the other one is more like infrastructure. So a lot of infrastructure projects are equity. So that one, I think um, we want to invest both in the seed and also in the later stage. So if you look at predominant, I think we are going to be focused on seed stage investment. We believe that is a sweet spot. And so we'll continue to invest uh, in the uh, seed stage. I think our pre-seed investment is going to be through the accelerator. So I think we have been supporting five uh, cohorts of accelerators across the globe. And we are looking to continue that uh, in the coming years as well. Nice. Mike, any, any shift, tactical shifts in no, your no, well, capital deployment based on the market conditions, or you just going full steam ahead? I, like, I, I just like seed. I like seed. I like, I like being the first investor in. We, we do, like, we, we have written a lot of bigger checks in the later rounds, but in every case, I think it's been a company we had already invested in uh, because yeah. we already know them. We spent so much time with them by then that I feel comfortable. Uh, you know, when we see stuff, you know, maybe like where we passed on the first round, we'll look at the next round. But I, I like the journey with the entrepreneur. And I, and I like, you know, I mean, like, you know, Matt last year, like, he's an entrepreneur and he started the journey. And it was, it was great watching him get the shit beat out of him all year. And, like, he comes back and he doesn't look like a puppy anymore, right? But he's, <laughs> he's like, he's been through the war in crypto. He's already through the war. And stuff. But like, you need to be there through those good times and bad times and, and go through that battle. And then you, you just, you're invested. Um, so seed is is my sweet spot. Also, I'm lazy and I don't like reading financial statements. So there's no there's no there are no, yeah, no fundamentals. Yeah, it's just yeah. you're investing in a team and an idea. Lovely. I like that. I, I think that um, it's easier. Uh, okay, let's take a step back. Right. I think given the crypto is so young, there is a tendency of people focus on early stage anyway, right? Because mm. the technology has changed so quickly. So you're really doubting what's the enduring value a growth stage company has really built. Is it stable? Is there actually, if you look at a lot of the collapse of the valuation this year, is all of the growth stage company, late stage companies that actually overnight the valuation just brought to the ground. So I can understand by why in crypto, a lot of investors tend to focus on C stage. Combination of the macro environment means like you really want to just back in on the right founder. There's a pattern. And uh, you know, you're very, very focused about the valuation. So C stage, pre-C stage tends to give you that type of safety net. Other side of that is, as I said, given crypto, it's so early in its infancy as an industry, 
it's a lot easier to find a good early stage company than a later stage company. But coming to our investment style, quite frankly, you know, we, the beauty of crypto is also, we think for the first time ever, you find a way to mark to market the code. You actually, something living on the code and the internet, you put a value to it and you can invest, you can trade, you can do many things around it. Mm. So I want to expand that your question to say, forget about the early stage investment, later stage investment, actually trading it and owning the tokens and staking them is actually another way to invest that mm -hmm. protocols too. So I think the trading and investing in the crypto space really getting very, very blurry. So the way we look at it is like, we're trying to focus in about thematic driven verticals. Like we believe in gaming. Yeah. We continue to believe in it. We believe in music. We think it's a great use case for blockchain. Now, you know, we're actually getting very bullish about DeFi for everything that's happening. And then you're trying to figure out what's the best companies. And you figure out as companies tend to come from all stages. Like Napster is a great example. Again, um, they were actually a public company listed on London Stock Exchange. Mm. Together with Borderless and, 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 and Arrington Capitals, we decided to take it private and recapitalize it, which is a great example to say, I think great companies and great founders coming from all stages, but in crypto, there tend to be a pattern, maybe more of them coming from an early stage, but you know, I, I think that's not always the case. Yeah, so always uh, hunting for those diamonds in the rough, even later stage, but also early stage kind of gives a different perspective to like where the markets are going because you work with those entrepreneurs, hand-to-hand -hand combat, right. see their struggle, and then understand where the market's going a bit from there, so. But I mean, having said all that, you know, you can be super early working with the entrepreneurs. There was a ton of capital deployed and a ton of crypto funds raised in 2021 and 22, right? Like 33 billion in 2021 invested directly into crypto startups. And then just first half of this year has been another $18 billion. So the question is like, where is that money gonna flow into if there's like sort of a risk off mentality amongst a lot of funds and a lot of money managers? Do you see that being thematically allocated? ecosystem allocated, you know, obviously there's been some Gaudi numbers around, you know, Aptos and some other layer ones raising big rounds. Yeah, the way I look at, I think there's still a lot of dry powder, but if you look at, I think late 2021 and early 2022, everyone deployed the capital very fast. Mm. I think that's a mistake I would say overall the VC industry has done. Yeah. Um, so if you look at everybody deployed way too much, I think. Um, At the same time. So yeah. then they're all rushing to People a small entry to yeah, the door. Yeah, they will right? have a three years yeah. investment period, but they would have deployed 80% of the capital wow. in less than a year. So I think that's not good, actually. Because everybody thought like, hey, I want to rush, I want to be in. So which is very bad. I think now everybody's kind of taking a back seat, hmm. evaluating, which is really good. And we all know that the valuation uh, multiple has dramatically come down across the board. It's not just crypto. Yeah. So for me, that's a very healthy situation. I think it's good that um, we have the valuation that's more meaningful. And I think now the entrepreneurs are, are also aligned to that way, actually. Mm. So, so what we look at is that now it's coming back. And we at Borderless, we have like a virtuous cycles. We think that the value accrual will change over a period of time. So if you look at, I think, um, in the early stage, we look at layer one is going to one that accrue value. So that's how we looked at like, we will hold a lot of algos, right? Then after that, it will go into the middle layer, then finally to the app layer. So, so I think what I look at is that the incremental value will be a lot more happening in the middle layer and the app layer than the layer one itself. So, so I think um, everybody thought like it's too late for the layer ones, but we saw realize, that- Do you really think this way? Which one? What are you talking about? <laughs> Like with these thesis, these investment theses, like everybody, like, and I don't mean to be insulting, I'm, I truly don't, because I, I know how great of an investor you are, but I always feel like we invest in whatever we want, and then at the no, end no, of the we, quarter, we like make up a thesis around it and say how we followed it. But no, like, we, I just like investing in- No, like Michael, are, we yeah. put this thesis very clearly. You're like, now is the time to do, we're not doing layer ones, we're doing the, the app layer or whatever. Like, you, yeah. do, you truly do that, right? We, yes, we truly do that. I you think. don't just do whatever you want and then like later on make up a story about what the thesis was that you just followed? No, not really. It, it all depends. I think there are people who have done that. And you I, won't even take the meetings with the layer ones when you're talking, when you're like, I'm in like app. No, I, I think ours is very unique. I think we went all after one layer one. Yeah, right. So I you think did, our yeah. situation is yeah. a little different, right? Yeah. I, I think in our case, I think um, we put it in writing. We very clearly, we said that, you know what? Very early on, we're putting 100 million algos because we yeah. think that we went in very early on when the algo price is like very, very small. And then we said like, okay, we are going to invest into the infrastructure, then we are going to come to the app layer. 
what I look at is that this is not something invented. This has been there for a long period of time. That is a natural stage sure. of progression. You start mm -hmm. with the base protocol, then you build the infrastructure, then app. As more apps are built, then you need more infrastructure. So this is not a new thematic or anything like that. So it's not like, oh, now I figured it out. This has yeah. been there for a while. So and just follow the discipline. There might be some value. Just follow the, the discipline. Token. I think yeah. people don't follow the discipline. All right, let's say this. Let's say somebody leaves Algorand. I'm sure people leave regularly, and they're going to start a new layer one. Mm -hmm. You're not going to, and they're like, they're like awesome. You're not going to look at that because you're now in infrastructure time or app time. No, I, I don't look at. I think what I look at here is that you're going to invest in that company. Which one company? Whatever. Yeah. I'm making one up. But if somebody leaves out. There's star developer. One of them leaves, starts a new company, and it's a new layer one. Mm -hmm. Fuck yeah, you're going to invest in that, right? Yeah, if I believe in the entrepreneur, you invest in them. Okay, so the thesis goes out the window in that case. No, I think there's a here. question about it, right? What is yeah. the general layer? The thesis yeah. is that there's a ground framework, and then always there's a. Uh, you yeah, follow the framework, he, he, and then you invest in the best entrepreneur and the best ideas. I think you look at it ecosystem by ecosystem, right? Every yeah. ecosystem's at a different yeah. stage in their life cycle, yeah, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Algorand's clearly in app, app mode now, right? Yeah. Well, Whereas, one thing, Michael, we have to look at also is that yeah. I think the multi-chain world is coming. I think that's how it is. I think uh, the way I look at it here is also it's not about which app built in which layer one. I think we have been more like tribalism in the past. I think going forward, people are going to look at, hey, the users don't clearly. care what's underneath. You're the clearly right. You're clearly right. Th that's where I think yeah. it, it has to be, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think, look, I mean, one of the silver lining, and like, we feel very, very blessed because, you know, if you zoom out and forget about HiveMind, and you tell, you ask me, what is the best scenario for any fund manager, right? I think coming back to Ryan's early question, you would tell them you want to raise your capital at the end of the bull market, and then right before you're deploying it, everything collapses, which is exactly <laughs> what happened to us. So, as much I think everybody getting hurt about this thing. Uh, to more or less degree, I think the one thing we have is a lot of dry powder, and we want to think very, very clearly which vertical from a top-down approach and which founder from a bottom-up approach we're both excited about so we can meet in the middle. But I think, come back to answer your question, Ryan, we may have raised 30 billion last year or something. For the size of the industry, clearly it's not enough, mm. right? So I think um, people just need to get realistic about the funding round and the winter coming. Yeah. Because it's much easier for us all sitting here and painting a rosy picture for our developers and the companies, but that's not what's really happening. I mean, we're doing the pitch every single day, right. and we can tell you, like, we're really trying to make sure the founders realizing that having a, a year or two-year runway is the right thing to do, really coming back and focus on I, the I product and do all of this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, look, I mean, I, I, I remain very optimistic about the industry, but just not to ignoring a lot of the things that will happen in the next through the six months is going to be challenging, and we have to acknowledge that. Yeah. And any other advice, Mike, or a rule on advice you'd give to founders? It sounds like Matt's opinion is basically, you know, be realistic and yeah. uh, look at the macro and and prepare for a long winter. There's a one advice I have been following since I've been an entrepreneur: cash is the king. In this case, I think when I say cash, it is the currency in which you spend. If you spend in dollars, then you have that is a cash. If you spend in algo, that's a cash. So what I really look at people is that if you can survive in this beer cycle, you are going to be the winner. Uh, so, so keep it a long um, a, a runway. Um, I think uh, with cash, that means don't take any leverage. I think don't try to be greedy. Always we are in the leading edge, so don't need to take even yeah, more risk, actually. Sometimes leverage is good. Which one? When it works out. So you take leverage? You don't in your VC fund? Of course we do, sometimes. Okay. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. So, so you recommend people to take meaningful leverage? Not three arrow style, like, <laughs> tone it down. I, well, well, you know what I was gonna say, and it, it kind of like, I think the people who are gonna win usually don't even ask for advice, to be honest. I mean, I think, I think it's, we're up here talking, yap, 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 but like the, the people who win usually don't even like, they just, they know what they wanna do and they do it, and I'm, I'm looking for those people. That's um, okay. And yeah, you probably shouldn't you know, have everybody, everybody knows how to pitch Mike now, you know, just walk into the meeting, yeah. here's what I'm doing, you in? Um, Naval Ravikant said, uh, all Bitcoin has to do to win is not die. And, and it always struck me like he's very right, and so, you know, every day that Algorand lives, it's winning. And it's a good day. Today is a damn good day. It is, and it's never gone down. Right? Exactly. Zero. Remember that big zero up there? So it's winning. There we go. Yeah. Well, we can end with that. We can end with Al Grand is winning. So thank you, gents. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Wonderful, man. Good stuff. Good man. Thanks, man.
All right. Don't leave, don't leave. Anything that ends with Algorand is winning is like that's, maybe it is time to leave. Um, all right, thank you, Ryan, Matt, Michael, and Arul. Uh, bear markets of Algorand? Bear, <laughs> bear market bulls of Algorand? Maybe. Um, so we've got three or four more sessions, um, and we're going to go right into the next one, uh, which is another panel. Um, and what we're going to talk about now are a few approaches to cross-chain bridges, which connect algorithms to other blockchains and, and vice versa, uh, which simultaneously preserve, obviously, privacy, um, minimizing risk, and above all else, remaining decentralized. So that's what this next panel is going to talk about. Um, and here to discuss those issues, uh, please welcome our panelists and moderator, Applied Blockchain CEO and founder, Adi Ben Ari, Flare Network CEO and co-founder, uh, Hugo Filion, Milko Media primary contributor, Nico Arqueros, and to moderate uh, from the Algorand Foundation, our new head of outreach and integration, Jack Chan. So please welcome all these folks to the stage. Thank you. I don't need them. Hello, everyone. How's everyone feeling today? Those were some tremendous crowd uh, panel earlier, weren't there? Um, it's going to be a big shoe to fit, um, follow. It's hard to follow that panel, but um, we have an amazing topic today, talking about safer bridges to a multi-chain future. So with a lot of events that happened this past 12, 18 months, I think, um, there's going to be a lot of you know, um, interesting topics to cover. Today we have um, Nico Arqueros from a, um, DC Sparks uh, and, and Palma Studios. We also have Adi Benari, who's the founder of Applied Blockchain, and also Hugo Filion, who's the co-founder of Flare Networks. So we only have 40 minutes so, um, to cover an enormous topic today. And, um, I'd like to start with an icebreaker question, which is um, uh, maybe we can talk about a regular bridge that uh, you've recently crossed that may sound interesting. So, Nico? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, so my name is Nico. I'm one of the core contributors to the Mil Comeda protocol. So I'm going to start explaining what is Mil Comeda and how it relates to like this specific bridge. So what we do in basic terms uh, we bring uh, the capabilities to deploy. Uh, no, sorry, what I meant is like a regular road bridge that you have crossed recently. A uh, road, road, like a yeah, like, like a regular road bridge. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I crossed from the uh, from the European side of Istanbul to the uh, Asian side of Istanbul. That's a beautiful bridge. Yeah. <laughs> cool, Adi. Um, yeah, I'm based in London, so I I cross a few different bridges in London. Our bridge is called London Bridge, which doesn't doesn't actually exist anymore. The bridge that people think is London Bridge is Tower Bridge. That's right. But yeah, lo those are the bridges I cross. Cool. Uh, I guess I'll uh, say I, I moved here, which is not so much a physical bridge, but a cultural bridge. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's start by level setting what a bridge is. Uh, a blockchain bridge, as defined by Ethereum, is it, you know, blockchain bridge works just like the bridges we know in the physical world, just as a physical world bridge connects two physical locations, a blockchain bridge connects two blockchain ecosystems. Bridges facilitate communications between blockchains through the transfer of information and assets. So I just want to level set that as a blockchain bridge. Um, huge headliner from at Wu Blockchain on Twitter quoted BlockSec team said, since July of 2021, 11 cross-chain bridge attacks have occurred 
involving more than $2 billion. And according to chain, ana chain analysis, in August of 2022, this was right after a, a hack, attacks on bridges account for 69% of total funds stolen in 2022. So my question to the panel is, why do you think these hacks happen? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, there is this platform called Rekt, R-E-K-T, that shows some of this information about the latest hack. And something that you can see there is that most of these bridges, they didn't have an audit, which is like incredible. You cannot be putting something into production if you don't have an audit. And furthermore, like that's not even enough, doesn't cut it. You want to have multiple audits from multiple firms, and that only covers one part because security is not just having like really smart people checking it, uh, they still can miss something. So that's why, for example, in our case, we also went further and we are doing formal verification of our uh, smart contracts. And even further, like that's like a good start, but you even need to go further because then what are the security properties that you're trying to save? Like is all the code on chain or is there also code off chain? So also you need to do an audit about the code of chain and be careful about how uh, do you store private keys and other things. So it's like uh, very complicated. So uh, like not having an audit is like a crazy way to like go into production and even then you need to worry about always be up to date. And the last thing that I would say is that usually you could say that uh, complexity is the enemy of security. The more things that you add, uh, the more complex it is, so it's the more difficult to audit. So usually you want to like get to product market fit and then don't modify the code anymore. And this is like something that usually startups don't do. They want to add more features, more features, and you need to continue updating your audits every time that you are adding features because you could be introducing bugs that could end up in hacks. So you're saying that um, you know security audits are not quite complete in some of the hacks that happen. Cool. Uh, yeah. yes. uh, I, I think um, the first generation of bridges are like off, off chain, like centralized exchanges. Right? So you've basically got technology which isn't really blockchain, which is being centrally managed, and, um, and there wasn't much diligence. Right? So just like with centralized exchanges, people didn't really ask too many questions. They just needed a quick, easy solution. Uh, and, all, and these bridges popped up and people used them, but they didn't really go into depth on the technical side, on the security. People didn't ask too many questions. And after these hacks started to happen, if you, if you started to look what, what was inside, as we've started to see with some centralized exchanges, uh, it's, not, it's not a pretty sight and it's not a big surprise. So I think it's part of maturing of the industry that we have to mature the bridge infrastructure. Uh, just like the blockchains themselves have been through cycles, I think we're going to get a next generation of bridges which are going to be what we call trustless bridges, uh, which don't have the same type of vulnerabilities that some of these first generation bridges have. Yeah, I, I think if you look at it, you know, perhaps the most egregious one was like Ronin. You know, that, that was a, an attack on the multi-sig itself. Um, I think the structure of at least that generation of bridges leaves a lot to be desired. Like they don't really think about risk. Like one of the things we think about is, uh, at least at, at Flare, is we think about you know, how, how, how do you manage these things? We'll come on to some of those risk questions later, especially when it comes to things like reorganization risk. Um, I guess we're proposing a bridge structure that's a bit different. Like existing bridges essentially allow all of the funds to move in, in essentially one time step. Uh, we think that's probably, at least given the current technical capabilities, probably ill-advised. Uh, we have a totally different structure that essentially, you, you can't get rid of code risk, right? You still have to create code and you have to have best practices there and maybe there's discussions to be had about how you should do it, when you should integrate the auditor in the actual development cycle. Should it really be just a couple of weeks at the end of the development cycle? Probably not. Um, but then there's a question of like, how do, you, how do you structure a bridge to minimize risk? Uh, and how do you abstract out, essentially, the risks inherent in bridging? And that's what we're trying to do. Got it. So more like a centralized exchange and then 
there's a little bit of exposure through like software development, you know, life cycles that may require, you know, closer, very, you know, audits and some sort. So interesting that it becomes like a honeypot, right? So how do you think that, you know, could be some of the ways that we can actually prevent these hacks even further than the ones that we already covered today? Yeah. I think just like the blockchain itself, the, a blockchain like Algorand is secured through cryptography. Right? That's really, in particular, if you look at Algorand, that's really what gives it its strength. And I think that bridges are part of this infrastructure. And so the thing that will make the bridge more secure is the, is crypt, is is end-to-end -end cryptography. Right? It's having those that, that cri those cryptographic guarantees about what's happened on block on one blockchain and having that verified on the other before the other blockchain gives you the tokens, uh, or does whatever it is it's supposed to do. So I think that's, that's for me, that's the only solution, because that's how blockchains work, and, and that's what makes them secure. And if you don't have that end-to-end, -end, you've essentially got a middleman, which is what we've got with these first-generation bridges. And that middleman isn't secured through cryptography, just like centralized exchanges aren't. And so you don't have those security guarantees, and so there's a lot more risk. So when you yeah. say like um, that's a middleman sort of uh, uh, exposure there, yeah. I, I think maybe um, just for the audience, uh, these are sort of a, a set of trusted um, validators, some might call it, yeah. that would uh, keep a set of keys on one end and then on, and, and the other end as well, so on both sides of the bridge, and if those keys are compromised, then the assets that were secured on one side of the bridge or the other would be then tr easily transferred out. It, yeah, th those validators have that, have that power. Now, of course, you can decentralize the validators further, just like you do with the blockchain itself. But I think the less power you give to those validators, to those bridge operators, the better, right? And the more you can have straight through cryptography and validation that they can't interfere with, the more secure the solution. I mean, I generally agree with that. I'd say it's uh, a very hard challenge. Um, the way we think about it is we restrict what can flow across the bridge in a single time step, and we collateralize that. Um, essentially, that means that uh, if there is malfeasance, if, if those entities that are operating the bridge do steal the funds or, or maybe even don't make the transaction, uh, you get your money back and you get it back quickly. Uh, one of the advantages our approach has is if you're waiting for a blockchain to confirm uh, you know, your transaction that you're trying to bridge, uh, and let's say you do want to handle reorganization risk, which is Vitalik's biggest issue with uh, cross-chain bridging, uh, you know, then you need to uh, wait an awfully long time. Uh, in this ecosystem, that's not highly desirable. Most bridging is yield chasing or you know, trying to find essentially some opportunity somewhere. You want to be able to bridge uh, very quickly. Having available collateral where someone else is essentially taking the risk of the bridging means that you can move very fast, but you're paying them essentially the insurance premium to cover your risks. Maybe this is a, this is a good segue to um, what you mentioned earlier, uh, and I think you might be hinting about Flare Networks um, Flare time series Oracle, not that? No. Nope. Okay, so what do you mean by um, the time involvements around So security? if you're using a purely cryptographic method, right, and it's maybe not uh, relevant to say Algorand, which has you know, certain like, very strong security guarantees. If you're using a purely cryptographic method, you have to wait you know, many blocks. If you then want to be absolutely certain that you have you know, very, very low probability of, you know, reorg of a chain, you know, it's, you may need to wait a day or several days. Um, uh, so if you're using a purely cryptographic method and uh, you want to use that safely, then you do have to have a reasonable time lag. Uh, I'm not sure that's, like, acceptable for the majority of consumer use cases over the long term. We, we think that there are ways to essentially take the risk of a chain reorganization um, and basically put that on someone else, they get paid for it. Cool. Nico? 
Um, would there be anything uh, you'd like to add to how do you prevent this further? Uh, so personally, I don't know much about Flare Network and uh, what they're implementing for the oracles. For like uh, bridges, uh, something that's like very important is that you always, uh, I think a lot of people have only focused in the smart contracts, which is important because that has been the source of most of the hacks, but that's not the only thing. Usually you also have need to pass messages from like other blockchains to move assets. And even further, like what is the trust assumptions that you have in one end of the uh, uh, of the blockchain, you are like trusting that the other blockchain is not going to get hacked or something is going to happen. So uh, there's like so many trust assumptions. So I believe that there is not such a thing of trustless bridging because even further, just uh, even if you, for example, to make it more spicy, uh, you're trusting everything related to cryptography, but then you're trusting the implementation of that cryptography. So there is always a trust assumption. So uh, it's you need to aim for perfection, but you're never going to get it. Yeah, it. I mean, on, I guess to add to that, um, Algorand specifically has got this tool of state proofs, right, which, which was launched publicly in August. Right. Um, and I think the purpose of that, and it's, a, it, it's quite a unique innovation among blockchains, uh, it, it's, to it's basically to allow you to prove something about the blockchain outside of it, right, by, by being able to validate its state. And it's perfect for bridging. Because in the bridge, in, instead of having to have an or, a, a network that's listening to different nodes and agreeing together and taking the, you know, the, this set of listeners, taking their word for it that this has happened on Algorand, you can now validate that cryptographically. And that means you could extend that to a blockchain like Ethereum and validate it there. So the, the bridge in the middle wouldn't need to do very much. Right? So this is really this is the solution. Right? The solution is to extend the trust of the blockchain so that things can be verified uh, outside. So state proofs give us a really good way, a uh, good stepping stone to doing that. Uh, when we're, if we're bridging to Ethereum in particular, validating those state proofs is still quite a heavy process. Uh, I know there's a lot of work and optimization being done by the Algorand team to improve that. Right. But right now, that's still pretty heavy. So that's why in, the, in London Bridge, in the bridge that we're building, we're using what's called a secure enclave. Which, is an, uh, which runs a tested code, which is linked to, us to the smart contracts, and that effectively extends the smart contracts. Uh, and we do all the validation there of the state proofs and also the other chain, and then we provide proof of that validation to the other blockchain. So the operator middle, in the middle can't really interfere with the process. Um, and the, the only, we, we will eventually decentralize that as well, only so that we can't switch the service off. But there's no other way that we can, uh, with the current design, interfere with the bridging process in a way that a normal bri bridge operator could. That's, right. I think, the, the way forward. I think that's a really good segue to um, like all of you guys' involvement in the Web3 space, especially on bridges. Um, and you mentioned London Bridge. Why not we continue with that, um, um, that topic? Um, I mean, we've got the, the, the bridge, of course, is alongside other bridges that are being built for Algorand. Uh, we've taken the same technology and we're also using it for oracles now as well. So we've got a, a platform called Silent Data, which also uses these enclaves in a similar way to, to connect to Web2 APIs and generate proof about, uh, about data that's private data that's in those Web2 APIs without seeing it and then enabling that to be validated in the smart contracts on Algorand. Uh, so that's, that's a different type of bridge. That's kind of like a data bridge to Web2. Uh, but it's, again, it's the, same, it's the same concept. It's being able to provide cryptographic proof so we can verify things without anyone in the middle being able to interfere. Cool. Yeah? Um, Hugo, you want to go next? Yeah, so so Flare is not really about bridging. Bridging is an application of Flare. Uh, Flare is a blockchain that has two protocols, uh, a time series oracle, so for essentially price data at the moment, it could be other things that move over time, uh, and it has a, I suppose, a unique protocol, which we kind of think of as a consensus algorithm that allows Flare to come to consensus over the state of some other chain, uh, maybe even some Web2 APIs. So I look forward to working with you. <laughs> um, but. Uh, that allows people to essentially build smart contracts that can get richer data than is currently available. So price data, sure, you have oracles. Not many of them are particularly decentralized. Um, and then state data, 
it's fairly unique, at least the way we're doing it. Uh, so this says you build smart contracts. One of the sets of things that we think that that's very useful for is bridging, uh, but there's probably quite a lot of other things. Yeah. I'd also add bridging, I mean, it's a, it's a bit more complicated than people think. So, that, so there's, there's obviously the messaging layer itself, which right. is that we need to build the trust between the two chains. So we only do something on the second chain when we're absolutely certain of what's happened on the first chain. Then there's moving tokens, and those could be fungible or non-fungible tokens. Uh, at, at Applied Blockchain, we also build applications. Right? We build dApps and, and quite a few on Algorand as well. A lot of these applications, especially the NFT ones, they have custom functionality in the contracts, right? in the tokens. So if you're taking an NFT and the NFT has some royalty payments associated with it, when you're bridging that, you want to be able to bridge that functionality as well. Right? NFTs are quite complex because they're quite custom. If you just treat every token as the same, which is how bridges work today, that's, that, that, that's going to be a challenge. Right? You're not going to get the same risk. You know, the, the, the artist isn't going to get paid on the second chain. Right. Uh, so so there's, there's quite a few problems to be solved beyond just the messaging layer itself, which is the, the first class of problem. Right. Uh, and I think to have a healthy ecosystem where bridging can really work, you need that, those things to be catered for as well. Multiple types of, types yeah. of assets, right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, Nico, would you, would you like to talk about Nukumeda? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, just to give some context on how we are using bridging, so Nukumeda brings EVM capabilities to Algorand. So you can deploy any Ethereum smart contracts, and it's going to work in this layer 2 solution for Algorand. So when you have a layer two solution, you need to be able to move assets from the first layer to the second layer, and then you can interact in this virtual machine, which is the EVM, and eventually maybe you also would like to bring them back. So there is a bridge between the layer one and the layer two. We are not bridging uh, with other ecosystems, and that's why uh, for us, we sometimes can implement like some cooler stuff that's, uh, that take advantage of like some of the things from Algorand. So, for example, uh, the first one, we are implementing this thing called projective rollups that we are going to be able to project information from the layer one to the layer two with like minimum trust assumptions. Also, another cool thing that we are implementing, which is related to like bridging of messages, because sometimes you don't want to necessarily uh, bridge assets, you also maybe want to bridge like instructions to do something. So something that we are aiming to do, and it could be like really cool for Algorand, and because Algorand has instant finality, we actually can implement this, it feels like pretty good. So imagine that you deploy a dApp in this second layer. If you have this on Ethereum, first you will have to move tokens to the second layer, and, but wait a second, first you need to add another network to your wallet in Ethereum, and then maybe you can actually move the assets to the second layer, then you interact with that DAP, maybe it's a DEX, so you do a swap with another token, and then you need to bring it back. And try to explain this to your mom or someone that's like a uh, more like normal person, it's going to be very confusing. So to be able to get to like wider adoption, uh, we need to have better UX. And how actually, how can this look like uh, in Algorand? with what we are working with rapid smart contracts. So basically, you will have your normal wallet of Algram, MyAlgo, or Pera that doesn't know anything about the layer two, doesn't even know uh, about EVM. And you will do a transaction. And behind the curtains, we are going to be able to move the assets, perform the action, and bring it back in a uh, hopefully like very low trust assumption manner. And we are going to be using uh, state proofs. And hopefully, uh, that is going to be uh, for moving in one way and then to bring it back. Uh, we are uh, starting to work with vector commitment, which is part of like also the Ethereum roadmap. So we can do something similar to what Algorand brought with the state proof, which is really, really cool. But to be able to create proof from something that's happening in the EVM and be able to validate it on Algorand. Cool. There's a lot of unpack that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, I definitely won't be able to explain that to my mom. So. <laughs> Um, there is one post recently, a rather con controversial one by Vitalik. He posted on Reddit um, at the start of 2022, that was also right after another hack. He said, why the future will be multi-chain and not cross-chain? 
there are fundamental limits to the security of bridges that hop across multiple zones of sovereignty. And he linked it to a tweet, you know. So, I mean, there's a lot to unpack in that Reddit post. Yeah. It was a while ago. Um, what are you guys ta thoughts and opinions? I, about I that? think he was, uh, I mean, he spoke specifically about another layer one, which maybe I shouldn't name here. But I think he was alluding to the fact that um, the blockchains themselves can suffer 51% uh, attacks, right? Or, um, slip my mind now. Reorg uh, attacks. Huh? Reorg attacks. Uh, Reorg double spin attacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. basically, the, you know, the, they're not decentralized enough, uh, and then the security gets undermined. And he, ke he kept giving the example of that happening to Ethereum in his, in his uh, post, but he was really talking about other chains. And I think he was there, he was talking about the, the relative security. So even if your bridge is secure, if one of the chains is, is undermined, then if, the, if you have a bridge that's got wrapped tokens or locked tokens, uh, locked assets on one side and then uh, wrapped assets being minted on the other, then there's, there's a risk around, uh, around either side if one of the chains gets compromised. That's what his post was about. And he said, he was basically alluding to the fact that rather than all the chains being linked together in this uh, cross-chain heaven in uh, Nirvana, uh, there would be groups of chains that have similar levels of security. Right. Right? right? And I think that makes sense, right? If people are willing to accept lower levels of security through lower levels of decentralization, which some popular chains do, then that's, that's their business. Um, I would put Algorand very much in that category of uh, of blockchains with stronger uh, decentralization fundamentals, right, and security fundamentals. So I wouldn't be worried about that from an algorithm perspective. Uh, I think that's what he was trying to say in his right. between the lines. Right, and, and Hugo? So, I mean, he's absolutely correct, um, of course. But, <laughs> he's um, you know, I, I thought there was a second step missing, right, which is like, so how do you deal with that? Um, I think it's relatively in some ways straightforward to deal with, which is that essentially the risk of what he's describing diminishes over time. And the more blocks you get, the less likely you are to get a reorg that happens, you know, 500 blocks back. Right? And you may get reorg in the, in the next 10 blocks, the next 20, whatever. And the further it goes back, the less likely you are to have a reorg. Um, we solve that with collateral. Right. It's like very simple. Right? I, I think he was talking about like the 51% attack, like because on, on a chain, uh, let's, let's say Alice sent Bob something on chain X, and then that chain X um, was 51% attacked um, after, say, Bob sends from chain X to chain Y some token that's native to chain X but wrapped in chain Y. So the recipient on chain Y might think that they have a token, but if a 51% attack happens on chain X, then um, you don't really, Bob does, didn't really have the token to send to, to begin with. So what happens then? So that, that was a very like, interesting way of him so, writing so very this, cryptically. This still exists even with like, if you have cryptographic proofs that something happened on a chain. Right. right? It's like you would still need to wait a very long time. It's a question of how you deal with, you know, to be certain that there's no, you know, potential for, for a chain reorganization. Um, so, you know, it's how you deal with it. How, you know, we want, you know, users want speed. They want to be able to bridge quickly. They don't want to wait three days for their token. Otherwise, you know, we can go back to the old banking system. Um, it's a question of how do you ameliorate that risk? Our approach is that you, you lay off that risk on someone that wants to take that risk, you know, and that's, uh, that, uh, to me, I, I think that, that seems sort of fairly logical. Well, one of the attacks in the list that you sent us before, uh, before the event, uh, was the Ronin Bridge. Right. $600 right. million, dollars, by the way. Yeah. yeah. And that was a Sybil attack. That was the word I was looking for. It was a 51% attack. So there, the network wasn't very decentralized. I think it was single figures. Yep. And an attacker through social attack. Uh, managed manage to get the keys or to, to get control of more than half of the nodes in the Ronin network and through that was able to, to carry out the attack. Um, I think it's something that you need to... No, that's not your understanding? Uh, no, that's not a civil attack. Uh, no, so okay. It's okay. a key compromise. Not a civil attack, yeah. but uh, yeah, a majority uh, control, control the majority and was therefore able to influence the, 
Doesn't that work? It was a five of nine, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's th that, that's a kind of example. Uh, it's it's a little bit a little bit what Vitalik was alluding to that basically you can't you know if if you're bridging between two chains and one chain gets compromised in that way, then then the, the, you know the bridged tokens are compromised. Yeah. So at the end, this is like a reaffirmation from Vitalik, from what I understand, towards like layer two solutions. For example, because he is speaking from the Ethereum perspective. And, and instead of being like, hey, for scalability, let's use like this other chain or this other chain, he's more of like, uh, no, let's build layer two solutions that are going to solve our own problems in our own chains. So we are not going to be dependent on the security properties of other chains. And this could be sometimes really, uh, I, I, I think he's correct because, for example, we have other ecosystems, for example, Cosmos, where you have the IBC bridge, but all the different chains on Cosmos, they have different security properties. They don't share the same set of validators. So when you have bridges that accept tokens from other chains, you are like accepting also the risk. So they start creating like a little bit of like systemic risk. So that's why I also personally am like super bullish in creating like a specific solutions for layer choose, and that's why I really believe in what we are doing with Milcomida. So instead of using other chains that have like EVM capabilities, we can use the EVM that's like deployed on top of Algorand, so we don't need to be trusting other chains. And furthermore, what we see for Milcomida, we want to be like the VMware for uh, crypto, and particularly deploy other virtual machines on top of Algorand. So for example, if someone wants to use Move, this new programming language uh, that came out from Facebook, you don't need to go to another blockchain. Like uh, there's two that are like, going to be one that's already using Move and another one that's going to come out. Uh, the idea is that you can use Move, but on top of Algorand. So you're not going to be trusting the security assumptions of these other chains. That's cool. Um, maybe this is a good way to um, move towards closing statements. And um, I have a, I'll, I'll quote certain things that's either on the websites of the teams that you guys are with and whatnot, and then um, some questions after that. For Milko Meta, um, is this pro protocol that's designed to improve the blockchain interoper interoperability by delivering Ethereum virtual machine or EVM ca ca capabilities to non-EVM blockchains like Cardano and Algorand. So with the recent launch of Milko Meta Algorand A1 rollup, there's also partnerships like BlueShift, Seller, Multichain, and upcoming Brightside and Axelar. Can you walk the audience through on what each of these partners mean and, and what they are it, it to the multi-chain ecosystem? Yeah, so I can take a step back and explain, uh, which also fits for Algorand. When you see an ecosystem, uh, how can you categorize the apps that are like make this ecosystem grow? And one way to categorize this, you could be thinking about we have in one bucket DeFi. In another bucket, we have NFTs. In another one, we have DAOs. In another one, gaming. So something uh, when you want to grow an ecosystem, you need like, uh, like dApps in all of these packets to actually grow. And some of them are going to be measured in different ways. So for example, for DeFi, usually the way that you measure is with TVL, total value log, how much money there is in the protocol. But for example, for gaming, it could be quite different. It could be like for like uh, games or matches per day or like per hour. So, uh, so uh, sometimes I feel like people focus too much in TVL, but as we realize that uh, blockchain is not just DeFi, we want to start like understanding more that there's other ways to also bring value to the ecosystem. And uh, to complement this, also that I have seen that most of, if we look at DeFi crypto primitives, most of them they have come out from Ethereum. And basically, in other chains, what we have been doing is basically reconstruct something that was working in Ethereum. Maybe we want to be using another programming language, but we are building it in another chain. So I think right now we need to start like in this other chains, like in Algorand, we need to start pushing for like newer stuff that maybe in Ethereum they're going to be trying to copy us. And that's the part that we are like trying to get there. And particularly for Milcomida, what we see is decentralized gaming to be like one of the major use cases, which is different than what I call Web 2.5 gaming, which is basically a centralized game with NFTs. I don't think that cuts it because it doesn't take advantage of the blockchain. And that's why we are pushing towards more like completely decent, uh, trustless uh, gaming. And I think this could be like a use case that 
uh, an algorithm could be pretty cool, and hopefully then it gets copied somewhere else, and that proves like uh, that it was good. Very much looking forward to the trustlessness of that. Um, and for Adi, so the London Bridge is highly appealing initiative, you know, to you know bridging between Ethereum and Algorand. You know, on the LondonBridge.io website, it spells out transfer tokens between Algorand and Ethereum using the additional security of state proofs and hardware enclaves, like you mentioned earlier. Um, recently, Algorand completed a launch of state proofs on mainnet. Can you help illustrate, like? You know, this applied in conjunction with the hardware enclaves, which is a really interesting combination. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the state proofs I alluded to earlier, there, there was obviously this innovation from Algorand to allow us to verify the state of Algorand outside of Algorand itself, um, and that's that's super useful for a bridge, right? Because obviously, on the on a bridge, you want to be able to check that a token's been locked before you go and mint it somewhere else, for example. Um, so that's, that, that's what the state proofs give us. Now, the state proofs, if you look at what Algorand have published and their vision for this and how bridges will use this, it's, it's what we call a trustless bridge, where the blockchains themselves, the smart contracts on each blockchain are able to validate, to fully validate what's come from the other blockchain. Right? And then you take out the operator in the middle and, and what they can do. All the operator in the middle is then doing is passing messages around. Right? They can't actually o interfere in them or change them. Uh, so that's, that, that's really where we want to go with this. Now, we as a company at Applied Blockchain, apart from developing blockchain applications and, and, and TIL smart contract applications and so on, we also specialize, we've specialized in different types of cryptography. So we've experimented with zero-knowledge proofs, multi-party computation, different types of advanced cryptography. And, and we landed with these secure enclaves. Specifically, we work with Intel SGX. And there's, uh, there's a few properties of these enclaves that we see uh, that we find really useful in this type of scenario and also for the oracles. Right? One is, is it's a hardware secured environment where you can run code and you can't see the code. So you can do privacy preserving computation and you can't interfere. The second thing is that the code is attested. Right? It's attested by the manufacturer and they don't actually get to see it. So there is a third party there, but they're not active. Right? And they don't get to see what's going on. So they're very limited in what they can do. Um, and together, that combination gives us this trust layer outside of the blockchain. It allows us to extend the trust of the blockchain. Now, not everybody likes secure enclaves. In the crypto world, some people will see it as a still depending on the uh, chip manufacturer for, for a level of security. So it's not that there's no controversy there. But for us, it's a, it's a great middle ground. The, the actual attack vectors are well documented. And, and you know, the whole you know, the, the, all this space is full of different compromises and risks and so on. What we see the advantages of using enclaves in this type of scenario far outweigh the disadvantages and the risks. And so we think it brings this ability to to do things safely on the edge between blockchains and between the blockchain and the outside world. Uh, and so that's why we've focused and built these two products: the bridge, on the bridge and silent data. To, to do that. Okay. Hardware and software, best of both worlds. Um, so Hugo, on Flare's website, it states there are two primary types of technology used with, within cross-chain bridges, custodial, including multi-signature um, schemes, and also the like client relays, and neither are satisfactory. So then it talks about, you know, um, introduces layer cake, which is really interesting. Can we dive deeper into what, what the claim meant in the quote sure. and how layer cakes sort of solves it? Yeah, so uh, essentially multi-sig based bridges I think we've covered, and, you know, clearly centralized, possibly need to be regulated because uh, you're essentially holding someone's funds. Uh, other people have tried to decentralize by essentially uh, using like client relays. Um, we find that to be quite interesting especially when combined with things like proof of stake, uh, whereby essentially the bridge can then only really safely operate up to about a third of the value of the stake before the security guarantees over that become uh, essentially fall away. Uh, as if you, let's say you wanted to transfer funds which were in, in excess of say 10x what the stake was on that chain, there's nothing there really securing 
uh, stopping the nodes from at least uh, creating a, a kind of ransom attack where they, they stop the transaction by not serving the actual data and saying, well, now if you want to move this amount, you're going to have to pay us. And that's you know, a fundamental limitation of the concept of proof of stake, which was never designed to be built around essentially uh, uh, cross-chain communications. It's, it's self-referential. Uh, so with Layercake, we do a couple of things to try to mediate the risk. The first is we split up bridging events into a definable amount, uh, which is secured by the underlying token itself, which we hold as collateral. Um, the second is we, uh, we protect against reorg for a certain amount of time, obviously not infinitely, again, by taking additional collateral. You pay for that, but it's not very high. Having that collateral available also means we can do some interesting things cross-chain when it's not being used. So, for instance, that gets into things like cross-chain flash loans. Um, you know, that's because we've got the collateral there. I'm sure we've got the collateral there. So you can potentially then use that collateral, you know, at will across various different chains. That's, that's sort of the idea. But that's just layer cake. That's just one... I guess, product that's being built on Flare. Flare is a, a blockchain more generally for uh, essentially an EVM-powered blockchain uh, that has essentially two sources of data, price and state, uh, to allow people to build you know, many, many more products than just uh, essentially the two bridges we've, we've conceptualized. Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, to the panel. Um, we have a few seconds left for questions. If there's anybody brave enough to um, raise their hands and um, come up to a microphone. Going once. There's a hand up back there. Maybe you can shout it out or uh, we'll repeat your question. Hello. So I'm Alan Settleman. Hello, everybody. Um, basically, I am a member of GBA, Government Blockchain Association, and we develop a blockchain maturity model. Uh, I would like to know what uh, do you think about this and if you are uh, considering to uh, use ki this kind of models for the audits you, uh, Nicolas, I think, was uh, mentioning before. I don't particularly know this maturity model that you're referring. I don't know if you guys know. I'm not familiar either. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, okay, maybe, but maybe, maybe you can maybe reframe the question. It, yeah. yeah. Well, um, there are many blockchains there outside and a lot of systems running, so people start believing about um, applications which are built it on. For example, Algoland, it's a trustable infrastructure, but there are other infrastructures outside where maybe are not. Uh, how can the users outside be sure that the um, blockchains are not a risk? So it's a kind of new standard, so a standard, putting I, I, all the blockchains uh, around the world in comparison uh, to see if they are approved to run and not. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd, I'd be interested to look at it in more detail. Uh, obviously, the way blockchains, you know, I guess as technologists, the way we think about the, sec the, the security of blockchains is through the actual implementation and technology. Uh, and so it's those security audits, it's the fact that these blockchains are out there in the wild and they're not protected by any firewalls or anything like that. You know, they're battle tested. That's how, that's how we're looking at their maturity. Um, but I think, uh, I mean, one thing, you know, we haven't spoken about the, you know, what's just happened in the last few weeks. Uh, I guess it's not the topic of this, uh, of this talk. Um, but uh, for me, one of the big surprising things in this industry is that there isn't enough diligence, right? Especially on the technical side. So as techies, we can look at some of these protocols and some of these blockchains 
and, and just, just say, look, this, this looks risky, or we don't understand why there's so much activity here because it, you know, we can see some issues. We don't see any of that in the press. We don't see uh, enough uh, diligence just in general, especially technical diligence, all around in the industry. So I don't know exactly what this standard is, uh, is about, but if it does anything to address that, then it's probably welcome. Thank you. Cool. Um, one more hand. I think that might be the last question that we have time uh, for. Hi. Yeah. Uh, my question is about the uh, new feature in the algorithm blockchain, that's the state proofs. Uh, we know that the bridge have a, a layer that is either centralized or decentralized, depending on how you verify the transactions across the bridge, right? But how do you think that state proofs can help you and eliminate that layer? Because that, that's where the most of the vulnerabilities are arising. Uh, uh, you, you have transaction, you lock that transaction on, let's suppose, Algorand, and you release the equivalent token on the Ethereum. But that, that has to be verified or validated by the centralized nodes or decentralized network within, in the middle. So how the state proofs can actually help there and eliminate that centralization layer? Uh, I, I, uh, I'm not an expert in state proof. My CTO will know more. But for example, for a state proof, you don't need a centralized middle like network. You can verify it on Ethereum. Right now, one of the issues is that uh, the proof could be like quite big. So I think the team is implementing uh, some type of CK snark, and also uh, how to read the CK snark will have to be a smart contract on Ethereum. Uh, but uh, this is quite good because you can assure that something happened in Algorand without having to like rely on mm -hmm. uh, other, other, any other information. Yeah, I, I would just add to that that the state proofs are just a proof, right? So the real security question is who's validating them and where, right? So if those proofs are being validated by the destination blockchain itself, by those smart contracts, then you have the guarantee in that smart contract before it does anything like minting a token. If those state proofs are being validated by a middleman, an operator, that's, not, that, that's just running on a server, and they're just going and minting uh, tokens on the other chain, then there's almost no point having the state proofs, because you're completely trusting that middleman that they say that they've checked these state proofs. So the state proofs in, in themselves on their own are not, a, don't, are not enough. Right? It depends how, you, how they're being used. Great, this is an amazing topic. Once again, please join me in a round of applause to Nico, Adi, and Hugo. Thank yeah, you, guys. Thank you. All right, all right. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you, Adi, Hugo, Nico, and Jack. Um, thanks very much. So we've got another panel coming up, as you know, and from discussing interoperability and keeping assets secure while enabling cross-chain communications to talking about insurance coverage for digital assets. I know you think about insurance may not be the most interesting topic in the world, but this guy is going to bring it home because it's really fascinating what he's doing, what he's talking about. Um, and uh, he's the CEO and founder of Nimble, uh, and his name's Adam Hoffman. Please welcome him because this is actually super fascinating. So welcome Adam Hoffman from Nimble. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Um, I wish my mic was on when we were when I was back there because we had some really good stuff. We were talking about we talked about the Who for a little bit. We talked about um, the New York highway system, and now I get to talk about insurance. So you guys are like you're in a good place. This is super exciting. But you know I, I I'll make it as exciting as I can. I spent 22 years in insurance, and today I was going to talk about what Nimble is, what we're doing at Nimble. And I kind of got the vibe after everything we've been going through uh, with FTX and with all the, 
the markets uh, to talk about really what we're doing here and to rethink or remind ourselves what we're doing and why we're building, right? So we have this little uh, doodle here to represent the nimble world. And, and for us, this is what it feels like in the current state of insurance. It's crowded, it's not happy, that poor little nimble person is being rained on. And I just want to talk about today, you know, what are we building, right? As a community of people, there's a lot of people here. And I was at Decipher last year, there's a lot more people this year. That's a good thing. That means we're all trying to build something, but why are we building it? What is our ultimate goal? And then, you know, how are we gonna get there, right? So, so we're talking about building a world that is expansive, that's inclusive, um, you know, that, that builds on <laughs> actually, yeah, an expanding universe, but we're trying to build this to be building community, right? Like to move through, oh, my animations aren't working, so that just looks like crap. Um, <laughs> but anyways, we're, you know, we're building a bigger community, right, together. I, I always say that the biggest challenge building on Web3 is the opportunity, which is a great challenge to have, right? The challenge that there's partners that we can build with and we can work together to leverage these new technologies. And to do that though, we need users. We don't need to keep scaring users away. And that's one of the, the main problems I see, right? And we call this the disincentive loop. So in insurance, the disincentive loop is this whole idea that First of all, it's insurance. So I don't have to tell you what the problems are because you feel them every day, right? There's this heavy regulation, which means there's, it really stifles competition. Competition in insurance is I increased my rates 3% and you increased your rates 2.8% and now, yeah, you win, right? That, that's, there's no incentive here for them to do anything different. The process is wildly confusing. You ask your agent, and I spent time as an insurance agent, you ask your company, how does this work? And you're gonna get this kind of juggling act about what's happening. Ultimately, the inefficiencies that exist in all of that contribute to the rates. So if, it, it's, if it's expensive to settle a claim and all that, that ultimately is being passed off to the consumer. So there is no incentive to adopt any new practices. That's a question I hear is like, why doesn't the insurance industry adopt technology in a broader way. Well, why? Well, they don't need to, right? So to me, it's similar to what's happening that we're seeing in blockchain, right? So there's this little quiz here, right? Like it's a $6 trillion industry plus, right? So is this insurance or blockchain? You know, there's retail investor challenges. In insurance, you can invest in insurance if you're a retail investor. There's just, there's no way to do it. In, in blockchain, we're seeing that retail investors are, are willing to take this chance, but they keep getting kind of hammered for that. So, I'm not, nothing's happening here. Let me see if I can get it, there we go. Uh, consumers pay the price and confusing processes. So, for me, there's, there's obvious similarities. The barrier to entry being challenging for this space we talk about, uh, who, someone on one of these panels said intelligent marketing, and I loved that because that's what we're trying to create here is a world that we can build together to create a system that works for everyone. All of this in insurance has led to what I call the satisfaction paradox, and it's the perfect example of insurance. This is a study from an, an insurance consultancy firm that they say 30% of insurance consumers are fairly satisfied, which is just BS because what that means is 70% are not. So 70% of insurance consumers are not happy with insurance. And 88% of them 88% of them don't leave. So if 88% of all of us who purchase insurance don't leave and we're all unhappy, that tells you there's no option, right? So as an industry, we need to address this. And you know, what can we do to stop that disincentive style loop from happening in blockchain? And for us, it's about creating an insurer chain, an insurance world where we can build on these partnerships, right? Where we can have it be more efficient, more flexible, um, 
for us in insurance, it's about creating a system where we're not cutting out the good parts of insurance. Underwriters, actuaries, insurance professionals work together. Ultimately, we have lower premiums as a result. We have a new asset class for people to invest in. So a retail investor can invest in the trillion dollar investment opportunity that is insurance. And ultimately, everyone's working together to make that happen. And why does it work? And why does it work for everyone? If you look at, and I'm wondering if the animation isn't gonna work here either, but if you look at a risk pool, let's think of a risk pool like a liquidity pool, and pick any asset. So for Nimble, our first insurance product is insurance for smart contracts. So the first thing that happens is these underwriters, actuaries, they can help develop the rates to make sure it's profitable. And the insurance premiums go into that pool. Now, LPs can also put money into that pool as an investment opportunity. So now you've created a situation where you have premiums in a risk pool and you have investment in a risk pool to pay claims. A portion of all of that is also redirected and allocated to what we call a nimble common reserve. And the reason we do that is because we want diversification in the risk pool. So here's the nimble ecosystem. That kind of cutout is one example of a risk pool but those are all different asset classes that exist behind it. All of them contributing to the common reserve. So if one of those risk pools has a horrible year, it doesn't impact the profitability of the other risk pools, but there's also a way that if it's one of black swan event, there's, there's money for them to leverage, which is similar to um, reinsurance in the traditional space. And the reason we do that is because 100% of the expected claims are paid by the insureds. So that means the premiums are modeled saying, as an insured, we expect the premiums to be able to cover the claims. There's two reasons. One is it's the most capitally, capital efficient way to do that. The other is if the expected claims are lower, insureds can actually take their money back. So this gives them an incentive to act responsibly. After that, say it goes beyond that, right? The next level of coverage is paid, a percentage is paid by those LPs. That means the LPs aren't the first line of defense. The LPs aren't saying, I'll take an 8% APY, but all my money's at stake right at the front. The rest of that is covered by the, com the common reserve. And you'll see that as we keep going up this tower, there's multiple layers of protection. So you're getting a system here where you're protected you're rewarded if you have a profitable year, and the LPs are protected, and there's traditional ins reinsurance there to further protect. So, whoops. <laughs> Who contributes is as important as the comp contribution. I threw this in there because I firmly believe that whether you're a decentralized exchange, a central exchange, centralized exchange, whether you're a foundation or a project, we all have a responsibility to contribute to a system like this. Because if we all contribute even, you know, minimal amount of basis points, we're creating a better system. If we create a better system, we're bringing more people on chain and we're realizing the vision that we set out to do. So part of that is working with partners so that we have a chain that not only does provide that protection, but provides it in a way helps everyone and can recover. So if the assets are hacked from a smart contract, at Nimble, we're working with partners who leverage the same technology so that we can get those assets back, which ultimately benefits the entire community. You could, there's a common thread here about working together, working together, working together. Um, ultimately, what we're creating is an insured world where the APY is real. It's based on the premium. It's based on the cost of capital. And the more profitable, the better. So we always say insurance is necessary, but it doesn't have to be evil. I also think blockchain does not have to sacrifice security. We're here because we believe in this technology, no other reason. At least I know that we are on the Nimble team. So I would say and ask you to just keep asking and reminding yourself, why are we building? And how can we all work together to make sure that we're still moving towards a more inclusive system that protects everybody and not just the few? So that's what we're doing at Nimble, and thanks, guys, for coming.
All right. I told you insurance was interesting. All right, so thanks, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, so our next couple of sessions today are, I think, especially pertinent to the broader crypto landscape of this year. Uh, our goal, we're going to have a series of uh, a couple of different conversations, uh, is to shine a light on what we as an industry have learned when it comes to safety, hacks, and above all, <coughs> trust. So to kick it off, uh, we're going to hear from a panel of experts, which is what you'd expect. Um, after that, we'll get, we'll move, uh, we'll get more of a regulatory and economic perspective. But so let's begin to discuss how you can kind of quote, stay safe out there in this you know, relatively vol volatile time. And so please welcome um, Rotem Himo, Director of Product Management at Algorand, Ramsey Alkazan, Head of Blockchain Security at Kudaleski, Pablo Yabo, co-founder of RAND Labs, C3, and Algo Explorer. And uh, again, to moderate, I think for the second time today, uh, Rachel Wilson from Cointelegraph. So please welcome them uh, in this panel. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay, thanks again for joining us for this uh, panel today. Um, this has been a great event so far, and thanks again to Algorand, Algorand for having us. My name is Rachel Wolfson. I'm a senior reporter with Cointelegraph, and I'm going to have our panelists just briefly introduce themselves, and then we'll go into our questions. Hello, everybody. My name is Ramsey. I am at Kadelsky Security, and I lead one of the, the Web3 security team at Kadelsky. Hi, everyone. I'm Rotem from Algorand, Director of Product Management. I'm Pablo Yabo from Randlabs, CEO of Randlabs and co-founder C3. Great. So our panel is about hacks and scams and how we can stay safe and prevent those or prevent from falling victim to those. So first question to kick the panel off is there have been a number of hacks and security issues that have taken place in the blockchain and crypto space recently. So why do you think that this is the case? And anybody can start. I, I can start here. Uh, so the, I think the first thing that's important to know that it's not unique to the blockchain space. Like hacks are everywhere, and we're kind of like surrounded by that. So we tend to think that it's kind of like special for, to us. But it's really um, all over the place in terms of like, hacking. But the important thing to know is that hacking, at the end of the day, is a game of economics. The hackers need to know that they have enough money to make in order to basically put the effort, the time, and the risk to try and hack uh, a place. And specifically, blockchain is in this unique intersection of really high gains. I mean, if you think of the, the last hacks, there are a number of like 300 million, 60 million. It's like a pretty high numbers. And yet, we're still in this like, phase where the security is not there yet. Um, it's getting closer, but it's not there yet. And the, and the risk profile is somewhat low because there is this like, game of anonymity. And you, they know that they somewhat maybe can get away with it. But that being said, um, the security is definitely getting closer and closer. And this like, balance point of you know, we're going to see that it's going to be difficult enough, um, or at least they will need to spend so much money to, to hack this like, system to make the reward. It's actually not going to be that profitable. So you're going to see less and less hacks like that over time. Yeah, I think it's a great point, Rotem. And actually, just to jump on the back of that, the, one of the things that we've got to consider is that when we think about security, there's a reason that it's important. And that is because we're all building a bunch of stuff and some very important projects coming out. But the people that we're up against, the enemy isn't Ethereum or it's not um, Polygon or any, any of the chains, it's nation states and very sophisticated criminal organizations. So interesting stat here, in the first nine months of this year, the, um, it's estimated that, it, that North Korea has gained a billion dollars worth of assets through just hacking, attacking decentralized exchanges. And so the reality that we've got to, to, to grapple with is that we will probably be hacked. We will be breached. It's happening all over the place, not just in Web3. This is, as you say, this is cybersecurity day in, day out. 
And so because they have more resources than us, they're, they're smarter than us, we've got to put in other controls to be able to help mitigate those kind of risks. Yeah, uh, I agree with them in that sense. And I think it, the maturity of the technology is very important there. Uh, the incentives are very aligned in crypto to hack because you see the pot and the code is there. Uh, you see the transaction flowing. It's so it's very transparent for the attackers. They have a lot of information. And most uh, platforms are open source, so you've got most of the information and you can attack real life, try attacks, and even you can see the transactions that are failing. So all that information, the incentives align. When you see, in particular, new technologies, in general, they are more likely to be attacked. When we see that in last year and this year, uh, layer two technologies emerged uh, with a lot of volume that generate breaches, some a bit low-end breaches, and those were all attacked. So, and, and that is most of the, if you calculate the, the, uh, all the hacks in 2022, most are related to those uh, breaches. Yeah, it would also be interesting to talk a little bit about the hacks and scams that we're seeing on DeFi platforms versus those that we're seeing on CeFi platforms. So maybe we could elaborate on that, you know, are there differences there? And if so, why? Ramsey, do you want to? Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. So I, I think that fundamentally, when you're talking about decentralized or, or DeFi on decentralized exchanges, what you have is um, the, the thing that's stopping X attacker from gaining access to your funds is essentially a piece of code. In, in DeFi, code is law. The problem is, if that code is somehow wrong, then you're able to break the law or you're able to, to lose your funds. We know this already. Whereas in centralized, um, a centralized model, you've got the more, um, the, the kind of vulnerabilities or the, the kind of risks associated with traditional organizations like the um, you know, risk management around, hey, have your people, are they behaving in the way that they should be? Have you got your policies in place? Um, it's much more on the governance side than it is on the, the technical controls. Yeah, it's a C5, it's a, the security is more related to a TradFi security. Uh, of, and to, to gain uh, any funds, you need finally a signature. So you have to take control of a signature and sign a withdrawal to you. And, and it's, a, it's more mature in that sense, that technology. And if we talk about exchanges, They've been around for a while. And when we talk DeFi, and we talk DeFi as only one thing, and you have to uh, separate things, because it's not the same when you say AMM, that is something that is more mature. But if you think about breaches, it's something that is not that mature. So uh, it's, it depends on the level of maturity is the way you can explode or not uh, the technology. Oh, there was one thing that at first I would start to say that I totally agree with, with the point. I think that one odd extra thing that happens is that the reaction time, which is very different, mm -hmm. usually in DeFi protocols, as I say, like there is no single person or someone who's in charge of it. So when we start the, um, seeing things going down, there is almost impossible to react and say, hey, we actually, we have to stop that. Hey, we, we need to react very quickly because it's borderline impossible. There is like code that we need to change. There is a, a basically the, the reaction is very slow. And in CFI, this is actually something that pretty much against um, the centralized system in that sense, is that there is always usually a monitoring team that sits there and have like reaction time of basically um, 20 seconds to stop attacks when they happen. So that's why at this, at this point in time, we see usually um, smaller attacks on centralized exchanges. Um, unless the entire thing went down, and that's a different thing. But um, in contrast to DeFi, that usually it's kind of like a zero or nothing kind of situation. It's either like nothing happened or we lost the entire set of funds that we had there. Yeah, I, I, I want to add something there mm -hmm. that is very uh, particular for one attack. In Nomad Bridge, the attack was uh, executed one by one hacker, and then uh, the rest of the user or developers start uh, replicating the same attack, changing the beneficiary address. 
And that was like unique in some way to DeFi platforms that are like leaving and you can stop. Them. So uh, it's, a, it's a big difference. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. In traditional cybersecurity, you've got organizations, whole security organizations set up to, to do it with instant response plans. So they've thought through, they've done drills against ransomware attacks, against um, operational technology. So manufacturing plants and electri electrical utilities um, all have this as one of their key uh, goals. They've got to make sure they know what to do in the, in the case of an attack. And similarly, I, just, I don't know that we are mature enough as an industry to, to have done all of that work already and to understand what does it take to investigate um, in record time, as you say, in these 20-second periods. Mm -hmm. Can you go right into detail, understand what's happened? And, and do the tools exist to be able to monitor in real time things like smart contracts? I probably am jumping ahead because I know we wanted to talk about that a bit yeah, later. Well, you're, well, so interestingly enough, I think given recent events, and I won't name any names, <laughs> but given recent events, we're going to start seeing a rise in DeFi platforms. Um, and it's important to talk about this now because I think people may think that DeFi is definitely the way to go 100%, but there are these challenges with hacks and scams associated with DeFi platforms, which is why it's important that we're talking about this. So Ramsey, to your point, how can we ensure moving forward, especially as we see more people go to DeFi, that we prevent security issues from happening? So I think there's probably three levels. I'll maybe talk about one of them. Three levels being, from a personal perspective, how do we make sure we've, we've got our personal security hygiene done? Like, are we sh using the same passphrase? It's all the basic stuff. Then there's, the, there's a bunch of builders in this room. As, you're, as we're building, as you're building, um, how can we ensure that there are security principles that are being um, adopted and there's a, a bunch of tooling uh, around there as well. And a third level is, as I think there's investors in the room, as we all have a role to play in this, whether it's whether we're in marketing, whether we're in conversation with people who are implementing. Um, we see in, uh, I'll give you an example again, going back to the energy space, um, that there are uh, a number of private equity firms who essentially are able to dictate the priorities of those energy companies in their portfolio, if they mandate that risk management, particularly on the cyber side, is an important issue, then what follows is the energy firms have to adopt these policies, and they, and they do, because they're incentivized to. We need to have the same approach when it comes to investing in Web3 startups, when it comes to investing in projects that, that come across our plate. We want to make sure that there is a minimum level of security due diligence done that supersedes what is currently adopted. So currently there's, let's do an audit and then you're done. And I think most of us probably would know that's not enough, that the difference has got to be what we actually do with that. Um, so one of the, I'll, I'll, I'll say this one point and then I'll pass over, is, is um, in traditional uh, cybersecurity we have um, monitoring solutions that, that where you're able to, to know what's going on across your IT estate or your technology estate in real time. Um, and there's a lot of technology out there that does that. Um, it, in the Web3 space, we're, just, we're not really there. Some people are starting to build. We, at Kodowski Security, we're doing some stuff. But, but there's a bit of a way to go before we're able to say, yes, we've, we've got a, a level of security that supersedes what we've had in Web2. Yeah, and I, I would add that like, I want to tweak a bit the, the statement of saying, like, I don't think we will ever prevent the, the hacks. I think we, we are going to make it significantly more difficult for hackers um, to attack, and that's basically going to be a foot race of like, both sides um, pretty much forever, as we, we see in the normal cybersecurity world. And companies um, definitely now in, in DeFi where it, really it's all about users' money, we'll put more and more and more um, efforts to make sure that the funds are secure, which is something that I think that over the past year and a half, I mean, obviously everyone trying to audit the code, everyone trying to make sure, but I think that there was like also kind of like a go-to-market race, of like trying to get it really, really fast, and sometimes, unfortunately, it came um, on the expense of like the, user of the user's um, security. Yeah. Uh, I think security starts when you 
start programming. Uh, if you have the great, uh, if you have great tools, it is easier uh, to make secure code, uh, if to run tests, and then uh, to deploy in a secure way, and afterwards monitor, and if you need to upgrade uh, even smart contracts in the platforms that allow that. Uh, that is the start. Then audit. When you audit, you need to audit for you more than for the rest. Uh, you see some audits that are like stamps, and audits are not stamps. Are for you to be sure that your code, or to be almost certain that your code is secure. If you are not secure enough with one audit, you need another one. So uh, it's, that is important because then uh, people blame uh, auditors, and the auditor is not just you are secure. It's, it's a process. If, you, if your code is not good enough to be audited, then the auditors uh, have to invest a lot of time to understand the code. And that means that they will look less to security issues. And then the maturity, uh, as uh, here was said, it's, a, it's important to have like a lot of more tools to, to simulate, for example, smart contracts. A formal verification, I'm, I'm not meaning that you can prove that the smart contract is perfect, but at least in certain inputs that some things are invariant or some properties are covered. So uh, those things are, uh, you can find those outside blockchain and you cannot find in blockchain. The same with the simulations, uh, market simulation on smart contracts. You cannot do that in blockchain. You can create a model and see if the model behaves, but you cannot test your code. Or you cannot fork the blockchain and run a searching scenario that happened in the real world and go to the a, to a code chain or a private chain and run exactly the same and, and see what's the result. Those things will be incredible for the security in general, so, but we don't have those. So what we can do now, the easy, is we know that hackers are around, but we can incentivize those hackers that try to do the good thing. And those white hackers have to be like a, a career. So we need to generate good bounties uh, all the time and to see if someone attacked your country and is able to get funds, you, uh, we have to give them a reward. Uh, not, not if, sorry, if, not if they get the funds, but if they show that there is uh, something wrong, they should be able to get enough credit and enough money to uh, incentivize their behavior, their good behavior. Yeah, Pablo, I love that. I love your point around it starts right at the beginning when you're coding, and which is why um, John's announcement this morning was exciting, because Algo Kit, I'm interested and excited to see the role that that can play in helping onboard developers in a secure, by design, methodology rather than trying to hack it together after the fact. So there's a lot of movement, and I think we're on a good journey. That's maybe a good thing Doesn't to say. the way there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Um, so I kind of want to shift gears here. We're seeing more Web 2 users move into the Web 3 space. Um, this is all new and unfamiliar to them. So how can we ensure that these users stay safe once they make that transition? Because DeFi is vulnerable, CeFi is vulnerable. So any advice there? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's difficult. We are uh, we are in Randlabs. We have a wallet, and we s feel that pain really because people. Uh, we in crypto, we are used to have 12, uh, 24, 25 words, and uh, we have to write down uh, those words in a secure place, and that is normal for us in general, and that is not normal for Web2 user, users. So we need to create something that is not that. Uh, there are some uh, projects that are working on that. Uh, you see like Web3 out. Uh, they, they, uh, what they do is that they distribute 
the private key in different parties, and they merge just to sign transactions. If you lose your uh, mobile phone or your device, you can recreate the, uh, the private key with only two of three. There are social recoveries. Uh, there, are, there is another approach that is with the smart contracts. Your account, instead of uh, being a single uh, private key, it's a smart contract where you can change it with also uh, with social intervention. And I think that is the biggest uh, problem because even there you cannot say, talk about hardware wallet because Web2 users, you cannot show the hardware wallet. And it's a lot of friction to start because when the, the first thing you ask the Web2 user is to create a wallet and you lose most of them at that stage. Well, if they, do have, if they don't have a hardware wallet and they lose funds because they don't have a hardware wallet, they'll move to a hardware wallet after that incident. <laughs> I'm, I mean, you know, we've seen that happen a lot recently where people have transitioned to a hardware wallet after they've learned the hard way. Yeah, the, the hard way, uh, it's a, it's, it are lessons that you don't forget. So it's a, I, we saw a lot of people moving also to DeFi or or to self custody wallets after uh, the current, uh, after FTX hack, uh, FTX uh, fraud. Uh, uh, both things happen in the same uh, case. So we, we see big movements after something that is uh, really bad happens, but we need to try to teach people before things uh, happen because when those things happen, also a lot of people just leave from the ecosystem. That's true. Yeah, and I want to take one step back um, and talk about a different, at least something that happens in, uh, in Web3. So one of the main issues with Main3, or like I guess it's a two-sided sword, is that the ownership moved to the user. This is what, all, all we talk about. We talk about like owning the things and owning the content and owning the, the crypto. And the problem is that it also shifts the ownership of the security. If up to now, in most cases, the security was on the bank, was on the entity, was basically to make sure that the users are safe, now each user is pretty much on its own. And I think that it basically makes it like one too many problem. And now we have to solve it in kind of like a different way. And I think that the two pretty much layers we'll need to focus on, and it's getting better, but there is much more work to do, is one, on the developer side is really to make sure that we have a much more user-friendly systems, that we explain things a bit better, that, we are, that we're trying to protect the users from themselves in a sense. And also, um, on the user side, we really need to make sure that we're talking about education. So explaining what it means to have the key, to explain what it means to lose it, how to keep it, because it's really kind of a completely new world to a lot of people that up to now are used to their password, and they know that also if they, if they lost a the password, it's not the end of the world, because like, they can recover it, and even if someone hacked into it, the bank can probably like, return the, the, the cash back, which is really not the case in crypto. So education, education, education um, is pretty much like a big focus that we need to do, and we don't have enough of it yet I guess simply because there is not enough money there. Uh, so we don't see as much investment, although we really should. So this is an interesting point around how do we communicate what we're experiencing and the, the kind of revelation that we've found to the general mass. And I, th I think there's, that, there's kind of a different answer as well, which is the words that we use are sometimes a barrier to being able to understand what's going on. So who in this room used the word fungible before coming to Web3? I'm seeing zero hands up. There's a, there, there are many words like that, and even the very explanation of what Web3 is, it is a barrier. So I'd probably want to say most people, in terms of adoption um, of this idea of this ownership of what of how we'd characterize Web3, it's probably going to be a lot more subversive. And the ideal would be if most people don't realize it. So for instance, telcos adopting, you know, creating wallets for all of their users. They won't talk about wallets, probably. They'll just talk about, I don't know, maybe points. Or there's, there's mechanisms that we'll use. 
And I, I think the interesting thing here is we've got to make sure that those, the, the fundamentals are rock solid. So the, we've got to ensure that the, 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 you know, maybe they don't have to deal with keys because my grandma maybe thinks a key is something that she puts in her house. And she's right. And I, I don't know that she needs to have to remember a passphrase to be able to keep control of her house. Uh, so there's, there's a bit more to go. Um, I think we, as a Web3 community, probably need to adapt ourselves rather than just hoping and expecting that Web2 will think like us. So there's a, there's a thought process a journey, I think. There. For sure. I also think it's interesting that the industry is maturing. And I, you know, I've seen that because I've been in the industry since 2017. But it seems like as the industry matures, I think in 2022, we saw the most hacks happen within the DeFi space. I could be wrong. I think I'm right. But anyways, why is that? The industry is maturing, yet we're seeing a rise in hacks when it comes to DeFi. And we're seeing all of these you know, problems with CeFi exchanges. So what are your thoughts on that? Why is that the case? Well, I assume that th we are maturing. That, that's true. It does get significantly better. But with that, I think that a lot of money is flowing in as well, um, and which makes the, the honeypot significantly more attractive to hackers. And as I said before, the security is maturing, but it's not there yet. And anytime, and still, like, I, there is, I guess, a point to make that the rate of the money that flew in was significantly higher than the, the, the rate of like, the money you need to spend in order to hack into a system. And because this side is like, larger than the other one, the incentive to hack these things got basically significantly higher. So hackers had a lot of incentives to really hack the system and to put a lot of time and effort into it to gain all these like, profits. Mm. Yeah, it's a bit like data breaches. They just keep on getting bigger and bigger. And it's because there's more and more resources being poured into um, compromising environments or, or stealing funds. And so it, the, the malware that we're seeing, and I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a, um, an exchange back at the beginning of the year who, um, who got hacked in a large way, um, the well-known exchange. And the, the work that went into understanding what happened was significant to such an extent that the conclusion we came to was it, it's nothing of any known technology. It had to be some zero day. That was later proven to be the point. Um, and and the, the reality is, the, as, as we're building more features, as we're advancing on our roadmap and think we've kind of sorted this part, there's a whole group of people who are spending hours and pouring funds into finding a way to, to compromise our systems, particularly if they're profitable and particularly if there's a lot of value. So I think we're going to keep on seeing more as, you're right, we are, we're better than we were, but we're not where we need to be. And, and I think, sadly, there's probably going to continue to be a rise in hacks and, and vulnerabilities. The thing that we need to do is make the impact of that less painful. Just like banks have had decades to introduce controls and, um, and, and deal with the, the issues that they've had, we'll, we're having the same thing. And I think we will continue to. Yeah, I think it, it's, a, it's about uh, the technology maturity again, but uh, not DeFi as one thing, uh, we saw a lot of hacks in this technology related mostly to Bridge. Uh, we, uh, I, I particularly don't expect to see the same in the next year, but maybe there is a new technology that arises next year and it's uh, hacked. So we cannot predict the amount of hacks because we will need to know uh, how many te new technologies come and if they are related to direct with funds because these two equations are important. If there is one technology that is new, for example, digital identity, but there are no too many incentives to hack that uh, directly. Maybe they can impersonate one, a person, or, uh, but it's not just go and get funds. So. Uh, this the, the new technology has to have enough incentives to be attacked as breaches. And breaches will get more mature. So that's uh, uh, what happens in general. Right. Any words of advice for our audience? We have a few seconds left, so before we end the panel, any words of advice on just staying safe and... 
uh, buy hardware wallets for those individuals, uh, use multi-sig wallets uh, if you have enough funds. Um, but hardware wallets is like a must for any uh, Web3 user. I would say tr read. Read a lot before you use specific services. Try to understand exactly what's going on there. Although not easy, we're still not yet in the phase where we can just trust the system completely and hope that everything will go as ex exactly as we want. Yeah, I'm a security guy, so I would say this, but <laughs> at every point in as you're building, as you're growing, consider what's the impact of what I'm doing from a security perspective? What are the risks? And how, have I understood them correctly? And have I mitigated them correctly? Just think security throughout everything we're doing. Yeah, it's important, especially now, because I do think we'll see more people move on to DeFi given recent events. So it's a really important conversation. Anyways, we're out of time. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And yeah, we'll be outside if you have follow-up questions. Thanks.
<laughs> to lead. It was, uh, you know, um, you know, like I, I, I loved working in Asia. It was all of my dreams come true when I was moving to Singapore. Um, I'd been, you know, I'd worked in Japan before. I'd worked in Hong Kong. I'd worked in Indonesia. Um, so I had really um, succeeded during the early part of that, but then, you know, made some really, really bad decisions. And unfortunately, there weren't, and I, I, I don't blame the controls, you know, I accept full accountability and responsibility for everything that happened to me during that period. Um, but if there had been more, you know, from the organization's perspective, if the controls had been better, if they'd been more robust, um, you know, I would have been going to jail at some point, but the organization would have survived. Um, yeah. But the combination of two um, led to the collapse, effectively. Yeah. Eric, maybe, maybe I'll start with you. When I, when I listen to Nick, and not to put words in your mouth, uh, Nick, but I get the sense a little bit that you got in a little bit of trouble and then thought you, you could kind of get yourself out of trouble if you just could, just a couple, couple of things could go your way. And the hole kept kind of getting deeper and deeper. And maybe you promised to yourself at night, you know, if I could just get myself whole, then I promise never again kind of thing. I mean, was that a little bit going through your, your head, Nick? And um, to, to a certain extent, I mean, you hate what's happening to you. So you're, you know, you, but you're, you're getting deeper and deeper into it. So the, you know, the first time I put a trade into the illegal 5 eights account was because I'd seen so many people do it before me. You know, Bearings was a, a, an organization where trades would be warehoused overnight. Um, you might have to, uh, uh, the price that you traded at might have been wrong for the client. So when I worked in London and in Tokyo, you would regularly see salespeople, traders, put trades into error accounts and warehouse them for a day or two. So for me, it wasn't the big step that it should have been when it was my turn. Um, so it was, it was far too easy to do because I'd seen it before. But then you're right, you, you know, like I'm, I'm genuinely, I'm trying to get out of this trade every minute of every single day. And then it's just growing and growing and growing. And you get to the, um, you get to uh, September 1992, which was the year end. And um, it's $5 million, right? And you're, the auditors are coming in. Uh, you've, this is a hurdle you're not going to be able to overcome. And you just, very last minute, I phone up the Treasury Department, I ask them for $5 million, and they wire it out to me the next day. Um, so I passed a journal on the, um, on the 30th of September, the money arrived on the 1st of October, so when Deloitte's were doing the year-end audit, there was a discrepancy of $5 million, and they put it down to a foreign exchange discrepancy, mm -hmm. and that's how I survived the first audit. Um, without me even knowing, that was the, um, the, right. the rationale that was put right. behind it. So, Eric, maybe you can, I mean, there's nobody in this audience that doesn't know about what happened at FTX, but maybe you could frame it for us a little bit. And then as a follow-up question, maybe I'll ask you that question. Do you, do you think, and then maybe, Nick, I'll get your reaction to it. Do you think, you know, there's kind of two, if you listen to the podcasts, the numerous podcasts on this, there's sort of two schools of thought. One is that this was just never worked from the beginning. It was always just fraud from the beginning, you know, or the, there's a second school of thought that was like things were going well and markets turned and especially sort of the spring and Terra Luna and then, you know, he's just trying to kind of get out of it. So can you kind of just frame a little bit what happened and then give your view of what you, what you think happened based on your, you know, 25 years at J.P. Morgan? So what I think, well, I guess Nick stole my line. I was, you know, <laughs> it, all began, it all began in 1992 when a young man Sorry. called Sam was born. I, I don't actually think that's, from my perspective, I, I almost may be taking a step back from FTX. It's 100% the case in every situation I've seen, if there's an ability for somebody to put their hand in the cookie jar, eventually somebody somewhere is going to do that. And if you have um, an industry where you can have an exchange, a custodian, and a hedge fund all in the same situation, all unregulated. And when I say unregulated, I mean unregulated in the, in the, in the most broad terms. So if you could have a construct where it's regulated by code or by a smart contract, then I put that in the box of regulated. But if you have a situation where somebody without anybody else knowing can raise a bunch of money, uh, from clients and then use that money, they're 
they're going to do it. Now, my personal opinion is, um, you know, if we look at bank collapses, they, they, they often say that they happen slowly and then they happen quickly, right? And that's when you have asset quality and everything's happening in a clean way, but they've done some bad lending or something. That's typical with fraud. It just happens quickly. And in the case of FTX, it was the beginning of November. We have the, the Coindesk report showing the balance sheet of um, Almeida and hardly more than a week later, it's in bankruptcy. Um, so my personal feeling is that it was probably a lot like Nick's situation where um, they had been trying to be relatively clean. And if they weren't, you know, if they weren't trying to be clean, I don't know why they would have gone through the effort to, to try and a, a sort of go through the motions mm -hmm. um, on the regulatory mm -hmm. side of things. And then whether, whether it was Terra Luna or something else, I think it ended up with a hole in the Almeida balance sheet. And then it ended up with the one day when you realize you've got a hole to fill and you kind of know you shouldn't do it, but you take some money from client funds and you use it to fill the hole. And then it just spiraled from there. That's, that's, we'll find out soon enough, I presume, but that's my, my best guess. Yeah, I mean, that's the part I don't get though, because why wouldn't you just let Alameda go and s preserve FTX? Why would you put both at risk? Because to Nick's point, you think you can fix it, right? You think a couple more good trades, a couple more good days, a couple more, you know, m maybe you can go out and do uh, another, another round. You've just had a round earlier in the year that values your company at $32 billion. And remember when we, you know, people, people look at it, which is incorrect and they go, oh, this was a, a $32 billion plus client funds financial loss. It kind of wasn't because if you look at all the money they raised, it was maybe it was $2 billion, but it was valued at 32. But that 30 billion of the 32 was kind of phantom money because it, it wasn't ever value, right? It, it, it wasn't there, but I think you get to a point where you're trying to protect that. You, you feel like you're the fastest person in the world to be a multi 10 billionaire kind of person. And if you can just kind of fill a hole, that's maybe a few hundred million, which you feel like you can probably do, then everything will be okay. And that's, that's, I, I, I can, I, I can absolutely see the psychology of that. And certainly it's happened many, 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 many times before. Uh, and Koi, you worked for Hester Pierce, which is, I, I, I would say she's probably the crypto ecosystem's favorite SEC commissioner. She's, she does get it, you know, for sure. Did you, uh, did you meet uh, Sam bankman fried first of all? Did he, because you know, yeah. he has this regulatory went and, and what was that like? Yeah, I mean, was, so he a sh was he a schlub, first of all, or did he like dress up <laughs> to come and to? No, I, you know, I think like most folks he met in Washington, you know, he, he had a persona that he met and, and a, um, you know, dressed as a coder and everyone saw him testify before Congress with his shoes with no shoelaces and wild hair and everything. And I think that fits into something, Nick, you were saying of, you know, people want to believe what they want to believe and here there was this image that was being cultivated of this whiz kid, of this MIT grad who uh, is the savior of the crypto industry and the like. So um, it was, you know, reflecting on it, definitely a, an interesting experience and a, you know, a reminder to be critical of, uh, of things that may look too good to be true or, um, you know, folks that may be presenting themselves differently than who they are. Mm -hmm. And did he do kind of what Nick uh, was talking about? He was very confident and, you know, you might not, you guys don't get it maybe and this is what I want to do or was he, you know, does he? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure that he was. I, I think his, his thing was a little more quiet and reserved mm -hmm. of he's, he's the coder. He's not, he mm -hmm. wasn't super aggressive in, in the conversation I had with mm -hmm. him. Okay, and so um, what, what pieces, piece or pieces exactly of the regulatory environment would have kind of saved this for investors? Like what, you know, what was missing exactly? Uh, and then I have a follow-up question for you, but let me ask you that first. Yeah, I mean, I think it's first important to remember that regulation is not a magic cure-all, right? I mean, everything we just talked about, you worked in a highly regulated industry and bad things still happened. With that being said, you can still put, you know, basic restrictions and limitations in place. And I think the U.S. securities regulatory framework is a good example of that. It's certainly not a model of efficiency, but it serves basic core purposes quite well. So, you know, you, uh, when you're buying stocks in the U.S., you don't go to NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange and open up an account and have one entity control the entire 
um, investor experience, right? You have a series of intermediaries. You go to a brokerage firm, you open up an account. The brokerage firm will transact with any number of intermediaries, and that's somewhat by happenstance, but also somewhat um, by design, right? And each level of um, intermediary addresses different concerns. They address conflicts of interest. They address uh, protection of customer funds. They address risk management policies. Um, public companies, you know, have to disclose audited financial statements. Uh, they have corporate governance requirements of actually having a board of directors, having certain experts on a board of directors. I think all of these things would have, you know, in hindsight, certainly benefited uh, the FTX situation. The board. Maybe I had, can I, can I add one thing in there, no, Stacey? Yeah, I, yeah, of course. I mean, just, just to give one example uh, of this. So, um, when I was working in a banking environment, the bank also owns, you've got a bank, which is where the customer deposits are, customer fund, you, uh, just depositors' money, if you want to think about it that way. You've got a holding company above it, and you've got a completely separate asset management business as a separate legal entity. This is a fairly typical setup. Now, if I'm sitting in the bank and I want to do a trade with the asset management business, which is just people on the street kind of giving their money to be invested, that would be because of Reg W much more difficult for me to transact with my in-house asset manager than it would be for me to transact with some complete third-party asset manager. And if you think about it, the reason for that is because if that protection is not there, then you can be inside the investment bank and you can be selling all your dud securities that you don't want um, into the asset manager, and then they blow up, which is a conflict of interest, and you can you know, put all your dud loans in there and so on. And so I think those kinds of separations that you were talking about, they're quite... Um, you know, they're quite important, and obviously that can be enforced by regulation, by code, by transparency, by whatever, but, you know, I think that's an a important point. But, I mean, uh, sorry, I, I mean, reconciliations as well. I mean, just mm -hmm. simple reconciliation. That's what I was going to ask you. What are the most important things on here? Sort of just position reconciliations. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, like, I don't know a great deal about the, uh, the crypto space, and, uh, and I freely admitted that, but I, w I was listening to the CEO of Binance the other day, on CNBC or something. Hot he, topic. Yeah, and, it, and, <laughs> and, he was, and he was talking about, you know, how you can use the code or the hashes to reconcile that your position is actually held at the exchange. I, I don't know if that's a thing or not. He said they, w they hadn't been doing it at Binance for the last 10 days, but they were going to start to do it again. You know, like reconciliations have to be done every single day. No, and, I think it was reconciled in that 8 billion mislabeled account that he, <laughs> that he had. Yeah. But it's... I, we're jumping all around here, but uh, so you were talking about during your audit, right? Yeah. You have the audit. The money's kind of not there because you've got it in a in a fake account or something that, a, 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 and then you get five million sent from London to cover the hole, and then you kind of send the money back, right? Oh no, I never sent. Uh, no, I never. Sent oh, you never money. sent it back. No, you, you effect, it, effectively, okay. what effectively what what I was doing through the two and a half year period was I was swapping a P and L item, the loss in the five eights account for a balance sheet item which was the margin that was being posted right. to the exchange. But they weren't, they never interrogated the balance sheet enough to ask the question, okay, we've got 650 million with the exchange, but we've got these tiny positions, it doesn't add up. So you've got to, you know, you've got to ha investigate and interrogate the balance sheet in order to ask that question. It was just the only reconciliation that they looked at in Singapore at the time was, whether the account balance line agreed. So as long as my 5.8's account balance was zero, it had no impact on the account balance line. And all I was doing every single month was selling another round of options to bring the account balance line down to, to zero. And nobody looked any further. But the, the margin at the exchange was just growing and growing and growing until it reached three times the capital base of the bank. bank. You know, absurd levels. Um, you know, 10 times the legal limit that you could lend to a subsidiary. Um, yeah. And the Bank of England allowed that to happen. So, you know, the breakdown is, is, is everywhere. Soup I mean, nuts, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, FTX, yeah. did they have audits? So, I mean, you know, what were the auditors doing? Do, do they have audits in, in, in these companies? I'm sure they do. You know, I think you're, that... You're that sure? I, no, well, no, I'm not <laughs> sure. No. We had audits. They just weren't particularly... I'm sure they have audits. They just might not be particularly good. I don't know.
I mean, I, this yeah. happens in market froth always a little bit, but I just think, you know, you know, there was, you know, you've got 48 hours or 24 hours, you're in or you're not in, you know, so the money. And then if just say Sequoia's in, well, Sequoia surely did the due diligence, right? We were just kind of, you know, free ride on the back of Sequoia. And then, you know, you'd look around and nobody's asked for a board seat. Nobody's done the due diligence of the money. This is, you know, this is what I, my suspicion of, at least in the VC space, you know, what, what, um, but, but Corey, let me circle back to something that you said, because, you know, the whole point of crypto, I, there's n a number of points to crypto, obviously, but the whole point is that you disintermediate all of these intermediaries sure. that are just completely ridiculous most of the time for trying to do some very some simple things in a much more efficient way and a much less cost environment. So the, the answer, if you, if you believe in the preservation of the state, the sta um, the, this state, the, and let's just stipulate that we do, because mm -hmm. uh, you are speaking at a, a crypto conference after all. Um, what, what, re what regulatory environment could you, can you imagine that could solve for something like this without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, right? Like what's a, yeah. what's a reasonable regulatory environment that could catch the, the SBFs in the net but let all of the, the kind of the good stuff through? Yeah, yeah, no, and you know, I think it, at the end of the day, a lot of the U.S. in particular is struggling with what, what is the right regulatory framework, and it's, it's really not rocket science. I think as a you know, first principle, just leveraging the technology itself to achieve the public policy goals that you're trying to achieve as a regulator. So uh, if transparency is a concern, you know, one way of looking at it is we need, uh, we need auditors to come in and do look at the financial statements and do everything we've done traditionally. Another way of looking at it is let's do a smart code audit if everything's on chain. Let's make sure that this information is out there and that people have the knowledge to be able to assess what's going on. Um, you know, from there, if you're trying to get more specific, I think there's some, some clear steps you can take preserving the utility and the, the promise of crypto. Uh, just, you know, clear guidance on what, what in fact are these crypto assets. I think the definitional step is the most important step in creating any regulatory scheme. So in the U.S. you have the big debate of are tokens a security, are they a commodity? Answer that and the rest will flow from there. You can, you can address what type of disclosures should be provided. Uh, who provides those disclosures? Uh, you know, regulators are used to having a central entity to grab hold of. It doesn't have to be a central entity. If there is a group of people that are willing to provide data, willing to provide information, there's no reason why that information can't be provided that way. Um, and then you can start tacking on the trading of the crypto assets, start addressing the concerns that we're seeing in the FTX um, debacle of just some clear, basic rules of the road of, um, you know, there are going to be centralized entities in the crypto space. So if you are a centralized entity in the crypto space, you're going to need some rules to comply with. And I think providing those, um, those broad strokes would go a long way. And I guess we, the other thing is too, is everybody's focused on them just stealing client assets which to me seems like really simple. I mean, whether it's, you know, if, the, if the client asset is a, is a pile of coal, is in a commodity, or it's a bunch of money somewhere, or it's just stealing something that you said you wouldn't touch and it belongs to the client. Um, like, that's one point. And then the other thing, which nobody, I mean, it's, it's kind of out there, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure, as Warren Buffett loves to say, cockroaches never travel in ones. And so if you see, if you see one big problem, uh, th there's going to be a bunch of others, and I think w the, the theft thing is kind of obvious. The fact that the hand was put in the cookie jar and the client assets were grabbed to fill whatever, you know, whatever he wanted to fill with them. But there's also just general kind of front running, right? I mean, there's the reports about the liquidation protocols that were being used, favorite Almeda. Yeah. Um, there's going to be a bunch of other problems, I'm sure, um, coming out as well. And so I, I guess part of the problem here in my mind is an exchange doesn't need to be anything more than just a matching engine. All you're doing is, it, back in the day, people used to meet under a tree somewhere <laughs> and they had assets to sell and assets to buy and everybody knew that that's the tree that you go to if you want to transact. And, and maybe you kind of take your satchel full of stocks and shares or whatever it is and you go there and you do your business. But it, that's the central function of an exchange. Uh, the central function needn't be kind of holding on to your stuff for months and months on end. 
Um, and so I think, you know, to my mind, that's where really the focus should be in the future. Yeah, I mean, to put a finer point on it, we don't need new rules to say don't commit fraud, right? I mean, stealing customer assets is, is already illegal. We don't need a whole framework around that. It's, it's providing sensible, sensible restrictions in place. And I think, you know, DeFi is, is a really interesting example of how this technology can be leveraged uh, in a way that allows people to minimize the risk that we see in these centralized entities of potential fraud and everything. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's a path forward. They've, DeFi protocols have held up a lot better than a lot of the centralized trading in recent, recent months. Yeah, over collateralization and smart contract and, you know, you don't have to trust anybody. I mean, it's the point, right? Um, but, Koi, um, one of the criticisms levied is that in the U.S. regulatory environment was so um, unclear and that is what's forcing sort of FTX offshore and uh, and we're kind of the best is the enemy of the good, right? Um, and, you know, sort of regulation by enforcement, sort of guidance. Mm -hmm. And do, wh what would you do if you were sort of in charge and to, to you know? Yeah. Or how do you, yeah, how, what do you think of that? And then what would you do, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's totally fair criticism. Uh, the SEC uh, has really, really messed things up in the U.S. and, and has, in fact, driven folks offshore. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll caveat, look, the people that are responsible for stealing customer funds are responsible for stealing customer funds. The SEC's lack of sensible actions doesn't absolve them of their responsibility, obviously. But, you know, the, the SEC has not created a framework within which folks can grow their businesses in the U.S., um, I think it's, you know, it, uh, maybe I can paint a picture of a, an alternative universe. Uh, when I worked at the SEC, I worked for Commissioner Peirce. She proposed a safe harbor proposal that would have allowed token issuers to get their projects up off the ground. There would have been tailored disclosures. Uh, it would have been almost a securities uh, disclosure light um, regime. And it, you know, at the time, the idea would be to ex um, exempt any secondary trading of tokens, uh, but it would have, you know, if the SEC had acted on that or something like that, you would have an entire universe of crypto projects that had some type of touch with the SEC. That would have, that information could have flowed through the commission, experiences could have been had to learn lessons about what type of regulations, if any, are needed on the crypto trading side. You know, the SEC, the CFTC, all these agencies, they could go ahead and implement rules through the normal notice and comment process. That allows everybody to have a say on why a proposal is a good thing, why it is a bad thing, why a certain existing rule doesn't work. Um, but instead, we have seen an enforcement-heavy approach, and, and Chair Gensler has, has been enforcement first and, and really strong rhetoric saying every crypto asset is a security, come in and talk to us. But then if you come in and talk and ask for a registration, there's, there's no path forward. So, I mean, it, it is an irresponsible act by the U.S. regulators to not provide a workable path. If you're going to exert jurisdiction over a space, you need to have a, a clear path forward to do so. Um, Jesse Powell, the founder of Kraken, uh, sort of famously tweeted a couple of weeks ago, red flags, and I'll just read you his red flags. Acting like you know everything after showing up to the battle eight years late, bit of a dig, uh, nine figures buying political favor, being over eager to please DC, huge ego purchases like nine figure sports deals, being a media darling seeking out puff pieces, EA, vir uh, effective altruism, virtue signaling, um, and FTT. So uh, this is very obviously crypt uh, from a crypto sort of point of view, but let's talk about red flags. Um, and what, you know, as an investor, what, or, or a regulator even, what do you think about, how do you think of, of red flags? And maybe Nick, I'll, I'll start with you again. You know, what would you, what would you look for in this kind of? <clears throat> um, I, I mean, it's very difficult for me to comment on the, uh, on, on the crypto space. Yeah, in I, general, I guess. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I, one of the things I don't understand, and perhaps you can, you can uh, explain this one to me, if you, you know, a traditional exchange is owned by the members, whereas this exchange is owned by effectively one individual. And it, so it's not an exchange in the traditional sense. No. Is, that, is that true? Correct, yeah. Yeah. 
and, and, and just those sort of things and how that can happen and, and how it can be, you know, how it can be centralised under one particular person is, is, is strange for me, just coming from that more traditional stock broking. He's got it as a side sleeve for a hedge fund. Say that again? <laughs> it's kind of like a side sleeve for the hedge yeah. fund as well. Exchanges yeah. so owned by their members are kind of going out of favor uh, anyway, I mean, though. I got, I got two to put on the list. All right. If your buddy, Sam Trebacco from Alameda, who you grew up and built this thing up with, leaves, and then Brett, who's running FTX US, leaves in very short succession, that's kind of a red flag. Okay. Yeah. If you have very young people saying that, you know, there's sort of pam personal family situations and maybe I'd like to spend time on a boat and stuff like that, it, 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 it's normally a bit odd when, when that... Such a successful rocket ship too, right? You, you yeah, mm -hmm. it's not definitive, but it's mm -hmm. suspicious. Yeah, no, no. you had two, I thought, Eric? Yeah, I think, you know... Did you have two? Oh, no, sorry. There was two individuals, oh, so two those were my two. <laughs> 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 That's Okay, <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe the other flag to, to add to the mix here is, you know, when, when the entire industry is in a downswing, if there's one person raising their hand indicating that they are outperforming wildly everybody else, I think that's, uh, that's certainly something that should raise eyebrows. Mm -hmm. I th uh, yeah, market share, I think, is the other one as well. The, um, you know, like I, I, I was probably 50% of the open interest on the Singapore International Monetary <laughs> Exchange. Um, you, know, you know, I was definitely half of every trade that was going on in the Nikkei 225 pit. Um, and it just, it, it just defied belief. Uh, so much so, and, uh, and this is a slightly funny story, that the, uh, you know, in 1994, the Singapore International Monetary Exchange had a big um, award ceremony, and they invited the, uh, the management of Bearings to come from London, from New York, and from, from Tokyo to receive the award for the highest customer volume on Cymex. That volume was my illegal 5.8s account. But they came and they accepted the, the, the award. But that's how, so that's how whether, bizarre did, it became. Did they wonder why there was no customers there? Yeah. There? It was only you to welcome them. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was, my wife was there. That was, right. you know, she was the customer. But, um, but I'm sure there's going to be episodes. I'm sure there's going to be episodes that come out of FTX that are going to be similar to that. You know, they, like, it, like it, everything that I look back at during that particular time is completely nonsensical. You know, at, at its, at futures and options are cash-rich businesses. You receive more margin from your client than you pay to the exchange. Yet I needed 650 million pounds to keep the business going. It's complete and utter rubbish. And it should have been picked up at the very first hurdle. Um, and it didn't. And, you know, like the episodes of... Bearings had a big party in Grand Central Station, New York, um, at the end of 1994 to celebrate all of the money that we were making in the debt products division. Yeah, and they flew everybody there, five, six hundred people to celebrate. And still, you know, you, I, I still couldn't enunciate what was happening. You know, I knew it was a tissue of lies. Um, but everybody's buying into the success story around you. And it, it doesn't propel you on, but... You, you have all of these status relationships that are building and, you know, like I didn't go as far as um, support one of the political parties in the US, but, um, <laughs> like, because I didn't have cash at my disposal. Like, it, mine was very much trying to survive for another day type of thing. Um, but those status relationships and that everybody believed that every time they traded with me, they lost money, whereas the opposite was true. But because I was manipulating the exchanges in two locations, you know, it, it did look like that for a, for, for a period of time. Um, but yeah, those, those status relationships, it, it's very difficult um, to let them go. I think age is another big factor. You know, I was 25, he was 25. You look at Jerome Curviel, uh, Quaker Adaboli, those rogue trading episodes as well. Very, you know, very young people, not, not mature from a business perspective. And, you know, like I'm a lot older than everybody in the room, but you have an industry that's, you know, the average age is quite young. And, you know, and I'm sure that these people are all in a far better place than I was all of those years ago. But there is going to be an element of immaturity. 
in, in, in certain parts, and you have to be a little bit careful of that. Um, I wrote a book on, on stress with a, with a psychologist, and he talks about status, I talk about success, um, but he ends the chapter with the phrase, when an immature person has status, they will do anything, absolutely anything, to protect it. And that kind of embodies a lot of what happened to me during that period. Because I was, you know, the exalted individual who everybody thought was, you know, turning water into wine or, or whatever the yeah. phrase is. I mean, I, I don't know him, but that does ring a little true to me uh, about SBF, right? He was, you know, the golden child, and I'm sure he enjoyed being the smart, smartest guy in the room and, um, you know having these policy conversations and doing the bailout. And it's very hard to imagine, you know, maybe not being that guy. Once you're that the guy. magazines. Yeah. Right, the right, right. There's, there's um, a lot of, I'm sorry. No, no, go, I was just gonna say, uh, we will have some time for questions at the end. So think, think about uh, a question if you wanna ask one, uh, but go ahead. I was just saying, there's a lot, of, a lot of power in being able to, you know, have uh, lawmakers pick up the phone when you call. Right, and it's, right. that's a position you don't wanna give up. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, okay, so um, maybe this is uh, not a, a very nice question to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and you can ignore it if you want to. Given the red flags that we talked about and the red, the whole thing, do you, when you scan the horizon, do you see any red flags out there? <laughs> I, I mean, me. you don't, you, as I said, you don't have to answer, but I mean, <laughs> we've now, if we have the sort of the, the framework for thinking about this, might you apply some of uh, the red flags in your head or just things that you, you know, to make you, how, how would you? Yeah, because I mean, I, I, I don't need to name any names, um, but I, my, my, uh, I, I look at it sort of economics and the world will evolve in a certain way in, accor in accordance with those things. And those, by those things, what I mean is that um, if you have an environment where people can break rules, then they, then they will, right? It doesn't mean that everybody's a rule breaker, but I guess that's, you know, there will be somebody in that circumstance who will break the rules to their own advantage. More importantly than that, I would think about it like a like cost of capital. You know, you often say, okay, let, let, let's imagine that you have two identical companies and one of them has a cheaper cost of capital than the other one. Well, the one with the cheaper cost of capital wins because they grow faster, because they can get more investment, they can pump it into the business, they can do more things, and so, if you, if you have something where um, people can use client funds for other things, right? They can effectively treat clients' money as just capital for growing their business. Somebody's gonna do that, and the people who do that are gonna grow the fastest, on average. So it's kind of like a biological uh, law of the jungle evolutionary principle, and I think if... Who do you mean, Eric? Well, no, but I just think, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Binance and Tether are the obvious ones, right? I mean, Tether's <laughs> been preventing, fine, I will say it, but I mean, like, well, we've talked about this for ages, but I, I mean, they've just been presenting red flags left, right, and center forever, and they 100% have the ability to remove those red flags if they wanted to, but they don't, so why don't they? So it just seems to me that's like an obvious... Um, that's an obvious one. Coins yeah, so I'll, I'll tether, jump in there. A um, of we've and, we've uh, represented Tether for quite some time, and there's um, there's just <laughs> nothing to the um, allegations about uh, lack of reserves or anything like that. And I think that's been um, shown by the uh, investigations from New York, uh, the state of New York, and and the CFTC as well. Um, but I think you know, looking bigger picture. Skepticism is good. People, you should, you know, you should be careful where you put your money and conduct due diligence. And I think that's really important. Um, at some point, I think uh, it crosses the line into just pure rumors and everything. And so, I think as the crypto community, as a larger community, probably needs to take a step back. If you know, if you've been on crypto Twitter for the last three, four weeks, ever since the FTX collapse, it's just it's a circular firing squad. Everybody is pointing the finger, trying to guess who's the next domino to fall. And that's, that's not really a healthy place to be in. Um, I think, you know, again, s skepticism is good of where you're putting your money, but um, just kind of 
trying to point the, the next domino to fall is uh, kind of a dangerous game, I think. Okay, so let me say this. Um, I would say if I go and buy a, think about something that's asset-backed, probably the simplest thing that looks like a stable coin that's, I, if I was to pick an analogy, I'd pick a run-of-the-mill, really normal, standard money market fund, and maybe I can go buy one from PIMCO or BlackRock or somebody like that. So when I look at that money market fund and the prospectus and the reports that come out monthly, I'm going to see line by line in there with the ISIN number, every single thing that's in that portfolio that's backing my investment. And there's going to be a regulator who's going to kick the shit out of them if any one of those line items is incorrect, right? And so I guess I do think that within this industry, if we're going to mature and we're going to progress, it's helpful for people to point out when they see things that can be corrected. And if those things are not corrected, maybe it's just because the advice is not being heeded for whatever reason, or maybe it's actually that there's something deeper, right? So that, that's kind of the way that I the way that I look at things, but I do think that these sort of, you know, criticism, FUD, whatever, it's, you know, crypto Twitter and so on, there's a lot of people kind of respond and go, you know, FUD, FUD, yeah, it hasn't blown up, it's been eight years, everybody said it, la, 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 la. If we're gonna mature, then all of these things like proof of reserves and transparency and using smart contracts, these things are, we're gonna have to start using these, right? Because if we keep going on with blow-ups and retail people losing their money and scandals and fraud, the regulators are just going to come in and shut the whole thing down, right? So th that's why I do think it's important that we speak up on these things. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I moderate a panel or what, ladies and gentlemen? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, Coy, did you have a, something that you wanted to say? On, yeah, on I mean, or? the only, you know, maybe touching on something you mentioned earlier, Eric. I mean, regulation can come in many different ways, and I think transparency amongst stable coins as an asset class is something that private ordering is, is really starting to, to do a lot, and, and a good example of where you may not even need a proper regulator to come in. That's obviously one model, um, but you know, certainly, certainly progress can be made uh, based on market pressures, which I think is the point you're trying to make. Yeah, yeah I, it'd, it'd be great if it happens based on market pressures. And I think it'd be terrible if sort of, you know, the trust of investors keeps being abused time and time and time and time and time again to the point where ordinary people lose money and politicians feel like they have no other choice but to come in and stamp on it. And having been very, very close to the financial crisis and CDOs and CDO squares and derivatives and all this kind of stuff, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely very much of the view that the more egregious people think the behavior is on the political side, the more they're just going to be completely unreasonable and just come stamp on it. Um, so I think to, to, to kind of get the benefit of the trust, you have to earn it. Okay. Um, let me take some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, please stand up and now I see two hands and I'll take uh, both at the same time. And just a friendly reminder that a question has a question mark at the end of it. Sir. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so my question is for Nick. Uh, I want to ask if you could generalize from your experience, uh, is prison restorative to the rogue trader? Okay, um, and a question over here. Uh, grab, the, grab the mic from, sorry, you have to give up the mic when you, yeah, there you go. I'm Musrat from uh, Unity, and my question is to all of you, I know it's very popular and easy to point finger, and rightly so, at the SBF, at the Adam Newman before. Where are, where are all the Silicon Valley investors? What happened to the diligence? What happened to fundamentals? What happened to involvement in the decision-making process with kids that are not even 30 years old? Aren't we too fast pointing fingers and are not really looking at how this process is being actually operated for years. The hyper expansion is, is why a lot of these things are happening. What do you think about it? 
Okay, just because there's five minutes left, let me see if there's one, uh, one or two more and we'll collect them all together just to make sure we have enough time. Okay, so I've got one up front and then one in the back. Okay, uh, go in the back first, Jay. Yeah, uh, when you answer the question about red flags, um, you answered it from the context of like another FTX, another exchange, something like that. Um, what are red flags more general in crypto? When we think about speculative industries that were, spell, that were spending capital, like Amazon and Uber, you could still take a ride, you could still get a textbook delivered. What are the non-speculative things that are our success stories? Uh, I feel like that is a better place to look for potential red flags. So my question is, what are the successes and what are the red flags outside of exchanges? Okay, um, and the last question here, and I'll repeat for you guys. Hello, Eugene, Helion Ventures. And the question is about two biggest cases of this year with uh, Luna and FTX. So from your point of view, how do you think? Is it more a mistake or a fraud? And uh, if it's a fraud, who could be the next FTX? Thank you. Okay, so kind of difficult questions all, all around, but um, how do you think about red flags in a non-exchange environment? Uh, when you think about uh, sort of from the summer on, how do you feel about like, is it uh, stupidity or evilness, uh, fraud, or is there just some kind of laxness going on? Um, and then a question about just come on, isn't it up to investors to do some due diligence themselves and where does that lie? And then, uh, Nick, if you choose to, but you absolutely don't have to, uh, answer a personal question about your life. So why don't we uh, go down Can the I line? Do who, who wants to start? Um, what do you have yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. Okay. All right, so, um, let's start with the red, red flags outside of the exchange uh, process. I mean, one obvious one, I think you hit on it. If you read a white paper or you're on a message board and you're trying to understand what a platform does or what a project does and you, you can't, like, if someone's telling you, oh, you just, you don't get it, you're not smart enough, you don't have the background, it, there might be something there. That's, that's a red flag. You should be able to understand what the project is all about. I think that's just kind of, kind of basic, right? Um, I think moving on to the question about due diligence uh, by venture capital and uh, investors more at large, I mean, I think you're right, this, you know, there's, uh, FTX is to blame, or, Sam and whoever, whatever individuals that are responsible for these specific acts are to blame for those acts, but this is exposing a lot of shortcomings within the larger ecosystem. And if money is flowing around so freely that firms feel comfortable making large investments without getting board representation, without uh, really opening the books, and I think that does expose some weaknesses in, in that system. And I think that's, um, that's something that's being heard. You're seeing, seeing movement um, uh, to, to kind of double down on some due diligence requirements there. Mm. It's harder in a frothy market though it is. It's, it's you know, cause you, you miss out, right? And then the guy down the street will grab the deal and you mm. just, it's hard to. I think there was, yeah. So, so the, there was the question about Terra Luna, I think, and also about yeah. maybe the VCs I touch on for yeah, a second. Yeah, but, yeah, you don't have to answer um, all of them. Pick the ones you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, so well, I, I, I do like these ones. So in, in my mind, there's a very, very, very big difference between Terra Luna and FTX. So Terra Luna blows up, you know, stable coin goes to zero, et cetera, et cetera. To my mind, the way in which it blew up was entirely predictable, right? Because the price of the stable coin relied on a, a, a variable token kind of having some value so that you could sell enough of it to keep the price propped up and so on. And so I think like if you could, that information was there, it was available um, and you could either take that risk or not. And if you took the risk for a while, it was good and you get paid your 20% through anchor and so on. And it's all wonderful. Like, but, but to me, that's, it's, not necessarily okay, but it's in a completely different category than giving your money to an exchange and the exchange says, don't worry, we're not gonna touch the assets and we're just a matching service, blah, 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 blah. And it turns out they've got like a six billion hole in the balance sheet. Those are two completely different things. One, you can kind of understand that take a decision. One, you can't, which I think is related to the VC point as well. So, um, People look at it, and, and, and to be honest, this happens in investing a lot, right? Um, where something blows up, people lose a ton of money, and then they go, ah, how are you so stupid? Like, you know, why, why did you do that thing? And so on. And all I would say is, like, 
particularly at that time, crypto is a hot market. The people who invested in the, in the, in the Series A, B beforehand, mark to market on paper, they've made a ton of money, right? Oh my God, it's up to 32 billion, and it used to be worth like a billion a year ago, and it's so hot, we gotta get in, whatever. Yeah, Sam's obviously playing the game. He's going on Twitter, all these VC people are assholes. Like, I don't know, no, 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 he's making, he's making it a very competitive process. And whenever you get a hyper-competitive process like that, whether it's VC investing, whether it's high-yield bonds and you're talking about dropping covenants and so on and it's a hot deal, like people have to strike a balance and it's up to those investors. You can always do more due diligence in every situation. I'm not sure they could have done less due diligence in this situation, <laughs> but there's always some kind of balance there that you need to strike between winning the deal, getting the deal and so on, and that's just part of investing. And so the fact that these VCs who are, you know, that they've got great track, track, great track records, famous names, et cetera, et cetera, the fact that they messed up so badly, I think it's entirely on them. It's entirely fine. That's the way the capitalist system goes, and that's life, right? And if people don't like it, if you're an LP with those VCs, maybe you don't give them your next batch of money, and maybe you give your money to somebody else the next time around who promises that they're going to be more diligent. Okay, unless the two of you want to talk about any prison experiences, um, uh, Nick, uh, <laughs> we'll, give the, okay, we'll, give the, uh, we'll give the final word to you either on, en on any or none of the... Well, no, I'll try, I'll, I'll try and answer the question if I understand it. There were, sorry, there were two things. The, um, you know, I think fraud isn't always premeditated. Sometimes it happens out of mistake. So I think there's a combination of things there. And that, again, that goes back to um, the structures and controls being as, uh, as strong as they possibly can be. If, if I don't understand the question properly, please question me afterwards and I'll, I'll, I'll definitely uh, try to answer it a bit, little bit more fully for you. Um, and so I'm trying, to, I, I'm trying to work out the, uh, the meaning of the word restorative. Um, and, um, you know, w when I went to prison, um, you, like, it's, like I was locked up 23 hours a day in, in Singapore. It's a very tough regime. You sleep on the floor floor's very rough and uneven. Everybody's a triad gang member. So you're very alone. Um, you, you have two other triad gang members in the cell with you. So you have to have a really long, hard look at yourself. And, you know, that was the process that I went through in prison. And I'm sure, you know, you'll see a lot of this with SBF over the next few weeks, months, or whatever. The first response is denial. So you deny everything. You know, everything's okay. We're... Um, you know, we're going to survive this process or whatever else because you can't deal with the failure. Um, but over time, you have to start to come to terms with that. And, and for me, that was in prison. So, you know, there's nobody to talk to. Um, so you've got, you know, you can imagine, I, I've no idea. Most of the people in uh, Singapore in prison, it's quite a young prison uh, environment because they still, um, still have um, uh, capital punishment in, in, in Singapore. There's a lot of drug offence drug offences, like I said, it's a very rough environment because everybody's a triad gang member. So you, you have to learn to communicate in a way without other people um, because you don't really want to share what you're experiencing. So for me, I used to keep a diary. So they used to give me the, you know, a, a book or a, a, a short, a, a small um, exercise book, I suppose it would be. And I, every day I would write about things that had happened to me not necessarily just with the work environment, but, but the way that I'd been at home and other things that had happened to me during that period. And for me, that was a way of communicating and deal with it, at dealing with things that I, was, that I was feeling. So you pull down that veneer and you, you, you kind of end up with the conclusion that you, um, that you didn't particularly like yourself or, or, or the way that you'd become. So you, you, know, you try to think of ways that you can improve that going forward. And I think the biggest part of that is being accountable, being responsible, um, accepting that you were punished correctly, and that you can then, from that point, you can move forward. And if that moving forward is doing, talking at events like this, or, you know, I, I've done a few other jobs. I haven't worked in the world of banking since, but, um, you know, I've had a few other jobs uh, post that. Like, I, I'm still, you know, for me, I'm still pretty much the same person that I was all of those years ago, um, you know, uh, personality traits are still fairly similar. 
Um, but you have to understand there's a good end and a bad end to the spectrum and you, you try and position yourself a little bit closer to, um, to the middle. But I think going through that process, because it's something that unless you've been in that situation, you don't go through, it gives you the confidence, um, the self-confidence of who you are. Um, so, you know, if you pick up a newspaper, um, I'd always be described as disgraced banker or, or rogue trader. I've, I've, been, uh, I've been introduced at events where people have struggled for my name when they get close to the introduction. They call me that nasty person, Nick Gleason, which is fine. It's their prerogative, but they have to sit with me for dinner afterwards, so I make it very uncomfortable for them. Um, a, a few weeks ago, I was, uh, I was described as former rogue trader, uh -huh. which for me was the, uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the ultimate comeback. I'm not long, no longer a rogue yeah, trader. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in Hong Kong, uh, a few years back, somebody described me as a market commentator, which mm -hmm. was really polite, but completely yeah. inaccurate. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's... Yeah. Um, yeah, you have to really, and SBF is going to go through this over, yeah. over the next few, few yeah. weeks, months, and whatever else. He's going to have to have a long, hard look at himself, come to terms with failing, and then work out where he goes from there. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that coming to terms with yourself and working out where you're going to go in a, in a, a vehicle of sort of uh, responsibility and accountability, as you said, are very good words to end um, our very first day at Decipher. So thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciated having you on. And uh, give yourselves a hand for getting through this, this whole day. And uh, we'll see you tonight and uh, see you tomorrow. And I want to say that Koi is wearing candy cane socks. I just <laughs> feel like I should. It is the season. <laughs> <laughs> A bit quieter now. That was great. That was so fantastic. Oh, whoa.